Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're flying over Saudi Arabia, so if you excuse me, I want to check all the action down on the ground. What's happening on the ground? The Dakar. Hey guys, welcome back. Forget everything you knew about racing games. Forget about keeping your vehicle on the beaten path or going wild full speed across mountains with your shiny Lamborghini without sustaining damage whatsoever. In the car desert rally you'll need to explore and find your way through the toughest terrain to survive and be victorious, even if you arrive in last. Just being able to cross the finish line is already a victory. Are you up to the challenge? The Dakar Rally is one of the toughest tests in motorsport, a rally raid that challenges participants with fully off-road multi-class endurance racing through some extreme and highly varied environments. The first event, then known as Paris Dakar, took place all the way back in 1979 with the current home of the sport seeing you race through Saudi Arabia as the first stop on the FIM Rally Raid World Championship, each year picking a different starting point and winding through the country over more than a dozen stages on the way to the finish line. The event explores the country's diverse biomes, from desert to scrubland, steppes and mountain ranges, with distinct weather conditions from scorching sun to snow. The Car Desert Rally offers an impressive lineup of vehicles to choose from motorcycles, trucks, cars, quads, and SSVs, both modern and classic. And you can start your own private collection of off road vehicles and store them in a huge warehouse so that you can pick one later and go out for a spin. As for now, there are over 150 vehicles included in the game, but future DLCs will bring even more to the table. Some of the most impressive vehicles present are the pre-order bonus Audi RS Q e-tron, complete with one pedal driving, and the two classics offered day one for those who purchased the deluxe edition of the game, the Peugeot 405 T16 and the turbo twin DAF truck. They can reach incredible speeds, what leads to spectacular accidents mainly because of their low maneuverability. With such variety comes potential drawbacks in terms of handling. Just like in the car 18, the game engine needs to simulate several unique vehicle types, so across the board, it feels that more could be done in this regard. The quads are probably the most difficult class of vehicles to handle, and the most rewarding to drive are the cars, with satisfying force feedback. As for the trucks, they feel heavy as they should, and the SSV is really light and fragile, but this is something that the development team will continue to refine during the following months after the release, mainly for those that rely and play exclusively with steering wheels. For now and on that regard, I found that my trustworthy Xbox One controller is my best friend in the car desert rally. There are two ways to tackle this unique rally raid event. You can go for a full-on simulation that's about as niche and hyper-targeted as it gets, mainly in relation to the navigation. Or you can go arcade with visual overlays guiding you through the environments and head-to-head -head racing with other vehicles. After I booted the game for the first time and forced my way through the tutorial, I jumped right away to the professional side of things. I'm a huge fan of the car 18, so this was a piece of cake for me. And I wanted to quickly climb my way up to level 25 to unlock the full Dakar experience. But when I finally got there, after over 10 hours of grinding, not only on the professional but also sport modes, I was greeted by just three stages that supposedly composes the Dakar 2020 event. Soon enough I found out through the devs that the remaining nine stages would be coming soon in an extended Saudi Arabia map via DLC. So in total, the three main Dakar events, 2020, 2021 and 2022, will offer 12 stages each. But bear in mind that these specific events are only and exclusively available in simulation mode, for hardcore Dakar fans that is. The only and extremely annoying thing about this mode is that we must keep yet another eye 
on the speedometer so that we won't go above 170 km per hour. For each time we cross that mark, 10 penalty seconds are added to the time we took to finish the stage. But I get it. Simulation mode is trying to replicate what drivers and pilots face during the real deal. Between rocks. For those unfamiliar with the Dakar, choosing sport mode can be a good way to rack up experience points and credits, which can be used to purchase other vehicles. This head-to-head -head format will allow the player to have fun, even if, as said, you're an inexperienced driver or navigator. The waypoints are visible from the distance, just be sure to drive straight through them before you continue your journey. When you're done with sport mode and more confident about tackling the professional side of the Dakar, it's a fact that it might feel a bit scary at first and it can be difficult to drive with the pedal to the metal and follow the roadbook at the same time. But trust me, after a while you'll get used to listening to your navigator and finding the next waypoint. But keep in mind that you won't get a navigator on motorcycles and quads to sing all the notes from the roadbook. You're completely on your own. For that, I have a solution of sorts. You'll sometimes come across another competitor, so and if you're too confused, just follow him for a while or just on those off-road sections. All in all, the professional mode provides a much more immersive experience and lifelike challenge that makes it more rewarding simply because it gives you a sense of accomplishment that you figured out the route to get there. So multiply that for 10 and you get the simulation mode. One thing is certain, if you aren't paying attention 100% of the time during a race, it's better to forget both pro and sim modes. You'll never make it to the finish line. The Car Desert Rally is a very intense video game even in its more casual and arcade sport modes. And a couple of things that I truly enjoyed in this one, in relation to its older brother, was when we break hard or slide the car. The sand will react accordingly and produce this beautiful effect. Not that of a deal for many, but for me it's a treat to the eyes. Also I truly enjoy discovering that when we take the wrong turn, the navigator will show off all his skills and justify the paycheck he receives just by figuring out the way back to the correct path. Isn't that amazing? Yeah? You must go to cap 199. There's a full damage model in place, with windows smashing, roof panels squashed, lights destroyed, what can make driving in the dark extremely difficult, and wheels detaching. Repairing during a stage is possible, but depending on the mode you're playing, the time to get the vehicle up and running will vary, adding that extra time after you cross the finish line. Not even mentioning the penalties you'll get for going above the speed limit in some sections, both on pro and sim modes. As for something that I would love to see fixed or implemented, is the fact that the dirt and dust collected during the races should be washed off when crossing all these small rivers and ponds. Also having water splashed all over the windshield, blinding us for a brief moment or until we turn on the wipers. Yes, we need to manually activate the wipers and the lights for that matter. I always pick Colin McRae Dirt 2 as the example to follow in that regard. A game from 2009 that has the most incredible water effects ever seen on a racing game until this day. Now the feature that supposedly was returning from the car 18 was the ability to get out of the vehicle to help others and to get ourselves out of awkward situations like this one. That feature was teased a while back by the developer, but silently taken away in the last minute. Please, Saber, bring it back! Please! That would probably also bring the many hazards of getting stuck in sand and mud again, just like in the previous game. Some Dakar fans were also apprehensive about a free roam mode not being available for Dakar Desert Rally that would allow players to freely explore the 20,000 square kilometers of the Saudi Arabian map and be able to take some photos with this impressive landscape in the background. Fear no more! All that is planned and coming in the future. Here's some features that were promised and truly coming, free of charge. A roadbook editor to create and share custom events. 
offline free roaming to freely explore the 20,000 square kilometers of Saudi Arabia. A team customization tool to create custom liveries for both pilots and rides. And both replay and photo modes to have the chance to capture some breathtaking moments. As you know, a season pass is also available not only for those who have purchased the Deluxe Edition, but also for all other players interested on buying a specific pack or DLC. And those are a SnowRunner pack that I hope it has something to do with rock crawling or similar activities, two classic vehicle packs, one for cars and the other for bikes, an hybrid vehicle pack and a USA Tour pack that I'm guessing that it will be an entire new map of North America in where we can participate in events organized in the Grand Canyon area, <laughs> getting some Motorstorm vibes and some Baja related content, who knows, that would be awesome. About the online, 4 players can go simultaneously head to head, the other slots are AI controlled bots. But for instance, if there are 3 human players already tackling a stage and a fourth one tries to enter the server, he can randomly take control of one of those AI bots, if the host gives permission that is. And something I also learned from the devs is that a peculiar online co-op mode is in testing. It will offer the chance of teams to take part in online races, each composed by one driver and one navigator. The driver will only see his side of the car, never laying his eyes on the roadbook, and the navigator doing his part of singing all the notes and hazards so that they help each other finding the correct path to the finish line. Isn't this amazing? Also amazing is the chance to fly the helicopter after you finish an online race, so that you can follow the progression of the other drivers that are still down on the track and explore the surroundings while you're at it. What isn't that amazing is the fact that during my playtime I had two of these crashes that took me back to my desktop. Neither were during races gladly. I'm playing the PC Steam version by the way. And during the race after a crash I've experienced this strange behavior even losing completely the control over the vehicle, not even mentioning when after another crash metal is mangled and an awkward dance takes place. Patch 1.3 is coming that I believe will solve these issues and a ton of others that players are experiencing, not only on PC, but also on the PS5 and on the Xbox series. Sound effects are a huge step up from the previous game, from environmental audio to engine noises and I can also identify some bits brought from the car 18. Now about the soundtrack, I just think that it fits like a glove into the action on sport mode and the pieces of music when we boot the game kind of brings some uncharted vibes of discovery and exploration. Even so, on professional and simulation modes, I turn it off completely so that I can focus entirely on listening the navigator, but again, it would be awesome to have the full soundtrack in a future DLC. Looking forward to it. Tight left on track. Danger three. Downhill. Until this point, you've never heard me talk about the graphics, which I think are amazing for what the game represents. If we exclude the podium sections, <laughs> but that's a discussion that I don't want and need to have, because for me. The experience is above everything else, and the experience of driving into the unknown, trying to find my way through to the finish line, stage after stage, is what really matters and makes me come back to the game over and over. I definitely recommend the Car Desert Rally for all off-road fans. It's easy to get in and extremely difficult to let it go after you master the navigation side of things, obviously. That's the only caveat about the game, the thin line that separates the niche of Dakar enthusiasts from all other racing fans. If you're not up to the challenge, just don't bother trying and simply don't ruin the hype for others that are willing to give it a chance and find this concept truly singular. And all that upcoming content will bring endless racing and fun. Saber Porto has a ton of amazing other features and ideas on the table, 
It all depends on the reaction that the game will receive from players during the upcoming month. Let's make it big, so that we can continue to have rally rate off-road games and turn it into a trend in the gaming industry. If you've enjoyed this video, consider supporting the channel monetarily through Patreon at patreon.com slash it's a pixel thing or using the thanks button below. To keep up with what's going on with the channel, check all my social media stuff by clicking on the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! Let's talk about something that I really love in gaming nowadays, that I really love in gaming, that is the most memorable racing tracks, fictional tracks in racing games that I had the pleasure to drive through and that still makes me come back to them just to have another go and try to beat my previous best times. As said, this is a list of fictional tracks, so officially licensed racing games featuring real-world based tracks and closed circuits are obviously excluded. Let's take a look. Let's start with this PlayStation 2 exclusive game, Downhill Domination. Yeah, a mountain bike game that is my favorite title to play on this system. A system that has a ton of other amazing racing games, I know, so <laughs> sorry about that. And believe me, the whole game is a blast. Every single track present is unique. So if I had to choose one, it would probably be this in Utah that really makes my eyes pop out. The high speed at which things happen, even crossing through this dangerous mine shaft, trying to land smoothly or simply to reach safely to the other side of these huge cliffs is more than enough to keep me glued to the screen in a constant adrenaline fueled race from beginning to end. Fantastic run! Congratulations, first place! I'm Ken Block and this is Colin McRae Dirt 2. Colin McRae Dirt 2 was huge for me when it came out back in 2009. I remember pre-ordering it for my Xbox 360 and fell in love with it right away. And one of my favorite places to drive in this game is in Morocco and in this particular track that starts in the middle of this little village packed with houses on each side, making the overtaking really complicated right at the start of the race. As you can see, I'm struggling to gain places, but I freaking love this setting of deserts, hot sun and dust with a little stream to cross and wash the dirt away. There was also other amazing sites to visit, like Malaysia and California at the Ensenada Peninsula. So awesome to grab a 4x4 like the Pajero and blast through these incredible places with rival pilots like Travis Pastrana and Ken Block. Overpass has this awesome natural feel that is what keeps making me come back to it. This particular track is called Sunny Run with its 2558 meters in length precisely from point A to point B packed with natural rock formations to conquer and as well man-made obstacles to tackle and overcome. It has its own flaws in what physics and handling are concerned, but the track design not only in relation to this one, but also to most of all others present in-game, is superb and something that should be experienced by everyone that enjoys a good challenge. Many of you are probably thinking that there's no fun in games like Overpass, in where we have to always keep an eye on the transmission, being worried on locking the differential or just let the vehicle roll in four-wheel drive mode when approaching a certain type of obstacle. Yeah, you're probably right, 
but there's a certain charm and manly feeling that turns us into a sort of superhero just by being able to face and to conquer these extreme challenges. Sega Rally from 2007 is also known as Sega Rally Revo in other regions, cause Sega wanted to somehow pass the thought that this was a revolution in rally games. It was developed by the English Sega Racing Studio that took advantage of the Geo Deformation Engine, which makes the terrain dynamically deformable, affecting also the performance and drivability of the cars. I recall that this was huge back in 2007, when it was released, and it still is! Look at it! This is such a unique game, with all that well-known Sega Rally fun of the previous titles at the arcades, on the Saturn and on the Dreamcast. And the tracks in this tropical setting are simply gorgeous, with tons of mud to dig that indeed affects the driving. Give this game a chance if you haven't already and show the love down in the comments section below. And I must mention also the incredible force feedback using a 360 controller. Really immersive stuff. Gravel is such an underrated game, and I truly believe that Milestone is already working on a sequel. I'm crossing my fingers. This one is so much fun, in the likes of Sega Rally. So if you enjoy truly 100% arcade racing stuff, I'm certain that you'll love Gravel. So many awesome locations to explore, but Namibia is my favorite. Again, you know that I'm obsessed with the desert, with Dakar-like stuff, so these tracks in Namibia are perfect for me, and this particular one is a real challenge with rocky formations to dodge and a tunnel to drive through. Man, so much fun! And there are a ton other incredible places, vehicles and disciplines to discover. The career mode is a bit short, something we can finish in less than 5 hours, if you're used to this sort of games, but it's totally worth it. Yeah, it seems that the Motorstorm experience is in Dirt 5, right? Wrong. Where's that so hyped Motorstorm inspiration? It's nowhere to be seen. And what about that deformable terrain present not only in the Motorstorm franchise, but also in 2007 Sega Rally? <laughs> Damn it, so sad. Let's go back to the second installment in the Motorstorm series known as Pacific Rift. Such an awesome ride, in this idyllic location with lustful forests and huge waterfalls. And the competition is ferocious, being so simple to go from first place to last in a blink of an eye. The whole franchise is a blast, but I still prefer this second title because of that unexplored feeling, just like that Nublar Island from the Jurassic Park movies, you know. And there's some pretty huge millimetric jumps to perform also. And I absolutely love when stuff just goes horribly wrong. What a ride indeed! Another game with idyllic and gorgeous locations is Pure, this quad racing off-road game in where one of its main focus is to perform stunts to gain points trying to be first so that we can improve our ride unlocking better parts and other locations and tracks. A must-have title in any Xbox 360 collection, can't say anything about the PS3 version, but this one for Microsoft's second console is freaking incredible and highly playable. 
Again, I had to pick Thailand because of all the temples, ruins and lustful forests, cause I simply adore this setting that reminds me of the Tomb Raider and Uncharted series that are so close to my heart. And it's sad to know that there was a sequel in the making that Disney ended up cancelling. So sad. This one is probably the most amazing fictional track ever in a rally game. 12,797 meters packed with adrenaline and incredible and overwhelming views. Just look at it! And be extremely careful not to end up falling down these cliffs in Monument Valley. V Rally 4 is another huge underrated game from the makers of the current official WRC game Skeleton. It features a few different racing disciplines and a pretty decent campaign. It received so many poor reviews that simply pushed players away from it. But it can be a lot of fun, mainly in its own online multiplayer mode, and honestly, it totally deserves a look. Nowadays I'm a bit saturated by racing games that try to be as close to reality as possible. So all of these games are so welcome. And the only simulation that I'm truly looking forward to is the next Dakar game that is starting to be teased by Saber Porto. Can't wait. Maybe. Right five turn, left five short, and right four long, don't cut, and left four. And what an awesome ending to this video! Outrun 2006 coast to coast is incredible as a whole, from the first meter all the way to the very end, where there's nowhere else to go. Outrun 2 already proved to be amazing and coast to coast just added a bit more awesomeness to the mix. So this one along with Outrun 2 for the original Xbox are the ultimate Outrun packages ever made that every single one of us should own for the most relaxing rides we have the pleasure to experience in a virtual world. Feel free to share your own personal favorite fictional tracks in racing games, cause I'm always open to recommendations and you guys really give awesome pieces of advice, indeed! And thank you so much for sticking around this humble channel during these last years! It has been such an incredible ride, just like these that I've showcased in this video, packed with ups and downs and of incredible friendships that other way would never be possible! Thank you very much for all the support, for all the advice, comments, tips and tricks, likes, etc, etc. You guys are the best and I'm truly honored to be able to continue on bringing these videos for you all to enjoy. A special word of gratitude goes towards my patrons. The channel has been improving its quality because of their awesome donations. So thank you guys so much. Take care. And I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Slipstream was made available for PC for some time now. And when I say some time now, I mean like 4 years or so. It finally made its debut on consoles last April for PS4 and 5 Xbox consoles and the Switch. So I believe that there's no excuse for you guys not to try it out. I've been lately bombarded with similar arcade racers with these retro-inspired visuals that not only appeals to old-school gamers, but also to those more casual players out there that might be curious about its gameplay and aesthetics. And Slipstream is yet another example of that, but now as close as it can get to one of the greatest creations of Yu Suzuki. I'm talking about Outrun, of course. If you've at least played the latest entries in the Outrun franchise, you'll be at home in Slipstream. But even so, I'm certain there will be a whole generation who instantly say that Horizon Chase Turbo was its inspiration. It was brought by my Brazilian brother, Sandro de Paula, and the basic concept is racing down a public road 
dodging traffic and trying not to crash. After each themed sectional environment, there's a fork and driving down one side takes us to a new area, just like in the good old Outrun. Around 15 minutes later, you'll have reached the end and completed the game. That's it! But where Slipstream differentiates itself is through the driving physics. Using the D-pad or analog stick, you tap left or right, but smoothly drifting around a turn is far from simple. Well, for most people not used to it, it might be a tad difficult. For the ones like myself, used to that mechanic in games like OutRun 2 or OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast, it's a piece of cake. Even so, I can confirm that there is more depth in the handling that you may anticipate for a game of this kind. By default, power sliding is a manual affair, releasing the throttle pedal, tapping the brake, turning and then back on the gas, all the while avoiding slower moving vehicles and finding the ideal line, just like in those outrun games mentioned. Slipstream takes its name from the game's slipstreaming drafting system, a speed boost that's more or less essential for success. Across the game's six modes, but especially its headline Grand Tour mode, this gradually charging power-up adds a whole new dimension of skill and difficulty. And of all the retro-inspired racers that arrived in the last few years, Slipstream is by far the easiest to adapt to in terms of its controls. The other gameplay affecting dynamic that's very much from the modern era is the rewind mechanic. If I'm not mistaken, it appeared first, in what the racing genre is concerned, back in 2005 in Squadra Course Alfa Romeo with its tiger effect. Do you remember that one coming from Milestone? It was also known as Alfa Romeo Racing Italiano. So in Slipstream, we tap the appropriate button before being treated to tracking lines and that rewind insignia resembling an old VHS tape. Each section of the main Grand Tour mode features several rivals. Finish behind them at the end of a stage too many times and your race is over. They feel largely redundant and their performance can be all over the place, but ultimately provide something to aim for other than simply the clock. And besides the Grand Tour, Slipstream offers an impressive amount of content for its meager 9 euro price tag, with a few other game modes like split-screen multiplayer mode and its performance more than meets the demands of modern gaming, while staying true to its retro influences. The soundtrack is also excellent, thanks to Stefan Moser, but a notch inferior than the one present in Art of Rally. But I guess that's not a fair comparison. Sandro de Paula is also clearly a huge fan of classic Sonic the Hedgehog titles, with certain stages taking their names and occasional design influences from zones including Emerald Hill, Chemical Plant, Ice Cap and Marble Garden, plus Sonic 2's red, yellow and blue introduction screens. Sandro's love for Outrun is clearly legendary because he not only managed to replicate its winning formula, but he's done it without damaging the legacy of the Outrun franchise itself or making his Kickstarter-funded game a basic and simple clone. Slipstream was clearly made with as huge passion for what he grew up with and it's visible right from the moment we boot the game up. Give it a spin, you won't be disappointed. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! If you follow my channel, you know how crazy I am for off-road racing. So back in 1997 and after GTI Club, I was all over this brand new game from Midway that had just arrived at one of my local arcades. Off-road challenge takes advantage of the Midway V-Unit hardware and curiously is part of the off-road series that began with Ivan Ironman Stewart's Super Off-Road back in 1989 developed by Leland Corporation. 
I'm sure that you all played that one back in the day through the many home conversions by Graftgold and software creations available during 1990 and 1991 for practically all computers and consoles. I first recall playing it at the computer lab at school on a 286 desktop PC and sadly never came across that iconic arcade cabinet with those three steering wheels. So and besides that MS-DOS version, I was all over the ZX Spectrum and the Mega ports. I also played the Mega Drive version over at a friend's house and only many years later tried the Super Nintendo version through emulation. To this day I am yet to try all other versions cause as said, it was all over the place for the Master System, for the NES, for the Game Boy, for the Atari ST, for the Commodore 64, for the Amstrad CPC, for the Game Gear, for the Atari Lynx, you name it. And please tell me, which ones have you played and are most fond about? A track pack, simply known as the track pack, was released for arcades as an add-on board containing 8 brand new tracks and would also offer the chance to choose between the normal trophy truck and the dune buggy expanding the game's longevity. But Super Off-Road had a proper sequel named Super Off-Road The Baja that ended up released solely for the Super Nintendo in 1993 cause the Mega Drive version in development ended up cancelled. Ivan Stewart can be seen in the title screen and in some menus, but Evan had an active role in the development of the game. It's now based on the Baja 1000 race instead of dirt track racing and was changed to a third person camera instead of an overhead camera, taking advantage of its Mode 7 hardware for that 3D racing experience. Besides the Baja 1000 event, in which the game is based, two other tournaments are present, the Mexico 250 and the Ensenada 500, and each are point A to point B races, just how I like it. The game is held with many opponents, as well as civilians and even wildlife that can hinder the player or be ruthlessly run over. Along the tracks we can collect money just like in its predecessor that can be spent on improvements of various upgrades like brakes, tires, suspensions, engine, nitros and even lights. And this leads us to Off-Road Challenge released for arcades by Midway in 1997. For this one, Midway grabbed the same model cabinet used on their two previous racing games, Cruisin' World and San Francisco Rush Extreme Racing, and up to four cabinets could be linked together for players to race against each other. It offers six tracks, ranging in difficulty as always in this sort of games, from beginner to intermediate to advanced, and most are off-road tracks, sometimes containing urban areas. Performance items can be purchased by the players such as power, tires and suspension, but also, and during gameplay, power-ups can be picked up such as nitro, helmets that prevents from losing speed when colliding with other vehicles, and money. There are various obstacles depending on the track, such as wagon carts, a train, water slicks and trees. At the finish line try to be at the top 4 places to earn cash and the higher you place, the bigger the pile of money will be. For this one Ivan Stewart was brought back as technical advisor. A year later Off-Road Challenge was ported over to the Nintendo 64 being its conversion in the hands of Avalanche Studios. Midway Games published it, but was immediately criticized by the dated graphics and the slow menus that were directly ported from the arcade original. Gameplay is similar to its predecessor where the player races against other off-road vehicles across various landscapes while collecting nitros and so forth. Once the player has completed the circuit, it's time to upgrade the truck and move up to the next difficulty level. And while we're at it, let me just bring Off-Road Thunder also to the table. It was an evolution of Off-Road Challenge and the last game in the Off-Road series but also part of another series, Midway's Thunder series of racing games composed by Hydro Thunder, Four-Wheel Thunder and Arctic Thunder. So guys, have you played any of these titles? Are you a fan of the genre? I surely am! And if you're in the mood for some off-road racing with trophy trucks and dune buggies, nowadays there's no other option than to grab one of the available versions of Baja Edge of Control. 
thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! Do you recall playing GTI Club by Konami over at your local arcade? I sure do! It's in fact one of my last memories of playing something really entertaining at the arcade, in what the racing genre is concerned. The handbrake control is absolutely necessary to use in these tight corners, and it also features cutoff routes, and there is even a bomb mode where the player would drive head to head with an opponent. As said, GTI Club, subtitled Rally Côte d'Azur, is an arcade racing game released in 1996 by Konami, where the player can choose from four rally cars, including a Mini Cooper and Renault 5 Turbo, and race in, you guessed it, the Côte d'Azur. The game allowed free roaming of the environment, which was revolutionary for the time, and contained several dissimulated shortcuts that could be used to reduce lap times. A physical handbrake is attached to the cabinet, encouraging the player to use it to perform high-speed turns around sharp corners. It was probably the inspiration for games that came prior to it, such as Driver, Midtown Madness, Project Gotham Racing, and so forth. For this release, Konami used their latest Cobra arcade board, which obviously uses PowerPC-based hardware. What else? Four years later came its first sequel, GTI Club Corso Italiano, also known as GTI Club 2 and Driving Party in other regions of the globe, and the action moves from France to Italy, with three courses to master, town, coast and mountain. Eight unlicensed cars are present, cars that resemble real-life models such as the Alfa Romeo Giulia, the Fiat 500, the AC Cobra, the Lotus 7, the Beetle, the Mini, the Bugatti EB110 and the Nissan Fairlady Z. Then in 2008, GTI Club Super Mini Festa was released for arcades in Japan by Konami. Who else? As the third episode featuring the original France course and also the Italian one from their previous games. But that wasn't all, they've managed to pack in two additional circuits, set in England and in the United States, plus 12 cars. A couple of years later was also released for the PlayStation Portable and the Wii. But prior to that, still in 2008, PlayStation 3 owners were thrilled to know that they would be getting an exclusive GTI Club game for their favorite console and by the hands of Sumo Digital, previously responsible for stuff like the incredible OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast. GTI Club Plus Rally Côte d'Azur was an HD port of the original GTI Club available solely through the PlayStation Network, which nowadays is nowhere to be seen, sadly. Besides the obvious enhancements in graphics and sound, it also offers other improvements over the original game, including 8-player online multiplayer, new modes and even compatibility with PlayStation I. As said, the game is no longer available for purchase due to license expiration. So guys, have you played the original GTI Club over at the arcades back in the day? Have you tried any of the following sequels and remasters? Are you a fan of any of them? Tell me everything! The original arcade game is even featured in the book 1001 Video Games You Must Play Before You Die, but if you haven't done so back when it was still a thing, nowadays it's virtually impossible to do it, cause the sit-down arcade cabinet was where all the action should be felt, and it's really hard to come across one of those beauties in the wild. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video, cheers! Race Condition is a retro-styled arcade racing game with simulation physics and competitive AI. It was developed in Sweden by Ravine Studios and will be released soon, on March 1st. Set in a modern low-poly arcade world, similar to what we've seen with other recent racers like Art of Rally, players of Race Condition find themselves as a rookie in a highly competitive open-wheel racing league. A rivalry with the suspiciously good opponent Mr. Dickman 
takes them on a tour across the world, which unfolds a series of intense racers with their fair share of crashes, pit stops and strategic decisions. And indeed, that so-called dick man is really hard to beat. Taking its low-poly looks and simple controls from the arcade hits of the past, Race Condition adds a realistic car behavior to end up with an arcade racer that looks deceptively simple, but provide a real racing challenge throughout the simple David and Goliath story. As Marcus from Ravine Studios said, our goal with Race Condition was to explore the crossing of simulation physics with the fun and speed of arcade racing. It makes for a game that is fun from the start, but hard to master. And I can indeed confirm that. In true arcade fashion, the races are only a few speedy minutes long and there is no car setup. Coupled with fast loading times, players might just find themselves lost in a just one more go loop. Resistance is provided by the opponent AI, which have been carefully crafted to play fair. Whatever the AI manages, the player could do the same. Best chance of beating them might just be with a more clever pit stop strategy, and that's what really makes a difference in this game compared with other similar titles. Even so, I found the rubber banding effect just too obvious, and running out of fuel only makes us drive a bit slower. Race Condition comes with three game modes. World Tour, where the player travels the world by beating rivals and unwinding the story of who will be champion. Set on four continents, the 21 tracks, including 10 reverse, unlocks as the player progresses through the tour. In Quick Race, we play the unlocked tracks to climb the online leaderboards or maybe challenge friends to split screen racing. Race Condition supports up to four simultaneous players in local split screen mode. As they say, practice makes perfect, so in time trial the player can enjoy the unlocked tracks without pit stop concerns or AI getting in the way. Speed is crucial though, as the player tries to advance on the global ranking. And have I mentioned the soundtrack? It's amazing to say the least, if you're in the mood for some modern retro synthwave kind of stuff. I absolutely love it. Race Condition is a fun game with really challenging physics and I'm having a blast with it, cause as said, the one more go factor hunts me down. Download the demo version on Steam and give it a spin, link in the description below. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video, cheers! Gonna be honest, I didn't exactly enjoyed the previous official Supercross game from Milestone. Perhaps because I played the PlayStation 4 version instead of the better one available for PC. And Monster Energy Supercross 2 from 2019 offered me a more immersive and above all extremely fun experience. But uh, what about this new entry in the series? Let's find out. Inevitably, comparing it to last year's game, the third in the series, several novelties were introduced. A totally revised career mode is now available, with more than 20 official teams and a new skill tree character development, which, by the way, makes us feel like the greatest of noobs in these sort of things, even already being vaccinated with the previous games of the franchise. At the start of the races, we can even manage to position ourselves in front of the pack, but just a slight push from one of our opponents, a fall that could have been perfectly avoided, or simply a poorly calculated jump, causes despair and frustration that takes control over ourselves, sending us to the last places. It is imperative to take into account that this is a very physical and high contact sport, in part due to the own nature of the tracks where all this frantic action takes place. 
Obviously that in career mode, we start from scratch as a fairly inexperienced rider and in a team with scarce resources. As we complete events, even finishing last in all of them, we gain skill points that are extremely useful to evolve the most varied aspects of piloting. Venturing in special events, completing specific trainings and fulfilling the constant objectives of the journal are other ways to obtain those skill points. The goal is to reach the prestigious 450SX class and along this route we will face the largest number of professional riders ever present in this franchise, more than 100, and where by requests from the community we can also play as Ken Rockton, nowadays considered as one of the best riders in the Queen class of Supercross. With regard to the number of tracks available, Supercross 4 offers all 11 stadiums and 17 tracks from the 2020 season, which also includes the 7 Salt Lake City variants. As stated earlier, the route to be champion is long, steep and packed with obstacles. Our career begins in the brand new starting class entitled Supercross Futures and each rider's performance is affected by their own skill, dexterity and perseverance. To improve these very important aspects we need, of course, to achieve such skill points. Supercross 4 also brings a more advanced and intuitive track editor with new modules as well as additional cosmetic customization options that allows us to express our creativity and subsequently share with the community. These modules were built directly from the official tracks present in the 2020 championship and among them we'll find the start line and finish line structures. Also present is a new compound, a kind of amusement park for motorcycle freaks, which allows free exploration along with up to three other friends, a beautiful location inspired by the islands of Maine in the region of New England, USA. 1MX and 4SX tracks can also be explored and enjoyed at this adrenaline fueled testing and training site, as well as a variety of challenges and collectibles that unlock additional equipment. Speaking of additional equipment, more than 110 official brands of visual and performance items are waiting to be used and abused for both riders and motorcycles, from complete suits, boots, glasses, helmets and neck braces, to suspensions, rims, exhausts, tires, brakes, handlebars, saddles, rear sprockets, hand grips and hand guards. Online mode is always welcome in this type of games, although, when this review was put together, the servers were always empty. However, the promise of pure multiplayer fun is something to take into account with exclusively dedicated Amazon servers, as these tracks with real riders going through them and with all the detail and information to be processed makes the whole experience addictive for those who play and demanding for the service provider. A race director mode is also promised for after the game's final release on March 11. Traditionally in these games there are always other ways to pick and play immediately without the need to create a pilot and to subject himself to a long and painful career in this branch of motorsport. Single event and championship are also available, where we can jump right away to the upper classes and choose one of the many official riders and teams of the 2020 season, immediately starting this adventure without worrying about skill points, with the need for upgrades to the rider and the bike, with training sessions and special events and with everything else mentioned prior. It is the fastest and most effective way to get to know the tracks and their traps. Sounds and music follows the same path of previous installments and the rider response and the feedback it transmits us is pretty damn good, excluding a few awkward movements after some sporadically tight maneuvers. Something I noticed and even missed was the lack of dynamic weather effects, particularly with regard to rain during the event. 
I missed it because I've always been an expert rider in these most adverse conditions, whether it's motorcycle or car games. Don't get me wrong, mud and water on the track are a constant, but that rain pouring down, so common in previous titles of the series and also on Milestone's MXGP franchise, was something I experienced less than expected during all the races I did for this review. Was it due to feedback from players regarding the previous title, who complained about the exaggerated number of races they were forced to finish under such harsh conditions? We're not facing at all a casual game for casual players, so I strongly recommend Monster Energy Supercross 4 solely to all fans of this particular form of motorsport. Keep also into account that this review was carried out based on the PC version of the game. And I truly believe that the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X versions are identical, running at 60 frames per second and with the same level of graphical detail. For previous generation consoles, the PS4 and Xbox One, and given the disaster there was Supercross 3 on those systems, their respective versions are discouraged. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! You know how fanatic I am for the racing genre. Cars, motorcycles, trucks, bicycles, it doesn't matter. If it has at least two wheels, I wanna play it. So, here's my personal 10 favorite racing games from the past generation. Let's take a look! Please bear in mind that this is my personal list, with my own choices and preferences attained by the hundreds of hours spent with each and not based on what other people say all over the internet, so feel free to drop your favorites down in the comments section below. Let's start with a couple of huge disappointments and with Overpass that had a really good opportunity to make a difference. When I'm willing to try a specific racing game, my mindset is towards what it has promised to be in the first place within its own subgenre. Most of the times Overpass fails to get the premise it set out to offer, and because of that, I still need to travel all the way back to the year 2000 to experience a game with a similar but way more satisfying experience. Don't get me wrong, Overpass can be fun and enjoyable, but at the same time extremely frustrating because of its odd physics that can ruin that specific experience, mainly on those more technical tracks. Check my complete review if you missed it. Another gigantic disappointment was Dirt 5, that can also be featured in this video because it's also available for PS4 and Xbox One, so technically it's a last gen game. And oh boy, what a disappointment it was! On PC and graphically speaking, it's a gorgeous game, no doubt, but its extremely repetitive gameplay is so bland, with absolutely no feeling whatsoever, that I just want to complete it ASAP and move on. What the hell were they thinking when placing these invisible sidewalls? It's 2021 for God's sake! I recall being completely overwhelmed when Colin McRae 3 introduced breakable ribbons on the side of the road. And where's that so hyped Motorstorm inspiration? It's nowhere to be seen! And what about that deformable terrain present not only in the Motorstorm franchise, but also in 2007 Sega Rally? <laughs> that was 14 years ago! Damn it! So sad! I have also two honorable mentions to announce, and the first one goes to Baja Edge of Control HD. Yeah, why not? This was the generation of remakes and remasters, 
and I can recall a few that were praised by the gaming press and gamers alike. So, and despite also having played to exhaustion the original game back from September of 2008, both on the Xbox 360 and on the PlayStation 3, I simply had to grab and finish also the PlayStation 4 and PC HD versions released in late 2017, cause you know how important this game was when my kid was born. If you don't know that, it's because you don't follow my channel as you should. Besides that, it's one of the best off-road games ever made. I've already reviewed the original game a few years back, so if you're interested, you know where to find it. The second honorable mention has to go to Art of Rally, with its gorgeous graphical style and minimalistic approach to this particular form of motorsport and undeniably heart-pumping soundtrack. The driving model is really good and the beauty in its handling is in its simplicity. We just need to master braking and drifting, but these undulating tracks distracting us with their beauty and cunning successions of corners and jumps are a constant test of our reflexes. No matter where we go, the view is unquestionably stunning. The low poly style combined with the lighting and vibrant colors makes for a beautiful game. Also, check my full review if you missed it. Now let's move on to my top 10 preferences and to the games I've spent more time with, both on the PC and on the PlayStation 4. Obviously that I've played other racing games on these systems and on the Nintendo Switch, but none really grabbed my attention that much. Also, I don't own an Xbox One, cause my PC is a better alternative to Microsoft's console and every game I want to play end up also being released on PC. TT Isle of Man Right on the Edge 2 is one of the few asphalt racers featured in this list that really grabbed me. And let me start by saying this. No other racing video game manages to give you such a sense of speed. And the audio really helps to immerse ourselves even more. There's effective wind noise that changes as we blast past different objects, combined with strong force feedback and a highly strong engine. Our eyes will start bleeding really soon due to all the focus and concentration required. If we make a mistake, will likely hit a wall or a house at 200 km per hour. These roads are littered with bumps, trees, walls, buildings, odd cambers and other immovable objects. Alongside the stunning course and frankly incredible speed sensation is the vehicle handling. If you're after an arcade motorcycle game, this isn't the one. In TT Isle of Man 2, finishing a race without falling once is an incredible achievement. In the first hours of gameplay, it's an impossible task, be aware of that. But when we start nailing those curves at high speed and avoiding trackside objects, we'll be ready to face the real challenges. Again, check my full review if you're interested. Back in 2014 we had a new entry in the Trials franchise, Trials Fusion, a game that still has the power to hold myself hostage for hours in a row, both on the PC and on my PlayStation 4. In 2019 Trials Rising followed, but honestly, didn't grab me as much. It was even given away last Christmas, last Christmas I gave you my heart, for free by Ubisoft. But the futuristic setting of Fusion is probably what makes me coming back to it over and over. I own this complete pack, the awesome Max Edition, that features a ton of extra content that were released as a series of DLCs during its lifespan. So there's plenty of stuff to keep us entertained for quite some time. The game is set in the year 2042, after an object fell from the sky and changed our world. And while playing, so many other things are happening in the background. It really has the power to grab my complete attention, trying to absorb all the details. Such an amazing game that I've reviewed in the early days of the channel. I invite you all to check it out. That way you'll witness how far this channel has come.
V Rally 4 has probably some of the most amazing fictional tracks ever in a rally game, packed with adrenaline and incredible and overwhelming views. Just look at it! And, and be extremely careful not to end up falling down these cliffs in Monument Valley. V Rally 4 is a huge underrated game from the makers of the current official WRC games, Kiloton. It features a few different racing disciplines and a pretty decent campaign. But sadly, it received so many poor reviews that simply pushed players away from it. But it can be a lot of fun, mainly in its own online multiplayer mode and honestly, it totally deserves a look. Nowadays I'm a bit saturated by racing games that takes place in closed circuits 100% over asphalt, that try to be as close to reality as possible, so be advised. You won't find stuff like Gran Turismo Sport, Forza Motorsports or Project Cars in this list. I've played them all, but they simply didn't grab me as much as the games featured in this video. Left 5 and break left to 50. As you might remember, a brand new IP from Evolution Studios was being developed and scheduled for release alongside the PS4 back in 2013, but ended up suffering various delays and was only released a year later by October of 2014. When Drive Club was finally on store shelves, it ended up crushed by the press that stated that it was incomplete and filled with problems regarding its online mode. I can't really say anything related to that, cause I only bought my very own PS4 in July of 2016, and by that time, all issues were totally solved. As you know, all that bad press and negative feedback from players led to the dismemberment of Evolution Studios, starting by letting off more than 50 employees in March of 2015, and a year later, the main door was completely and forever closed by Sony. Check my retrospective and complete history of Evolution Studios to know more. I truly love this game, and for me, it's still one of the best looking games on the system. And it plays awesome with a PS4 controller. So in this one, we compete in events all around the world in standard races, time trials, drifting events, championship tournaments in Canada, Norway, India, Scotland, Chile and Japan, offering an amazing day and night cycle and weather system. If you haven't played this one, well, you should! Forza Horizon 3 is pretty amazing and for me more appealing than Horizon 4 cause, well, deserts, sand, <laughs> that sort of thing. Again, I'm not a fan of racing games that forces you to drive over asphalt 100% of the time. I drive my real car on real asphalt every single day on my way to work, back home, etc. So on any chance that I have, I grab my mountain bike and go exploring the wilderness. The same happens in video games, if I have the chance to go off-road, that's where you'll find me. Even so, I had a lot of fun with both installments, but my thoughts on Forza Horizon 4 is that it should have been released as a sort of DLC for Horizon 3, or even as a standalone DLC at a reduced price, just like The Lost Legacy was in relation to Uncharted 4. It's pretty much the same thing, only on a different setting and environment, so yeah. As for more serious racers out there, Dirt Rally 2.0 is the pinnacle in graphics, physics and handling in what rally games are concerned, and it only fails to be the best in that department, simply because it doesn't feature the full WRC calendar and it's crammed with paid DLCs. Shame on you Codemasters, and now that you've sold your soul to Electronic Arts, I can only expect the worst. I just hope that by 2023, time on a WRC license is expected to be in your dirty hands. You think of a different direction to respect its fan base created around the previous official games, not only from Kiloton, but also prior to that from Milestone and Evolution Studios. With all that said, Dirt Rally 2.0 is a really excellent rally game that followed the steps of its older brother that paved the way for the success of the Dirt Rally series within the main Dirt series, if it makes sense. 
Into six left, Titans of a crest. Into six right of a crest. And that obviously leads me to WRC 9, the most faithful representation of the World Rally Championship with teams, cars and locations of last year's calendar, even if it was cut down due to this freaking horrible pandemic that simply insists on staying with us. So with all that in mind, let's take a ride on these gorgeous New Zealand landscapes, probably the only place in the world where we can wander around free and safe without Covid or coronavirus stuck in our minds. WRC9 isn't as pretty and doesn't perform as well as Dirt Rally 2.0, but it features a complete championship, so we don't have to pay more for extra stuff considered as essential for the complete experience. In comparison with the previous installment, I've noticed a slight upgrade in the environmental lighting, on the sensation of depth and on the attention to detail with believable shadows, dust and sun reflections on surfaces. Tiny details I know, but these are proof that Kiloton indeed took their time to implement their expertise all around this new entry in the series, taking it to a slightly higher level. And apart from that, we're contemplated with three completely new rallies, New Zealand, Kenya and Japan. So in total we have 13 totally different environments to race on through the course of over 100 stages from which over 30 are completely new. I'm yet to try the PS5 version of WRC9 so and while that doesn't happen I'll continue to go flat out on my trustworthy PS4. Again my complete review of WRC9 is available. Check it out! Gravel is such an underrated game, and I truly believe that Milestone is already working on a sequel. I'm crossing my fingers! This one is so much fun, in the likes of Sega Rally, so if you enjoy truly 100% arcade racing stuff, I'm certain that you'll love Gravel. So many awesome locations to explore, but as you know, I'm obsessed with the desert, with Dakar-like stuff. So these particular tracks in Namibia are a treat for me, with rocky formations to dodge, tunnels to drive through and plenty of sand. So much fun indeed and you'll find a ton other incredible places with mud, water, gravel, you name it, with also a pretty awesome variety of vehicles and disciplines to embrace. The only downside is that the career mode is a bit short, something that all petrol heads will finish in less than 5 hours but in my honest opinion, it's totally worth it. As you know, this was a generation of paid DLCs, so for Gravel, there are also available a couple more chapters and car packs to be added to the game, but follow my example and buy those only on sale. At least these unique episodes, Colorado River and Ice and Fire. Gravel was also reviewed here on It's a Pixel Thing, feel free to check it out if you missed it. You won't find a racing game like Dakar 18. The driving physics are indeed all messed up, I totally agree with that. But Dakar 18 isn't just another standard racing game. As I said prior, when I play a specific racing game, my mindset is towards what that particular game was set out to be in the first place, and Dakar 18 promised to be a navigation and orientation simulation, and it really is. A truly realistic one. When I see myself lost somewhere in the middle of the desert, panic can easily set in. I can really feel that in my own skin. There's no music playing on the radio. My navigator insists on not helping me at all. And when I get stuck in awkward situations like this one, the anxiety levels go through the roof. Mainly because no one is willing to rescue me as hard as I try. Dakar 18 is really different from everything else and tailored for fans of the real race that are familiar with its own specific set of rules. So if you're in the mood of crashing through brick walls like if they were sheets of paper not suffering any damage, better look somewhere else. In the end of the day, even having the problems that he had with the driving mechanics, Dakar 18 is indeed a racing game, cause we have to race from point A to point B nailing through that process 
every single checkpoint to avoid penalties that can ruin the overall time. And the way to enjoy it fully has to be in its legend mode, the extreme and complete navigation experience, cause again, it's what this game is about. Truly looking forward for Dakar 21, that will be released later this year and will include physics from the Mud Runner series, oh yeah! It will be incredible! In the meanwhile, and while that doesn't happen, check my full review of Dakar 18. And the only reason for Dakar 18 not being on the top spot of my favorite racing games from the past generation is because we had Rackfest. This is by miles the most fun and enjoyable racing game we had, at least in this last decade. This is obviously my own and personal opinion based again on my experience and not on what other people say, think or believe. I supported this game day one, still in early access on Steam and originally called the next car game. It came from the hands of Bugbear, the guys behind the, let's say, original Flat Out series. In between we had also Flat Out 4, also during this past generation, but coming from another developer that ended up messing up the series on Mystique. As for Wreckfest, it's basically a fest of wrecking. <laughs> And it's hard to imagine that this game almost got lost and forgotten due to a failed Kickstarter campaign. There are so many titles out there not only related to the racing genre that have the support from huge companies with astronomical marketing campaigns that simply end up being a complete mess and Bugbear practically on their own offered us this game that is simply one of the best ever made in the whole video gaming scene. One of my 1000 games to play before you die sort of thing. Highly recommended and online is so, but so much fun. Another title that I had the extreme pleasure to review. What a ride. É só verdalhada. So here you have it. My favorite racing games from the past generation that offered me hundreds of hours of extreme fun and enjoyment. Many others were played, tried out, experienced, lived and hated, but these were indeed the ones that left that stain, that mark, that drop of sweat, making me come back to them time and time again. Let me know down in the comment section below your personal favorites, I'm really curious to know. In the meanwhile, if you've enjoyed this episode, you know the drill. So thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Se a Slightly Mad Studios estivesse ainda debaixo da alçada da Electronic Arts, este jogo chamar-se-ia sem sombra de dúvida. Need for Speed Shift 3 Foram tantas as memórias que Project Cars 3 me trouxe da saga Shift que fiquei surpreendido com o rumo que a equipa de desenvolvimento deu a uma série que em tempos foi bastante hardcore. Na reta final de desenvolvimento, a Slightly Mad Studios foi adquirida pela Codemasters que, como todos sabem, é responsável por tantos êxitos dentro do género, nomeadamente nas sagas Dirt e Grid. E ao contrário de que muitos poderão pensar, esta aquisição de última hora não implicou de todo mudanças drásticas no desenvolvimento do jogo. De qualquer forma, o futuro da franquia Project Cars permanecerá em boas mãos. Ou não será bem assim. Project Cars sempre foi sinónimo de simulação automobilística pura e dura, mas este terceiro capítulo da série mostra-se como um virar de página nesse aspecto, revelando-se agora um simcade, um misto de simulação e arcade que consegue atrair o mais casual dos jogadores que apenas quer dar uma agradável voltinha de domingo num dos 211 veículos e 51 traçados disponíveis, como circuitos fechados, autódromos e circuitos citadinos ou de estrada. O controle dos carros não é tão exigente como nos seus irmãos mais velhos e há imensos ajustes possíveis na ajuda à condução, tanto na direção como na travagem e na estabilidade. No entanto, 
Quantas mais ajudas estiverem desligadas, maior é a compensação por cada objetivo conquistado. Para quem já está familiarizado com modos de carreira em jogos de condução, estará em casa em Project Cars 3. Diferentes categorias e locais são-nos propostos com distintos objetivos para alcançar. Em Project Cars 3, deixar fugir o pódio não significa sermos barrados na progressão na carreira. Atingir a mais elevada velocidade possível no final daquela reta, efetuar o maior número de ultrapassagens num curto espaço de tempo e até conquistar um determinado número de curvas perfeitas, são pormenores que conseguem prender-nos ao comando ou ao volante por horas a fio, tornando a vitória final na prova como um objetivo secundário. Project Cars 3 tem o poder de fazer com que qualquer jogador casual se sinta o melhor condutor do mundo. Os mais experientes nestas andanças terão de optar pelos níveis de dificuldade mais elevados para que tenham um desafio mais exigente, pois para estes é bastante fácil atingir todas as metas propostas e ainda o primeiro lugar no pódio. Demasiado fácil até, o que fará a esta raça de jogadores simplesmente desistir do jogo por não levar a simulação ao extremo, característica que, como mencionei acima, rotulava a série. Um dos seus maiores trunfos nesta abrupta e inesperável mudança no rumo da franquia é a personalização dos bólides, não só a nível de performance, como também esteticamente. Podemos inclusive elevar o nosso veículo de eleição até ao final da carreira, fazendo durante esse percurso os óbvios upgrades necessários. Há no entanto uma desvantagem nisso. Após feito o upgrade, com novas peças que melhoram todos os aspectos da competitividade, o nosso carro deixa de poder participar nas categorias mais baixas. E depois de abusar em todos esses upgrades, o mais certo é estarmos muito próximos de ficar falidos. Se for esse o trajeto tomado, teremos que ter em conta que o downgrade ao veículo vem com um custo extra. Esta gestão é também ela, um trunfo para todos os entusiastas da personalização e do tuning e com a experiência ao longo do percurso na carreira, a obtenção de descontos em peças e upgrades tornarão toda a evolução mais fácil de gerir. Clima dinâmico está também presente em Project Cars 3, para jogar a sua cartada durante as provas e dar-lhes um rumo totalmente diferente, pois altera bastante o modo de condução, o que pode interferir no desfecho da própria corrida. No entanto, e principalmente nas provas do modo carreira, o algoritmo é forçado a uma mudança rápida e drástica devido à curta duração das provas, o que causa uma transição visualmente decepcionante. E também devido a essa curta duração das provas, a agressividade na condução com travagens de última hora embatendo nos adversários para aquela ajuda preciosa na altura de curvar, é o prato do dia. Para além do clima dinâmico, a inteligência artificial dos adversários e o sistema de danos são de veras desapontantes. Aliás, este último é no mínimo caricato e incompreensível nos dias que correm. Para além do já mencionado modo carreira, existem também os tradicionais multiplayer online e Quick Play. Neste último são nos colocados de imediato à disposição os mais de 200 carros e a meia centena de pistas para desfrutarmos a nosso belo prazer e com regras por nós estabelecidas. O Mod Rivals está também disponível onde o jogador é colocado frente a frente com a comunidade online onde é possível participar em eventos diários, semanais e mensais em carros e traçados bem distintos e onde dispomos de 30 tentativas em cada um desses eventos para melhorar a nossa prestação e subir o mais alto possível no ranking mundial. Project Cars 3 decepciona mais do que impressiona, mesmo sendo possuidor de um dos melhores sistemas de controlo que vi ser implementado num gamepad nestes últimos anos, apesar de não se sentirem grandes diferenças merecedoras de destaque no comportamento de carro para carro. A resolução gráfica dinâmica dos mais variados elementos durante as provas é por vezes um espetáculo de pixels, principalmente em pista molhada. E foi triste ver desaparecer a vertente Rallycross introduzida no título anterior. Este facto talvez se justifique por ser uma experiência exclusiva do Dirt Rally 2.0 da Codemasters. No entanto, o leque de carros e locais disponíveis, aliados ao mencionado excelente sistema de controle com um gamepad, pode atenuar ligeiramente todos esses problemas. Mesmo assim, é mais um título que irá muito rapidamente cair no esquecimento. Lembram-se quando mencionei ao início e a aquisição da Slightly Mad Studios por parte da Codemasters podia ser uma coisa boa? Após experienciar este Project Cars 3, estou certo que sim, pois a utilização do motor Ego da Codemasters vai, sem dúvida alguma, dar origem a um Project Cars 4 que todos vão querer jogar.
Art of Rally is an artistic visual expression, a form of meditation in where we race from the 60s through to the 90s across famous but yet fictitious locations around the globe. The minimalistic approach to the game itself extends all the way from the menus and option screens to those trackside objects that normally have stamped well-known real-life brands. In Art of Rally there isn't a co-driver warning us not to cut the next corner or giving those two common pace notes. But even so, a few warnings here and there on those tighter bands or jumps would be appreciated. One thing that can be really annoying is when we step away a couple of meters from the main track. The screen fades to black and we respawn losing most of the time tons of precious seconds that can ruin a race. And even being this zen-like experience, winning races is key to advance and to unlock more cars, liveries and other championships. The driving model is really good and the beauty in its handling is in its simplicity. You just need to master braking and drifting, but these undulating tracks, distracting us with their beauty and cunning successions of corners and jumps, are a constant test of our reflexes. Even the handling on this Stratus wannabe, supposedly one of the most difficult cars to drive ever made, is smooth and a blast to drive around corners. But Art of Rally doesn't just offer a career mode, and Free Roam isn't just an empty map either. There are cassettes to find which unlock new songs, photo locations and even a Tony Hawk style letter hunt spelling out the word Rally, which will unlock the next Free Roam map. These really do add a little extra to a game that so easily could have been nothing but Rally stage after Rally stage. The 8 camera settings available helped me to adapt my driving skills better than the 4 difficulty levels. Go high and we get more of a preview of what's ahead. Go closer and maybe preview two turns ahead, but gain greater precision for finding and taking the apex of a turn. This approach to the more common chase camera is without any doubt my favorite. The view from above and the silhouettes of those iconic cars bring classic games from the 90s to mind like Thrash Rally and Neo Drift Out, but the handling has more in common with WRC9 and Dirt Rally 2.0 than, let's say, Sega Rally. The difficulty setting will be approachable for everyone who has ever steered a car in an arcade racer, but the first four difficulty and damage settings still had me on the podium, even making a few mistakes in each stage and very few repairs between them. On master difficulty and severe damage, I found the kind of rally challenge I wanted. Trust me, this game won't pose much more than a casual challenge to serious rally racers out there. No matter where you go, the view is undeniably gorgeous. The low poly style combined with the lighting and vibrant colors makes for a beautiful game. The bright pink of the cherry blossoms in Japan, the sandy beaches of Sardinia or even the frozen lakes of Norway all look incredible. And the photo mode present is so easy to use and highly recommended just to take a snapshot of that perfect sunset. And I must not end this review without mentioning the gorgeous soundtrack with the perfect blend of synth and 80s beats that just makes me tap my foot on the floor with enjoyment, cause it's simply the perfect complement to the retro aesthetic of this wonderful and relaxing rally game. Rally driving is all about blessing our way into the unknown, understanding the risk of fast driving in a way you can't on a novel or well-known circuit. If that's what you're looking for in a racing game that can also be relaxing at the same time, Art of Rally is for you. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of It's a Pixel Thing, so if you did, you know the drill. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers!
Remember WRC 8? Well, WRC 9 is all that and more. It's a sort of remastered version of WRC 8 with a bit more extra stuff included in the mix. And when a game is set to be released also for the next-gen systems that are coming, the remastered aspect has to be taken really seriously. With that said, when I first set my eyes upon this new installment, that supposed generational leap wasn't that obvious. Probably because I'm playing the PlayStation 4 version on the normal PS4 and not the Pro. Even so, I've noticed a slight upgrade in the environmental lighting, on the sensation of depth and on the attention to detail, with believable shadows, dust and sun reflections on surfaces, small details that are proof that Kiloton indeed took their time to implement their expertise all around this new entry in the series, taking it to a slightly higher level. Still, not the quality standards set by Dirt Rally 2.0 from Codemasters. Three new rallies are waiting for us and ready to be enjoyed. New Zealand, Japan and the Mythic Safari Rally. In WRC9 we have a total of 13 totally different environments to race on, through the course of over 100 stages, from which over 30 are completely new. Extra content will also arrive in the future, both free and paid DLC. And something that I've always loved about Kiloton and their rally titles is that we have, right out of the box, all official rally locations available and ready to be experienced. But not everything looks and sounds that great. Driving over tarmac feels a bit artificial, mainly on those more sinuous parts of the stages, while on loose dirt everything flows like it should, when power sliding around airpins for example. And the New Zealand stages are a treat for all rally racers out there that love driving fast with constant changes of direction. On tarmac though, the weight and mass transfer aren't quite right, what can lead to crashes that could be completely avoided. But to be honest, I never enjoyed playing on tarmac, so I guess that the problem lies within myself. Apart from that, everything else is spot on, but bear in mind that this is still a game for a niche audience. But isn't FIFA and Pro Evolution Soccer for a niche audience also? These games are for the competitor that lives inside of us. If you don't like to compete, then you're on the completely wrong page and sports games aren't for you. Maybe you should be playing Flight Simulator instead. WRC9 brings a lot of new content, with 15 classic cars awaiting to be unlocked a co-driver mode to play cooperatively and that will be delivered for free on a scheduled November 2020 update and a clubs mode where we can set up our own championship to race with friends. We can play in three clubs besides our own at any one time and an esports patch will arrive by December anticipating next year's esports competition. WRC9 is to my eyes a simcade a mix of simulation and arcade that can be fully enjoyed with a gamepad, again, if you're familiar with this sort of games. And the team behind its development are saying that the haptic feedback from PS5's DualSense controller will once again revamp the experience, not mentioning the expected 4K resolution at 60 frames per second, and in this year's WRC title, only our brain is our enemy. The handling, physics and suspension control inspires way more confidence than on previous installments, allowing us to push harder and harder each time. WRC9 really feels natural and realistic, truly important characteristics in a game of this nature. Well, on dirt and dusty surfaces at least. The career mode from WRC8 makes a return that will let us climb our way up from Junior WRC or WRC3 through WRC2 finally culminating in the main WRC category. In between we have the chance to manage the team in terms of vehicle upgrades and of hiring staff and specialized personnel for the many different areas that surround the sport, so that we can achieve the many proposed objectives and attain the much desired contracts and try to reach victorious to the top. 
When not competing for the championship, we can relax entering other events featuring historic cars and other driving tests under extreme weather conditions, for example, again, just like what was offered last year on WRC 8. The main difference now is probably the inclusion of the WRC 3 class, that simply didn't exist in the previous installment. On the other hand, the AI performance is a bit strange. In one stage and after a perfect run, we're completely destroyed by our opponents and in the next and driving like a baby. We finish first with dozens of seconds of advantage. All the stages carried over from WRC 8 look the same, but a more satisfying feeling of immersion while driving them was indeed added. Still, the normal PS4 version can't visually transmit the sensation that we're facing a current generation game, when inevitably comparing it with the obvious Dirt Rally 2.0. But we can indeed witness an environmental upgrade in relation to last year's release, just by stopping the car to admire the surroundings. But WRC 9 is a game to be played fast, the fastest possible, but again, we can't simply ignore all the work that was put on by Kiloton's small development team to bring WRC 9 to life and take the series to a new level of immersion, allied with the amazing dynamic weather and the game's own sound engine, features that play huge roles in the whole authenticity. Even so, driving in Kenya was truly disappointing. I was really looking forward to this year's release, because I had huge expectations of driving in completely drenched stages, with tons of mud to negotiate on classic vehicles like the Celica, with those exhaust pipes coming up from the bonnet all the way up to the roof. Even so, this is still a work in progress game, a sort of early access, because besides all the awesome stuff that will be rolling out for the next gen systems, Kiloton has already promised that they will also be releasing completely free of charge six new additional Finnish stages and six Portuguese in October and in November respectively. Besides other freebies like a photo mode, a new concept car and a new extra WRC driver. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Highly recommended, but again, only if you're a fan of this particular form of motorsport. Hope you've enjoyed this video, so if you did, you know the drill. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Junction right. Whoops. Aceto Corsa Competizione transporta-me atrás no tempo até por volta de 2005, quando ele delirava com simuladores puros e duros vindos da casa sueca, conhecida como Simbin, lembram-se? Uh, jogos como o GT Legends, jogos como o GTR 2, uh, o Race 07 e as suas, as suas expansões, e até mesmo na Xbox, uh, na Xbox 360 o Race Pro proporcionaram horas e horas de pura e realística diversão, numa época em que eu pessoalmente devorava esta vertente dentro do género. Neste último ano, o jogo da Kunos Simulazione tem feito as delícias dos fãs que o consideram como o melhor da atualidade no PC. Chega agora também às consolas da geração atual, a Xbox One e a Playstation 4, mas será que também conseguem pressionar? É mais do que óbvio que a versão PC é graficamente superior à da Playstation 4, que agora me chegou às mãos. Ainda para mais, a minha PS4 não é a Pro, portanto, vale o que vale. Visualmente o jogo parece datado, desfocado e é quase impossível perceber à distância quando deveremos começar a travar. Isso faz com que esteja sempre a sair fora da pista, por travar demasiado tarde devido à difícil percepção dos sinais na berma da pista. Já experienciei jogos na PS3 com melhor detalhe e definição gráfica e pior do que isso, o jogo está bloqueado a 30 frames por segundo, mesmo nos modelos mais potentes da PS4 e da Xbox One. 
A inclusão de um tutorial é algo que também poderia ajudar os jogadores mais casuais a atenuar a íngreme linha de aprendizagem, mas lá está. Este não é um título para jogadores casuais. Já em termos sonoros, o jogo brilha. A Kuno se conseguiu transportar magistralmente para as consolas toda a qualidade sonora dos motores e da ambientação. No entanto, a datada qualidade gráfica deita tudo a perder. Estas imperfeições que aqui vemos ou efeitos de ghosting em condições meteorológicas mais adversas são algo difícil de engolir, assim como apreciar os adversários a encostarem nas boxes nesta manobra que nem na era da PlayStation 2 acontecia, no mínimo incompreensível. Tirando todos estes pontos menos positivos, temos que aplaudir a parceria da italiana Kunos com o Campeonato Mundial de GT3, o intitulado Blank Pain GT Racing Series que oferece os 40 veículos oficiais, as respectivas equipas e pistas, estas últimas recriadas ao pormenor. E claro está, a Seto Corsa aposta tudo na vertente eSports, com o um campeonato mundial a decorrer em paralelo. As únicas ajudas à condução que este jogo nos oferece são a caixa de velocidades automática, ótima quando se joga com um comando, e a tradicional linha de trajetória ideal que, diga-se passagem, nunca usa em jogo algum. E não me considero um fanático pela simulação, mas sim um amante de jogos de desportos motorizados, que apenas gosta de se divertir, sem se preocupar muito com afinações de spoilers, das relações de caixa, etc, etc. Mas lá está, para poderem desfrutar deste jogo em pleno, o uso de um volante e pedais é essencial. Jogar com um comando ou teclado é extremamente frustrante. Tudo começa com um campeonato, ou se preferirmos, com um modo carreira, que é basicamente um campeonato, mas mais completo, com uma espécie de academia para novatos e outros testes mais específicos, que não justifica de todo a inexistência de um tutorial, onde temos que mostrar todas as nossas aptidões e logo aos comandos de grandes bólides, homologados para o campeonato GT3. Aqui não existe a tradicional ascensão como piloto, começando em classes inferiores. Nada disso. Colocam de imediato nas nossas mãos os carros mais potentes disponíveis, como Lamborghinis, McLaren F1s, Porsches, Nissan GTRs, Mercedes, Bentleys, etc. Portanto, um kit de unhas é essencial. Outros modos de jogo estão obviamente presentes, como é o caso de contra-relógio, corrida única, offline ou online, enfim, tudo o que habitualmente podemos encontrar em títulos idênticos. E o grande segredo aqui é a consistência, volta após volta, e não tentar ser o mais rápido. Ter cuidado com o acelerador é provavelmente a melhor manobra para sair vitorioso em Assetto Corsa Competizione, evitando ao máximo as zonas sujas da pista, principalmente nas condições meteorológicas mais difíceis. Mas mesmo assim, estamos perante um simulador extremo, com uma inteligência artificial excessivamente penalizadora que tenta nos afastar e humilhar logo de início. Dedicação e persistência são qualidades que nem todos possuímos, mas só assim vamos conseguir melhorar a nossa prestação e ir lentamente subindo na classificação. A Seto Corsa Competizione já conquistou o seu lugar e os corações dos amantes do género, tanto da modalidade em questão, como dentro do nicho específico dos simuladores automobilísticos. O jogo foi especificamente criado para ser desfrutado no PC, onde não há limitação de frames e onde tudo é muito mais definido e fluido, o que, diga-se passagem, torna tudo mais fácil. Como disse atrás, nesta conversão, apenas o som se manteve inalterável. Vamos esperar que em futuros patches e updates a Kunos consiga resolver a inferior qualidade gráfica nas consolas comparativamente ao PC, pois este pequeno detalhe faz a diferença num simulador onde todos os milésimos de segundo contam para a vitória final. Press Cross Button! Finalmente alguém confirma que isto aqui é uma cruz e não um X! Malta, esta foi a minha review, a minha análise ao Assetto Corsa Competizione, uma espécie de comparação da versão agora lançada para as consolas contra a versão original PC, que, já, yeah, graficamente, continua a ser bastante superior. E vocês já sabem, se gostaram do vídeo, deixem o um like, subscrevam este canal e, e, obviamente, deixem o vosso comentário. E vejo-vos no próximo vídeo. Tchau!
Hey guys, welcome back! First of all, this game doesn't quite stand by its own title, because it's slow in every single meaning of the word. So, if you're in a hurry, don't leave just yet. Check this review out, because it's a fast one. This has been a long couple of weeks, really long, playing SnowRunner. Don't get me wrong, this game can be fun, rewarding and painful at the same time. Perfect for those more serious drivers out there. You've obviously noticed that I said drivers and not racers, right? Cause this isn't a racing game, it's a driving experience like no other, or better saying, an extension of what Focus Interactive have been offering us in recent years, from the original spin tires all the way through the Mud Runner experience culminating in this one. There's a bit of false advertising in Snow Runner, Slow Runner would have suited perfectly, and it's indeed very slow in all aspects, from the speed at which vehicles move around to the slow and steep learning curve of the game itself, starting with the highly complicated graphical user interface present that got me lost in things, within things, with other things, among things. <laughs> No kidding! In my first try, I lost half an hour just trying to figure out how all that worked. And even so, I completely failed to accomplish my first mission. Again, don't get me wrong, this is an awesome game, but it was tailored to fit one particular niche of gamers and drivers out there, just like Dakar 18 was. Not every racing game fanatic will enjoy SnowRunner. But if you've played the previous installments, then you'll certainly love this new entry in the series. It could have perhaps been delivered as a DLC to Mud Runner. I really can't see a point on turning this one into a full priced release. It would have been nicer if, for instance, Mud Runner was also included as a bundle, or the other way around. Even so, if you're still here listening to my voice, it's because you really love these sort of games. Or you really love my voice. Either way, SnowRunner is a game to be taken slow, really slow, accomplishing objectives one by one and conquering the maps and unlocking tons of different goals. But again, this is a game of patience and the lack of this particular characteristic in our DNA will ruin the experience completely. Going up a mountain and being stuck halfway will automatically turn the panic button on. We have to think, to be smart and not floor the throttle trying desperately to get out of that awkward situation, mainly when there's no trees around to winch ourselves out. Just like in Overpass that I've also covered recently, Going gentle with the throttle and messing around with the transmission is key to success, avoiding or at least trying to avoid more embarrassing moments that will make us lose tons of precious time. But when we finally end up conquering one of the more demanding challenges, we'll be overwhelmed with joy and euphoria that will make us grab another task and drive into the rough and uneven wilderness defying our own survival instincts. Until we end up in a ditch! We start with a small tutorial showing off the basic actions to face some of the different adversaries present and soon after we'll find ourselves in the middle of a huge map with tons of missions to conquer. Completing these missions will result in a loaded bank account. That money can be spent buying better vehicles to explore even further into the unknown with confidence. And it's here where the more lucrative jobs are. Switching vehicles is something that fans of the series are accustomed with. When our truck gets stuck, we can quickly switch to another vehicle available at our garage and drive off to that location to use the winch to pull it out of that situation. When in online co-op, a buddy of ours can come to the rescue instead, just like in Dakar 18. Three locations awaits us, composed of 11 maps in total, each with their own unique terrain and atmosphere, being Michigan the first to be conquered, with that mud runner feeling splattered all over it, with winding mountain paths, rocky plateaus and lots of water and you guessed it, mud. 
were part of a rescue team to repair vital infrastructure and deliver supplies to those that have been affected by recent heavy flooding that occurred in that region. From Michigan we drive off to Alaska and it's here where the frustration really begins. With all the snow and the terrible and slippery ice that will punish the player really hard. Aside from Michigan and Alaska, a third location will also be at our disposal in the far north of Russia, a lovely place called Taimir, with forests, swampy and dirty roads and with a natural feel that incomprehensibly has the power to draw us in. If anything goes wrong during a certain mission, we always have the option to restart all over again, but after spending 50 minutes or more digging up the terrain, trying to conquer a huge slope or reaching the other side of a snowy forest, that's the last thing we want to do, because all that progress will be lost, will be consumed by frustration, will be extremely demoralized, that's for sure, but being able to face and conquer all these challenges is a freaking incredible feeling. It's just a question of, are you up to it? You know that I never go deep into the technical side of racing mechanics and gaming physics. With these reviews I simply try to transmit the feeling while exploring these games and the fun that they have to offer even to the more casual of players. Forza and Gran Turismo fans look somewhere else. Even the more hardcore off-road enthusiasts won't most likely enjoy this game. As said, this is a title for a niche audience, for those who enjoyed the previous installments in the Spin Tires Mud Runner series. And I'm thrilled to know that the new Dakar game in development will feature physics from SnowRunner. That's what really matters to me right now, and I can't wait for it to be announced. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! The asphalt side of motorcycle games was never my forte, but there's something about TT Isle of Man 2 that keeps me coming back to it. Let's take a look. I absolutely love motorcycle games, mostly related to off-road stuff, but uh, from time to time there comes an asphalt racer that can really grab my attention and has the power to keep me glued to it for hours in a row. Kiloton is best known for the official WRC series, but between that they managed to squeeze V-Rally 4 and the first TT Isle of Man that honestly didn't impress me that much. And while we're at it, WRC9 was already announced and coming next September and prepare yourselves for Test Drive Unlimited 3 also. So plenty of racing stuff coming. As for now, a more polished sequel to TT Isle of Man just arrived at our doorstep. But uh, what is this Isle of Man TT thing after all? In short, it's a yearly motorcycle race around the closed circuits of this island between England and Ireland. That's it! And let me start by saying this. No other racing video game manages to give you such a sense of speed. And the audio really helps to immerse ourselves even more. There's effective wind noise that changes as we blast past different objects combined with strong force feedback and highly strong engine. Our eyes will start bleeding really soon due to all focus and concentration required. If we make a mistake, we'll likely hit a wall or house at 200 miles per hour. These roads are littered with bumps, trees, walls, buildings, odd cambers and other immovable objects. And you thought that Nürburgring Nordschleife was tough, right? That one is child's play in comparison. 
Alongside the stunning course and frankly incredible speed sensation is the vehicle handling. If you're after an arcade motorcycle game, this isn't the one. It's pure simulation and the occasional wheelie maneuver that we innocently perform kind of reminds me of the Amazing Tourist Trophy, a PlayStation 2 exclusive released back in 2006. So be prepared to fail, cause this is the Richard Burns rally of motorcycle games. In TT Isle of Man 2, finishing a race without falling once is an incredible achievement. In the first hours of gameplay, it's an impossible task, be aware of that. But when we start nailing those curves at high speed and avoiding trackside objects, we'll be ready to face the real challenges. For instance, finishing the 4 laps of the classic TT event took around 90 minutes. Man, I can finish the longest stage in Dakar 18 in around 60 minutes. And you also thought that Dakar 18 was tough, right? Let's take a look at the career mode. We can race with our own bike or sign a contract with a team and use theirs. As we progress through the race calendar, which culminates in the main TT races, we'll first ride super sport bikes before progressing to classic and super bike classes. In addition, any cash attained by delivering good results is used to buy upgraded parts. The more we win, the more cash we'll earn. The more we get noticed by better teams and the more signatures we earn, all of which prove that we are good enough to race on the Isle of Man. The tracks used for these races are mostly fictional, based across the United Kingdom and Ireland. Many were recycled from the first game, while the Irish tracks are actually broken down elements from the game's open world area. And I kind of felt a subtle Forza Horizon feeling while riding around this area. These tracks are fun and pretty, but nowhere near as exciting as the real thing. While the races in Ireland are solid enough and the free roaming world is used between main career races for a handful of smaller challenges, they get repetitive rather quickly. And sadly, the tracks in Northern Ireland and Scotland are somewhat uninspiring. There's also included for the first time a perk system. This could be in the form of slower rivals, quicker respawn or faster pit stops. Points are used to unlock these but the system feels somewhat shallow and simply goes against the realistic feeling of the game. It's clearly a system that was implemented to try to grab the attention of those more casual players that are after a motorcycle game that can balance fiction with reality. But it fails. The riding line is precious, but most of the times braking when approaching a tight band isn't perfect. One time we'll find ourselves riding too slow and in the next we're just too fast resulting in a crash. A few other downsides are the inconsistent artificial intelligence, the lifeless and lack of traffic on the free roaming and open areas and the 30 frames per second on console. I've been switching from PS4 to PC and this last one is really the definitive version. And I wish that there was a split-screen multiplayer mode. The offline mode present is a hot seat sort of thing that, if you're the one in line waiting to play, you'll probably fall asleep. TT Isle of Man 2 is an adrenaline-packed racer. It's fast, dangerous and truly absorbing like no other. But be prepared to finish second if you're that good in this sort of games. The learning curve is really steep. The steeper I've seen in years, but when we nail it, it's truly rewarding. Hope you've enjoyed this review of TT Isle of Man right in the edge too, and if you did, you know the drill. So thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Take care and stay safe. Cheers!
Hey guys, welcome back! I've been anxious to play Overpass since it was initially announced. It had an original release date scheduled for October of 2019, but it was pushed forward to 2020. But uh, was the wait worth it? Let's take a look! If you fancy games like Screamer 4x4 and UAZ Racing 4x4, Overpass is right up your alley! This is one of those games where even with the clock ticking, we must stop and think really hard where to go next and at what angle we should attack one obstacle after the other so that we can maintain our momentum. If you're after a fast arcade off-road racing game, you've come to the wrong place. In this one, the various surfaces we drive on really makes a difference. Hills must be taken seriously and driving over mud is indeed really challenging, also looking pretty gorgeous by the way. And it's cool to see it being washed out from the tires while crossing other types of terrain. This isn't definitely an apply full throttle kind of stuff, no sir it isn't. We must find the perfect balance between speed and grip and our ability to analyze and read the terrain is key and probably the most important thing in overpass. Hill climbs aren't the only challenge here. There's a wide range of time trial events across the 43 tracks present. 24 vehicles split between UTVs and ATVs are available and unlocking them is extremely important to succeed. The more powerful vehicles you unlock, the better for you to advance through the career mode. Different medals are up for grabs on each track and according to the class of vehicle we choose and on ATVs, leaning our rider is really important to keep on going. My favorites must be the longer tracks that throws a certain number of different challenges for us to face, like natural rock formations and man-made obstacles of all sorts. To conquer all these hazards, tire placement is key to keep on moving. Besides the full career and 8 player online mode, split screen and hot seat multiplayer are also ready to be experienced and as for the hot seat, 8 players can join in. 4 officially licensed manufacturers are present, Suzuki, Articat, Polaris and Yamaha and 23 of the aforementioned 24 vehicles are from these renowned brands. It's up to us to find the best route to reach victorious to the end of each challenge. It's one of those trial and error kind of games that will reward us for spending time mastering each track. And after I finally did it, I feel compelled to go back and replay it just to improve my time. We start off as a rookie with a basic selection of vehicles. The goal is obviously to reach the top spot in the championship, but for that, winning races is imperative. That way we'll increase our reputation and gain sponsorships in the process, money will start pouring down like raindrops to purchase better equipped and powerful vehicles to tackle those more difficult tracks ahead. But don't be fooled, having more power won't necessarily mean that the upcoming challenges will become easier to conquer. As said, the key is to master the terrain. Each track is designed to give the artist time to the player. Again, acceleration and speed are truly important in overpass and three transmission types must be considered at all times, in and off race, two-wheel drive, four-wheel drive and differential lock. This last one allows us to force each wheel to turn at the same time and at the same speed. This will give us more power and traction, but harder to control than on two or four-wheel drive. I truly advise you to first play through the tutorial, it's imperative that you do so, even if you're a die-hard fan and expert in this sort of games. There are a few downsides though, the sound design is not perfect, that characteristic sound effect of the tires trying to gain traction on rocky sections is missing, water splashing is minimal or inexistent, the reverse not always works as it should. And the PS4 version is really annoying in what frame rate is concerned, at least on the basic PlayStation 4. And I say this cause when there's a cloud of dust, I've experienced a huge frame drop, something that simply doesn't happen on my PC with graphical settings set to maximum. And where's the crowd? With 
That said, Overpass is not for everyone. It's a really challenging game and ideal for all hardcore rock crawling off-road enthusiasts out there just like me, but even so, I felt frustrated after 10 attempts to conquer a particular track, making me even abandon the race and give it a try later but on a different machine. Zordix Racing, the developer behind this title, tried really hard to bring a faithful representation of the sport and I believe they've kind of nailed it in their first try. But there's a ton of work left to do that I would love to see corrected or slightly attenuated still in this first installment. There are also other minor bugs and awkward situations in where I had the feeling that physics weren't well implemented, but overall it's a freaking incredible challenge. Now if you excuse me, I'm off to the tracks to try to conquer a few more medals that I'm still missing in my trophy stand. In the meanwhile you know the drill, so don't forget to leave a like, share, comment, subscribe and click on that bell icon to receive notifications of all my future content. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back to a 2-in-1 not so retro review of a couple of obscure racing games available for the current gen. Gas Guzzlers Extreme and Off-Road Racing Buggy ATV Moto or something like that. So let's take a look. They're totally different from one another and both highly inspired by other racers from the past. Starting with Gas Guzzlers Extreme, the first thing that pops out is the use of such iconic trademark video game phrases as the ones from the mighty Duke Nukem. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This really pisses me off. Come get some. Say hello to my boomstick. Let's rock. And it looks like I'm playing a game on my PS3 and not on my PS4. It's not as odd as you might think. Gas Guzzlers Extreme was originally released for Windows PCs back in 2013. Three years later also arrived on Xbox One and by November of 2019 it was time for the PS4 to also get its own version. As you can witness it's nothing more than a basic combat racing game that was developed by Game Pyres and published by Iceberg Interactive. The goal is to dominate the tracks by racing and or shooting opponents through a course of 40 tracks and 8 different arenas. The game also offers 7 different race types such as Classic Race, Power Race, Battle Race, Knockout, Capture the Flag, Team Deathmatch and Last Man Standing. And check out the names of our opponents! <laughs> so hilarious! As usual we start off with low performance vehicles and must work our way up to high performance rigs by earning money in a series of high octane races and battles. And as you might expect, new game modes, tracks and vehicles become available as we progress. It might have been great back in 2013, but nowadays it really looks dated, but even so, it's quite fun to play for a bit, bringing to mind great classics from the past like for instance Interstate 76. So if you're willing to spend some time banging metal with metal and blowing stuff up, give Gas Guzzlers Extreme a chance. Bear in mind though that the visuals and audio are a poor example of what the current gen is able to accomplish and to achieve. Jumping right into off-road racing, the first thing that came to mind after playing it for a bit was the ill-fated Moro Racer 4. Have you played that one? This game borrows a bunch of tracks from Moro Racer 4, cause it also comes from Artifact Studio, the same group of people behind both games. But let's be honest, these tracks are way more enjoyable now than before. I'm not saying that this is the greatest off-road game ever. Off-road racing brings back amazing memories of playing, for instance, Moro Storm on the PS3 back in 2007. 
And again, graphically, it really lacks that current gen flavor. But strangely, I found myself kind of addicted to it. It grabbed my attention for a couple of hours straight. Besides the PC, Xbox One and PS4, off-road racing is also available for the Switch and it's probably in this last platform that this game makes sense. I mean, it's also quite enjoyable on the PC that is the version that I'm showing here, but it really feels like a game to play on the move if you know what I mean. So what does this game has to offer? As the name suggests, off-road vehicles are our main weapons and at our disposal there are a selection of buggies, ATVs and dirt bikes to take out for a spin. Single and multiplayer modes are also available and as well a ton of different tracks to discover besides the one you already know if you've played Motor Racer 4 back when it came out in 2016. What I found a bit awkward and not responding correctly when requested is the boost option when landing and when starting a race. Another downside is probably the most annoying one, that on an off-road game is quite absurd. I'm talking about the pointless slowdowns when leaving the main track. This is an off-road game after all, isn't it? But besides all that, it's quite fun and something to try if you're a fan of arcade off-road racing games. So guys, here you have it, a quick look into a couple of less known racing games that might be of interest to someone out there, cause tastes are just like opinions, everyone has their own. If you've enjoyed this episode, you know the drill, so thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video, cheers! Hey guys, welcome back to a not so retro review! And this time around, it's all about WRC 8. But I won't be going wild with numbers, benchmarks, and if the force feedback is transmitting the real feeling of driving a rally car. There are tons of expert reviews out there. I just wanna have fun! So, let's take a look! As a part-time content creator, I can't spend my very limited and precious free time looking out for the perfect setup, the perfect configuration for my wheel and panels. I don't have a top-of-the-line simulation rig or something even close to it. I own an old and basic Logitech Driving Force GT that many developers nowadays simply ignore. But not Kiloton! With that said, and along with Dirt Rally 2.0, 2019 was the year when KT Racing returned with their officially licensed WRC game, two years after their latest installment. A year ago, I was a bit worried. I absolutely loved WRC 7 and when I realized we wouldn't get the usual annual release, I started thinking that their agreement for the WRC license had come to an end. And on top of that, and to get things even worse, we got V-Rally 4 instead! Gladly, I was wrong, WRC 8 is here, but uh, is it any good? As we step into the game's menu, it really shows that Kiloton also took their time improving and upgrading it and it's indeed a huge step up from their first venture into the series with WRC 5. The handling model implemented is incredible, which translates extremely well to a gamepad, most importantly when it comes to weight and the all-changing levels of grip. I simply love how the car feels when crossing sections of the road filled with water, despite the splashing looking a bit weird sometimes, and sounds like someone firing a shotgun when driving inside the car. But the real challenge and immersion comes when you try it with a steering wheel, even if it's with my old Logitech. So prepare yourself for a real workout! I can feel the resistance of any given road surface build up as I throw the car sideways, maintaining the drift and finding the perfect balance through steering via the throttle. What an incredible feeling! Nailing a handbrake turn is extremely satisfying! It reminds me of the amazing Richard Burns rally from 2004. But that wouldn't be of any good if there weren't a ton of different locations and rallies to defy our skills. 
The official WRC calendar is here, with some well-known stages from previous installments, but now with tire wear and dynamic weather included in the mix. We start a stage with sunny conditions and reach the checkered flag under a windy and rainy storm. The all-new dynamic weather system simply turns every rally even more unpredictable. Better hire yourself a weatherman! And in relation to the tire wear, soft tires are typically faster over one single stage, but you'll feel the difference if there are two stages to race in a row, as the car reacts differently to the worn rubber. The entire 2019 season lineup is present, with cars, teams, classes, drivers and all 14 locations. Poland was dropped since WRC7, but we got two new ones, Turkey and Chile. A practice area is also available in this large open world section, which I found to be a pretty cool addition. And it's here where Kiloton shines and, in my honest opinion, steps miles away from Codemasters, the design of each and every stage. Every location feels different, with its own distinct feeling, really embracing us into a WRC environment. And let's not forget about the epic stages that were introduced in the previous installment. Remember when I mentioned that a weatherman was essential to have in your team? <laughs> I'm not joking! If you really want to be part and experience WRC in its fullest, you better start by choosing the career mode. It probably drank inspiration in Cody's F1 2019 game, released a few months back, in where we'll be signing contracts, hire a crew, maintain the manufacturers pleased with our performance and, between all that, be on top of the latest advances with a research and development lab and team of engineers. It has that football manager sort of feeling, as we read and answer to emails, pay bills, decide when the team should rest or if whether you want to try out for a manufacturer or do a bit of training. Keep in mind that allowing the team to rest between rallies will restore their stamina more quickly. In this mode we'll be following a racing calendar composed with the traditional rallies and also different other events, a cool addition to break the furious WRC action for just a bit. But if you want to simply jump into the action, the full season mode is for you. In here you'll take part of the main and full WRC season without the hassle of dealing with the team, of hiring staff and mess around with the research and development unit. WRC games have always been a sort of solo experience, so I never bother too much to mess around with the online features. It's good to know that online is present, but I'm just too old for that. I simply don't have the skills of driving fast enough without making mistakes. And right three into left five long, fifty. Six short, bail it into right five, tighten short, uphill. And left five over crest, tightens into right four, short. So let's focus on the important stuff, handling and physics. There are the obvious differences between classes, but also between manufacturers. If you're not used to rally simulators, WRC 8 can present a really steep learning curve, and surviving the epic stages can be extremely painful. But even so, it's totally worth it. When you master it, there's a satisfying feeling of confidence that will make you push more and more. I haven't felt so confident behind the steering wheel of a rally simulator in a long time. I can really feel that I'm in control. Incredible. And that's what WRC8 really begs for, to drive fast. 
On previous installments, there were times where the cool driver called airpin right or left just a bit too late and when the note was spoken, I was already off the track or going down a cliff. Until now, I haven't experienced that in WRC 8. And on top of that, and if you're used to these more serious racers, it feels great even with a gamepad. Again, the weather has a huge impact on the handling, mainly because of the aquaplaning. It's so damn unpredictable. Sometimes nothing happens and we just storm through the puddles with no issues at all. Don't quite know if it has something to do with the speed we go through them, but most of the times we'll see ourselves being thrown to the side and losing our momentum and even the control of the car. Also, the dynamic weather combined with the atmospheric lighting is very well done indeed. And it's where the sound design also comes to play. Engine noises and all other sound effects are a good step up from WRC7, despite having from time to time an unexpected and exaggerated boost in volume when driving with the outside camera and even losing communication with the co-driver for no reason whatsoever. Keep into left four. Right one and keep middle for left three. Very long over crest. Tighten. Since WRC6 that we had the same co-driver at our side, but this time around a new one was hired that really sings the notes softer and smoother than the previous one. A bit more of emotion and trembling on his voice would have added that little extra realism to the pace notes, but even so, it's a huge step up from all previous installments from Kiloton. What really needs more in-depth work besides the dumb spectators is the water. Sounds, car reactions when crossing the puddles and even the splashes have to be improved for next year's WRC installment. Take a look at this bit of gameplay from Colin McRae Dirt 2. This game was released 10 years ago and the water effects still look mind-blowing to this day. This is what WRC 8 is really missing in my opinion. Still, visually, WRC 8 looks good. It doesn't have to worry about being the most beautiful AAA racing title out there. It doesn't have the need to sell consoles. Let Forza and Gran Turismo worry about that. But the vastness of its locations, the unexplored feeling, the sense of being in the middle of nowhere, man, that's what really grabs me in games like this one and like Dakar 18. They can really deliver a truly realistic impression of the event we're at. No balloons and confetti in this one, just pure and raw racing material. So guys, hope you've enjoyed my honest review of WRC 8. And if you did, don't forget to smash that like button, to leave your comment with your own thoughts about it, to subscribe to the channel and to click on that bell icon so that you're notified when all my new videos become available. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers! Welcome back! When you talk about Yu Suzuki's work, everyone seems to only recall about Space Harrier, Afterburner, Outrun and the Angon series, but... Uh, what about Enduro Racer? Why doesn't Enduro Racer receive the same praise and respect? Let's take a look! I've always been a fan of off-road related stuff. So when I first saw Enduro Racer at the arcades, my eyes just popped and I was immediately in love. Sadly, the cabinet where I used to play it was the stand-up version and not the sit-down replica bike similar to Angon. Besides the clock, we have to race against other drivers and the treacherous terrain that was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen till 1986. When we reach the second level and besides enduro bikes, 
other vehicles will try to block our path. So from this point forward, the event is no longer an enduro race. It resembles a desert type of event, just like the Dakar. The same hardware from Angon and Space Area was used to create this far more exciting venture onto the off-road world of racing. Just like in Outrun released in that same year, the races were no longer lifeless and flat. Instead, undulating tracks packed with dangers offered tons of excitement and adrenaline. Huge banks of dirt filled the track from side to side, and while approaching these, the best maneuver would be to pull back the handlebars before impact, so that we could perform the perfect jump that would allow us to avoid all hazards hidden on the other side. This was the most important move to be victorious, and the continuous movement of pulling back the handlebars would turn every single one of us into a mighty wrestler. I even had to ask my friends to hold the cabinet steady, otherwise it would fall on me after a more violent maneuver. The arcade original was hard, it was indeed a very difficult game. The increasingly tight time limit, along with the faulty controls due to excessive pulling and harsh treatment, really prevented me to finish it. Gladly, it ended up ported a year later to a few 8-bit systems and by then I was a proud and lucky owner of a ZX Spectrum 128K plus 2A that was a system that I believe to have received the best home version of Enduro Racer. And that's probably why no one talks about this masterpiece by Yu Suzuki and his AM2 team. Sega's one and only home console effort for Enduro Racer was on the Master System also by 1987 and a truly bizarre attempt it was. This is a sort of paper boy on a motorcycle. What were they thinking? It's really hard to understand why they've changed the original arcade concept into this thing. Besides the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and the Sega Master System, Enduro Racer was also released for the Amstrad CPC that was basically a slow spectrum port and the Commodore 64, by far the worst conversion of them all. Another port of the ZX Spectrum version was made by 1988 for Thompson's 8-bit line of computers introduced in France during the 80s, but again, it was a failed attempt. It ran even slower than its CPC counterpart. Enduro Racer was really needing a 16-bit conversion of the arcade original that eventually arrived also during 1988, but only for the Atari ST. It was a solid attempt, from the same team that brought the ZX Spectrum version fast and featuring the same iconic tune by David Whittaker. Back to Yu Suzuki's original design, it was truly unforgiving. Players wouldn't really stand a chance. Right in the first stage, there were a ton of rocks after the many jumps and most of the ramps were positioned in bands, so it was common to overshoot the track as we couldn't change the direction of the bike whilst in mid-air. And the second stage was even worse, with tighter bands, desert four-wheelers and random obstacles. Then the third stage introduced water jumps. This was without any doubt meticulously engineered to take our money. But as told in issue 64 of Computer and Video Games magazine back in February of 87, it was totally worth it. The feeling of riding a bike is tremendous, it's totally different in gameplay to hang on. Activision immediately grabbed the rights for the home computer versions of Enduro Racer and they already knew who to call. Back in 1986, Giga Games approached Activision UK to show them their brand new racing game and ZX Spectrum exclusive Nightmare Rally. Oddly, Activision refused and it ended up being picked by Ocean Software. 
so when the time came to produce the ZX Spectrum and Atari ST conversions of Enduro Racer, Activision handed the job over to Giga Games, whose previous work with Nightmare Rally showed to be extremely important for their next venture. For that, all they had as reference was a VHS tape of someone playing the arcade original, and as stated by Alan Laird in an interview a few years back, I don't think I ever saw an Enduro Racer machine in real life. As told previously, the C64 port by Electric Dream Software was the worst of the bunch, receiving just 16% in issue 27 of Zap64 magazine. Electric Dreams wasn't pleased, so instead of just forgetting about it, there were reports about a new announced version of the game being developed and scheduled to be released on disc format only. That version never came out, but an unfinished game was mistakenly bundled with the Big Box 30 compilation by Bo Jolly. It seems that someone just made copies of the wrong master disc. As for the one and only console version of Enduro Racer, it was quite odd that Sega themselves opted not to adapt the arcade original. Instead, they created from scratch a nice symmetric racer, offering a completely distinct experience. But that wasn't the end of it. If you're a diehard fan of the Master System, the Japanese version of Enduro Racer for Sega's own Mark III console is the one that you should play, simply because it features a complete game with all 10 levels. For the Master System version, they opted for a smaller card, which meant that 5 levels and other graphical details needed to be removed due to lack of space. Again, what were they thinking? Unlike all other Yu Suzuki creations, Enduro Racer is a totally forgotten title, with only the Master System version making an appearance on Wii's Virtual Console back in 2008. Sadly, never got a sequel also, but its spirit lived on in the arcade-exclusive Stadium Cross from 1992 brought by Sega AM1. So guys, this was my experience and historical facts around this Yu Suzuki creation that practically no one seems to care about. Maybe if it was included in Shenmue, its impact on gamers would have been slightly different. I recall organizing during summer vacations some ZX Spectrum championships and inviting a bunch of friends to participate, and Enduro Racer was one of those that would always be present. I really miss those days, people would sit around the good old Specky waiting for their turn to play. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of It's a Pixel Thing, so if you did, don't forget to smash that like button, to leave a comment with your own memories, to subscribe to the channel and to click on that bell icon so that you're notified when all my future videos become available. Thank you very much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video! Cheers! Guys, welcome back! So, are you interested in knowing what driving games really left a huge mark on my gaming life? Let's take a look! Another game that I already brought to the channel uh, was Rally Trophy. What an amazing game! A kind of... Uh, uh, with an hilarious twist, you know? And uh, this, this game, uh, Rally Trophy, was uh, the very first racing game, the very first game from Bugbear. Yeah, Bugbear, does it... Uh, uh, it sounds familiar to you, yeah? It, it may sound familiar to you because of the flat-out franchise and the recent Wreckfest that is already available on the PC and will come to consoles uh, somewhere in 2019. So talking about Bugbear and the flat-out series, 
here's flat out one two and flat out ultimate carnage games that i pre-ordered um so that i could play them on the day of release and these are still my original copies that i bought back when they were released amazing series i absolutely love this series and i've already reviewed the very first flat out I have to yeah make something related to the other flat out games amazing series now you know that the dakar <laughs> is a, a really huge name for me so acclaim brought us in early 2000s paris dakar rally and dakar 2 this is a really painful game a really difficult game it's it's kind of an awful game <laughs> But it's a Paris Dakar game that uh, not many developers have the guts to try and replicate this huge race. We have now Dakar 18. That is, I'm truly enjoying Dakar 18, but I'm aware that it still has problems, and the driving mechanics and the feeling is not there. But um, the experience of uh, participating on a real Dakar event man that experience is in that game so in 2004 yeah to compete with uh, Colin McRae the Colin McRae franchise that had always that uh, little bit of arcade-ish uh, feeling uh, in 2004 came Richard Burns Rally from Warthog and SCI games that is still the most faithful experience in what a rally is concerned. Man, the physics of driving a rally car in a Richard Burns rally is, is something outstanding and out of this world. Man, you have to experience it for yourselves with a steering wheel. Okay? Do me that favor. Yeah. Another series uh, that I've played since uh, the very first title back in the DOS era was the Need for Speed uh, uh, Need for Speed franchise series. So Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2 is one of my favorites from the Need for Speed franchise along with uh, the Underground series. Need for Speed Underground 1 and Underground 2 are amazing games. So these three are my favorites from the Need for Speed uh, series franchise. So and when talking about the Need for Speed series uh, franchise, we have to keep in mind that there were titles slightly outside of that comfort zone. You know? So, Need for Speed Shift and Shift 2 are incredible games, phenomenal games, and these, these were made by Slightly Mad Studios, that if you know, if you recall, this, this company, Slightly Mad, is responsible for the Project Cars games, you know? Yeah, and these two are the forefathers of uh, Project Cars. The amazing project cars that I only have on digital format. Also my favorites, one and two. So when going back to Motocross games and to Rainbow Studios and to Motocross Madness, their first venture onto the onto the console business, yeah, was with ATV Off-Road Fury. This is the first one, and I have also the second one. I've shown these these games in one of my uh, PlayStation 2 exclusives uh, video that I made recently ATV Off-Road Fury 3 there, there's also a fourth title in this series but I don't have that one um, but this, this, this series, this ATV series really left a, a huge mark uh, back in the early days of the PlayStation 2 and after the ATV franchise, um, they started making motocross games for the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox also, yeah, and the Xbox also. So MX Unleashed is an amazing game and I believe that it's 
kind of hard to find this game nowadays uh, and this is still my original copy that I bought uh, but yeah in 2004 and to be honest MX Unleashed was the game that made me buy my PlayStation 2 then its sequel MX vs ATV Unleashed that I've uh, already brought to the channel was one of, one of my recent, one of my first videos on the channel. MX vs ATV Unleashed had also was first released for the PlayStation 2 that I already have in my collection. And later came this PC version that included uh, a new track editor in where we could also make our own tracks just like in Motocross Madness, you know? And um, this is a, a, a North American release that I bought when the game was, uh, was out. It was out first on the United States and I pre-ordered from the United States my version because uh, the, the, the version available in Europe is not in this kind of uh, medium box. But Rainbow Studios would also venture themselves into the jet ski business, <laughs> you know? And Splashdown is one of those titles that really left a huge mark in my early days as a PS2 owner. Oh yeah, an amazing, amazing game. I prefer this one to the second one. And another game that is uh, a different kind of racer. Uh, but it's a, a, an exclusive game on the PlayStation 2 and it's uh, my favorite game on the PlayStation 2 one of one of my favorite games ever made is Downhill Domination yeah mountain bike stuff you know that I love mountain biking so Downhill Domination is a freaking amazing game it, it's really hard to find also this game at least here in Portugal and um, man, this this is a freaking amazing game. I made a playthrough of this game in the early days of my channel. I absolutely love it. It's from a. It was made by yeah, Incognito Entertainment. I've already talked about the Midtown Madness uh, series, but the third one is the one that really means something to me because it it came bundled with my very own, my very first uh, Xbox, original Xbox. Oh yeah, an amazing game. I absolutely love this game. Also, another couple of games on the Xbox, the original Xbox, that really, yeah, means something to me. Is the Midnight Club series, the second and the third one. I played also the first, and I have it uh, on my collection, but the, the second one, the second one was the one that really grabbed me and the third, yeah, it's also an amazing game. And when talking about that generation of consoles, the PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox, we have to bring this up in conversations, you know? OutRun 2 and OutRun 2006 Coast to Coast are the pinnacle of the OutRun series. Man, these two are must-haves in everyone that enjoys a good racer should own these games okay amazing yeah going back just a bit in early 2000s insane came out from uh, invictus that was uh, yeah grabbed by cold masters yeah. <laughs> and um, around 2005 cross racing championship 2005 was also available and also from Invictus games the same guys that made insane and it's an amazing uh, uh, rally cross game I really enjoyed it I have so many awesome memories of playing this game back in the Windows XP days I have to try it on my Windows XP rig the Xpand, do you recall the Xpand rally uh, series from Techland, yeah, Expand Rally Extreme. It's an amazing game. It was uh, groundbreaking with incredible graphics for the time. And sadly, this this uh, wasn't that successful. I don't know why. It's an amazing game. So again, on the PlayStation 2 era, 
We can't uh, forget about the Burnout series. Yeah, Burnout, Burnout 2 and Burnout Revenge were incredible games. I have also Burnout Dominator, an incredible series from Criterion that, uh, yeah, it's kind of uh, dead nowadays. Another rally series on the original Xbox was obviously Rally Sport Challenge 1 and 2. Um, the first one was also available on PC. The second one is, is really an exclusive game and is the best. It's the best game on the series. And um, while the first one uh, is also playable on the 360, the second one is not. Microsoft, what the hell, man? This is way better than the first one, and this was, and this should be also playable on the 360 and on the Xbox One. And when talking about racing games on the original Xbox, we must not forget about Project Gotham Racing 1 and 2. And obviously, it evolved to the 360 with the PGR 3 and 4. An amazing series. Ah, man. These were the days, man. <laughs> so, the PlayStation 2 had their uh, official WRC games and exclusive games. So, WRC 1, WRC 2 Extreme, WRC 3, WRC 4, and WRC Rally Evolved. These were, this was a series from Evolution Studios that later brought us the Motorstorm franchise. And uh, also on the PlayStation 4 Drive Club. And then Sony decided to close them down. Yeah. And apart from the Colin McRae series, there was also from Codemasters, there was also the Toka Race Driver franchise. Toka Race Driver 2 and 3 on the PC. My uh, the, the versions, these are still my original copies, the ones that I pre ordered. Uh, man. So many hours playing these these two games. Amazing franchise. Again, talking about the PlayStation 2, we must not forget about Gran Turismo 4, the the Gran Turismo that really meant something to me. What a game, man! And then later, <laughs> Tourist Trophy, the Gran Turismo on two wheels. What a game! Incredible stuff. Also, we must not forget that Simbin was in uh, mid 2000s the the greatest uh, company when it comes to driving simulations on PC. GT Legends, what an amazing game! GTR 2, incredible game! Race 07, I played a ton of this game. I participated in online championships with this game. Man, incredible, this is an expansion to Race 07, Race On and uh, the, the, the 360 and also an exclusive of its own from Simbin. Race Pro, another game that no one talks about and um, it's also uh, kind of difficult to come across this game in the wild and was an amazing racer. It's obvious that the Colin McRae series was indeed a mark in video game history. So, yeah, I have one, two, three, four, and 2005. This is my favorite. Obviously, it's the last one. It's an amazing game with incredibly detailed graphics and effects man amazing game the first one was truly groundbreaking and i have also played it and owned this this game on the playstation one uh, man so many awesome memories and uh, i still play these games nowadays amazing franchise so as you know the colin mcrae series evolved to dirt so yeah, Dirt, Dirt 2 is still my favorite game on the franchise, on the whole franchise, Dirt 2 is amazing. The water effects, man, incredible stuff. Dirt 3, 
Dirt Rally, oh, War Game Man, and uh, Dirt 4. It was kind of a letdown, but it's all, also an enjoyable game. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome back! The Italian developer that we know today as Milestone has been around since 1994, since the release of Super Loops for the Super Nintendo. It was founded by Antonio Farina and then known as Graffiti, releasing their second game a year later. Iron Assault was an MS-DOS exclusive and in that same year came, also for DOS, the groundbreaking Screamer. This was when console and arcade enthusiasts started to look differently at PCs, cause these beasts were starting to show all their potential. So, let's take a look. 1995 was the year when the iconic Need for Speed franchise took off on PCs along with Destruction Derby, but there was this small intruder trying to survive between those two big sharks. Racing games were evolving too rapidly, from the sprites of OutRun and the primitive 3D graphics of r Driven to incredibly fast texture mapped 3D graphics of Virtual Racing, Ridge Racer and Daytona USA. And while everyone was waiting for those games to be ported to the brand new generation of consoles, the Sega Saturn and the Sony PlayStation, Screamer arose from this still obscure and unknown Italian developer by the name Graffiti, leaving speechless all those console players. Graffiti built in house their own full 3D engine and after showing a sci-fi themed demo to Virgin Interactive, they were blown away and immediately wanted for Graffiti to use that impressive engine not on a sci-fi game, but on a racing game. This was in a time when affordable 3D accelerated graphics cards were practically non-existent, so Graffiti's game engine needed to be rendered entirely by software. This was a problem for all those that didn't possess a beefy machine, equipped with the latest high-end processors like the recently released Pentium by the almighty Intel. But if you happen to be one of those lucky gamers, you would experience a racing game like no other, something never seen on any console or PC till that time. By the way, and talking about that, before the release of Screamer, my most played racing games on the PC were Network Q Rack Rally, published by Europress, and IndyCar Racing from Papyrus, both released a couple of years prior. But Screamer took me to a whole new level of immersion and engagement, with living and breathing 3D graphics and fully textured map tracks with tunnels, bridges, canyons and airplanes crossing the skies above our heads. It was just like if the arcade in town had moved inside my own house. Bear in mind that this came from a really small developer and in a time without internet or any type of connection to other developers to share experiences and know-how, and as said, rendering through hardware wasn't a thing yet. Screamer's 3D software renderer would allow some impressive next-gen effects, clouds, buildings and other objects being reflected on the cars, and night versions of each track with neon lighting are just a small example of that. Six tracks and seven non-licensed vehicles are available. Six of these vehicles are obviously inspired on real-life supercars like the Ferrari F40, the Lamborghini Diablo, the Mitsubishi GTO, the Porsche 911 Turbo, the Corvette C4 and the Bugatti EB110 and the over-the-top crashes and drifting would automatically tell us that we were facing a high-octane ultra-fast arcade racer in the likes of Daytona USA and Ridge Racer, breaking that more serious feel 
and look of the personal computer that was seen as something exclusively crafted for boring stuff and not to play games with fast 3D graphics. After choosing one car and the type of transmission, automatic or manual, we could tackle the Championship League, the Slalom mode, the Attack mode or a sort of minigame called Cone Carnage in where we would knock down as many traffic cones as possible. These modes were only available in this very first Screamer and they were a request from the publisher Virgin Interactive. Obviously that a game of this nature would also feature an incredible sound engine and an over-the-top commentator. What's wrong? Too much pressure? Yeehaw! What a great corner! Last down! Hey! It's a new lap record! Also, and as a fun fact, the game's soundtrack was composed by the amazing Alistair Brimble, known by then for providing amazing music and sound effects for a ton of games for the Commodore Amiga like Super Frog, Alien Breed and Project X. Number one! Just what I wanna see! You might think that Screamer was in direct confrontation with the need for speed in what PC gaming is concerned. But Graffiti wasn't even aware that Electronic Arts was releasing a PC version of their latest racing game. These were the days without internet, folks! Released a few months after the Need for Speed, it was immediately praised by the press for offering what EA's game couldn't obviously match due to its more sim-oriented nature, a fast-paced and colorful arcade racing experience. In the meanwhile, this piece of advertising was being published in magazines around Christmas, but ended up generating a bit of controversy and hate. Graffiti started working on a sequel right after the release of the original Screamer. It would offer a lot more vehicles and went for a more rally-oriented style of gameplay, two-player split-screen mode and multiplayer over network for four players simultaneously was also added along with support for 3D hardware in the form of a patch that was later made available by the developer. By this time, Graffiti also changed its name to Milestone. Released in late 1996, it received praise for its soundtrack, gameplay and graphical quality, but it would need at least a Pentium 166 to get the most out of it. The AI was also improved, with other cars occasionally making mistakes, offering an advanced physics simulation model that could be fun to drive. Every car had its own specific handling, something quite hard to implement due to hardware limitations. But the 12 people behind its development, yes 12, were resilient and extremely focused on their work that everything was possible to achieve. Screamer Rally came a few months after Screamer 2 and it's probably the one that players most fondly recall. This third title from the trilogy was seen internally as a sort of data disc for Screamer 2 with a new interface, new tracks and new cars because it used practically the same game code. As the name suggests, it revolves around rally racing and really making use of 3D FX voodoo graphics, something that was gaining enthusiasts all over the world really quickly and I was one of them. To this day, Milestone continues to create incredible racing games based on a bunch of different disciplines and I'm always waiting for their latest release, cause as said, I'm a true fan of their work since they released the very first and groundbreaking Screamer.
So guys, have you played Screamer back in the day or any other from the trilogy? Many still think that Screamer 4x4 is part of the series, but that one was developed by another team that used the name Screamer just to grab extra attention from the public. I've already reviewed it some time ago, so feel free to check it out. Also, and if you've enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe and click on that bell icon so that you're notified when my next video becomes available. And if you're feeling generous, you can become a member right here on YouTube or through Patreon. Your support will be extremely appreciated. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! So, are you interested in knowing what driving games really left a huge mark on my gaming life? Let's take a look! Now, when related to PC gaming, man, I was a, a huge fan of uh, Papyrus games and the NASCAR racing was one, one of those that I used to play a ton. I truly hate nowadays, I really hate or I don't enjoy much playing on uh, oval circuits it's boring as hell but back then we only had these games from papyrus true sims from papyrus nascar racing and also indycar racing one and two this is the second one i don't have the first one um but i used to play also a ton of the indycar series from also from Papyrus, man, another uh, game on uh, oval circuits that I absolutely loved because of the feeling, a real feeling of uh, driving a, a racing, an indie car uh, vehicle, you know. This was true groundbreaking and uh, the most faithful simulators that we had back in these days, man. Amazing stuff. And also from Papyrus, another one that really left a huge mark was Grand Prix Legends. And this was totally, this was and is totally incredible, an incredible game. Driving simulated one of the most, most faithful and difficult driving games ever made. Man, what a game. Another racing game. A funny racing game, I, I would laugh so hard that I would end up losing all the races, you know? Big Red Racing, I don't know if you've played this one, this, this is a DOS exclusive, a PC, PC exclusive game, yeah. Released back in 95, on DOS, exclusively on DOS, it was, it was all also planned to be released, uh, I believe, on the Saturn and on the Jaguar, I guess, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Man, this is so hilarious. This game is freaking hilarious. And as I said, I would even end up losing all the races when playing this <laughs> freaking amazing, hilarious game. <laughs> now, in late 90s, there were a couple of motocross games. Uh, if you recall, exclusive games for the PC uh, from the Madness series uh, that included the Motocross games and the Midtown games. If you recall, Motocross Madness, the Motocross Madness series and the Midtown Madness series, these were, man, so addictive, these games. These were uh, the games that I used to play, the first games that I used to play online along with Revolt. Yeah, Revolt was another game, one of my first games that I've played online with my friends. Uh, but Motocross Madness, the Motocross Madness series is one of my favorite motocross games ever. Man, we 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 had a chance to create our own tracks. This this one, the, the second one, would include... I don't know if... Uh, no, there was a, a track editor I don't know if it was included in-game, I don't rec recall, but we had that tool to create our own tracks and share it, and share those with the world. And there's a ton of uh, uh, Motocross Madness uh, tracks online to be downloaded and uh, ready to be played, man. Amazing creations! 
And also, Midtown Madness, I used to play um, a bit of the Midtown Madness uh, series. There was uh, also the Monster Truck Madness series, also published by Microsoft, that I used to play also, but I don't, I don't have a physical release of the Monster Truck Madness series. As I said, Revolt was another huge deal for me back in the day and one of the first games that I've played online on the PC, oh yeah! And the Dreamcast version is also an amazing game, one of my favorites, but I don't own a physical copy of, the, of Revolt for the Dreamcast. Now another series that I... man, I played a ton and love to this day is the Network Q Rack Rally series and these are probably the best uh, three, the not three games this includes, yeah, Network Q Rack Rally Network Q Rack Rally Championship the International Rally Championship and, and the X Miles add-on for the Network Q Rack Rally Championship Man, these these were so damn enjoyable. These games from magnetic magnetic fields. I've always been a huge fan of rally games, so I simply had to have these games from the Network Iraq Rally franchise. Yeah, another series of racing games back from mid '90s was. The Screamer franchise from Milestone, from the Italian developer Milestone, that is still around nowadays, making uh, MXGP games and uh, another uh, motorcycle games, amazing games, Supercross games. Um, was uh, well the Screamer franchise. This one, this is the injection pack that includes the very first Screamer, uh, an upgrade to Screamer 2. And the Screamer Rally, the third game from the Screamer series. Yeah, I have also the big box of uh, Screamer 2, an amazing game. Screamer Rally is my favorite. And later came that I just brought to the channel recently. Uh, I made the review of this one, Screamer 4x4. That wasn't made, that wasn't developed by the same uh, developer. Yeah, it wasn't developed by Milestone. This came from uh, uh, Clever's, yeah, Clever's development. This is a really slow-paced racer, but is man, it's a, a freaking awesome uh, 4x4 simulation game. Yeah, check my review of uh, Screamer 4x4, an amazing game. Another series that I truly loved back in the day. I, I kind of. Um, disliked the first game but um, V Rally 2 and V Rally 3 are awesome games amazing games indeed and um, the latest installment um, that was brought by the makers of the WRC franchise the, or the recent WRC franchise Kiloton Games brought revived uh, V Rally 4 that was a complete waste of time. Yeah, again, they they should have focused their efforts on making WRC 8 and not V Rally 4. Yeah. Another series that started uh, in early 90s was the Grand Prix series from Geoff Cremant. You recall? Do you recall this series of uh, racing of Formula One racing games? I don't have the first and the second one uh, that I used to play a ton on my IBM PS1 but I have Grand Prix 3 there was a gift from Pedro Geronim thank you again Grand Prix 3 that is still sealed and Grand Prix 4 these were man the, the best F1 games ever made and at least this 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 last one is still Highly playable nowadays. Amazing games by Geoff Cramond, a, a legend on simulation games, uh, on simulation, on F1 simulation games.
guys, welcome back to another not so retro review. This time around, it's all about the next car game, now known as Wreckfest, a game that I've been playing since it was released as early access on Steam practically 5 years ago. So I guess that I'm more than qualified to say a couple of things about it, don't you think? So let's take a look. I've been a huge fan of Bugbear since the early days, since they released Rally Trophy back in 2001, and obviously that I was really eager to play its follow-up, the incredible Flat Out, released three years later. A few sequels followed Flat Out 2 and Flat Out Ultimate Carnage, this last one a simple upgrade, or remaster if you will, of Flat Out 2, not only for the PC, but also for the PlayStation Portable and the Xbox 360. That's right, the PlayStation 3 never got a Flat Out game, cause as you know, the system arrived a bit late to be eligible to enter the game. Now, over 10 years later, a sort of flat-out spiritual successor is arriving to the PlayStation 4. I guess. At least, Bugbear is planning to release Wreckfest somewhere during 2019 on the current-gen consoles, the Xbox One and the PS4. It's been delayed a couple of times and as told by the publisher THQ Nordic, Wreckfest for consoles will only be released as soon as we love playing it. Yeah. If they want it to be as good as the PC version, we'll probably have to wait till the PlayStation 5 arrives. As said, I've been playing Wreckfest since it was made available as an early access on Steam back in 2014 and then known as the next car game. Finally, by June of 2018, the final version was released to the public and showing all its glory. But the early days of development were a kind of a roller coaster for Bugbear. They tried to fund the development of the game through a Kickstarter campaign launched by November of 2013, with an initial goal of $350,000 to complete the PC version and with a stretch goal of $1.5 million for the console ports for the PS4 and the Xbox One. It was a failed attempt. The campaign only raised near $82,000, way off of what they were aiming for. But gladly, that didn't stop Bugbear from believing in their work, so they focused their efforts on a pre-order campaign through their own website, in where they would host a downloadable sneak peek to all those who pre-ordered the game. It was a tremendous success, what triggered a brand new early access version with two playable vehicles and three tracks. This early access was even more successful, grabbing also attention from sim racers. In a matter of days, the next car game sold more than the initial funding goal of $350,000 on Kickstarter, which led to a huge and tremendously successful green light on Steam's early access platform, achieving over $1 million in sales in one single week. By October of 2014, Bugbear announced the official and final title for their next car game, Wreckfest. They also announced their incredible online multiplayer mode that is really something to behold, allowing 24 players simultaneously. Can you imagine all the mayhem and chaos? So expect epic and over-the-top crashes and tight and furious fights over the finish line on all sorts of rundown racing tracks from the more traditional circuits to ferocious demolition derbies. As we launch the game, we enter a quite peaceful and organized menu with tons of options to choose to set Wreckfest just the way we want. We can immediately start racing or simply browse in the garage to have a glimpse of what sort of wheels we'll be facing against and the ones that suits our preferences better to tackle the career mode with confidence. Obviously that the career mode starts slow with lawn mowers, yeah that's right, freaking lawn mowers, but soon enough we'll get to drive these huge harvesters or even school buses. Just like in Flat Out, these vehicles are old, all rusty, cheap looking and banged up, something that you won't find in any other racing game out there. 
Besides those weird and totally inadequate vehicles mentioned earlier, there are the mighty American muscle cars and little Asian and European hatchbacks, all from decades ago. So working and upgrading them at the garage is as important as racing. And talking about racing, Bugbear's Rumu engine shows all its potential right at the start of the race, with all cars fighting for position and reacting to damage in a very brutal and convincible way, allowing this overwhelming fist to the eyes of the incredible deformable soft body car damage model implemented, something that should give Bugbear the highest award for technical achievement in this particular area. Maybe if it was a PlayStation or Xbox exclusive, it would have won best racing game of the decade. But yeah, it's still a PC exclusive. The career mode is made up of five different championships, each consisting of several and diverse events like demolition derbies and racing in normal and figure eight tracks. Each event will gradually be unlocked as we gain XP, increasing in the process our driver level. Besides XP, performance parts will also be given from time to time, along with credits to buy new cars or upgrade the ones we already own. I have to say that my favorite events are the plain and simple race to the finish, in where we have to complete a series of laps around the circuit, dodging the opposition, avoiding crashes and serving as punching bag for all other drivers on track. And as said, the starts are always so chaotic, as all racers charge for position, in where the also amazing sound engine shows all its awesomeness, with impactful and bone-crunching sounds, that you'll quickly forget about the soundtrack playing in the background. It's also amazingly spectacular to watch in the distance, cars flying off the course through wooden fences and tire barriers, sending all sorts of things flying into the air and across the road. Stuff that will remain scattered all over the place during the course of the race, just like other cars that couldn't simply keep up with all the mayhem and destruction. Besides circuit racing and destruction arenas, where for instance the lawnmower derbies take place, there's the aforementioned demolition derbies, in where we try to wreck the opponents and stay alive as long as possible on oval and figure eight tracks. These are incredibly brutal and fun, trying to avoid all that mess with the one and only goal of trying to finish in first place. There are two settings for damage in Wreckfest, normal and realistic. On normal, everything becomes more forgiving and fun, allowing major crashes with a minimum of penalties. As for the realistic mode, well, you're already guessing what's coming. Your survival instincts must come first. A bad landing of a jump is synonymous of a broken suspension and a more violent crash will jeopardize what's left of the race or immediate withdrawal. Either way, there's no rewind function to save us from a bad move, so think twice before you try a certain stunt. And if that wasn't enough, the game offers an extensive modding support for the creation and modification of cars, tracks, physics and more. These are just a small and great example of the awesome content being made for Rackfest. A game like this would obviously support a bunch of wheels, pedals and H shifters. I've tried it with my good old Logitech Driving Force GT and I wasn't disappointed. Wreckfest transmits a freaking awesome feedback to the wheel and the immersion is even higher, cause each type of car feels different to drive. Even with a gamepad, 
It shows off some incredible driving physics with top-notch transitions between different road surfaces where you'll be fighting to keep drifting all the way out of a corner with tires screaming for grip on tarmac and lifting dirt on dusty sections, blinding momentaneously the opponents. A perfect move when joining the online multiplayer. And talking about multiplayer, it's so awesome to go flat out with another human racer by our side and on the inside. And when closing into the next corner, we break early to just watch that opponent overshoot the turn applessly. <laughs> we knew that he was counting on using our right side as his brake, but we were smarter, cause this isn't at all a gentleman type of race. What else can I say to convince you on grabbing Rackfest? Even if you only play video games on consoles, grab it as soon as it becomes available for your PS4 or Xbox One. Again, it will be released somewhere during 2019. And it would be freaking awesome if it would allow crossplay between platforms. Rackfest is a beautiful game, paired with an incredible driving feeling and the most amazing damage system currently available that can satisfy even the most skeptic and strange gamers out there, because it delivers the most frenetic and fun racing experience that everyone can and should try. So guys, are you willing to give Rackfest a chance? Do you already own the game on PC? Tell me everything down in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe and click on that bell icon so that you're notified when all my future content becomes available. Also, if you want to support the channel but don't quite know how Patreon works, you can join as a member right here on YouTube and you'll get early access to all my new videos. Either way, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in my next video. Cheers! Hey guys, welcome back! So, are you interested on in knowing what driving games really left a huge mark on my gaming life? Let's take a look! So as I've said so many times before, I started with the ZX Spectrum and uh, the very first game I played on that system was Death Chase or 3D Death Chase. That is not a traditional racer as you know. But this left a really huge mark in my gaming life. It, uh, it transformed me into a hardcore gamer, you know, back in 83 or 84, around that period of time. And obviously the arcades were a huge deal for me also, where I used to play a ton of racing games. So another game, probably the second game or the third game I bought for my ZX Spectrum was Checkered Flag, this F1 racer, man, so, so, so simplistic, but it, it was so damn enjoyable back in 84, around also more or less that period of time. And obviously, as you know, I'm a huge fan of the Dakar, so Paris Dakar from the Spanish developer Made in Spain and published by Ziggurat was so mind-blowing and uh, groundbreaking in where we, we already had a roadbook uh, that we needed to follow the instructions on that roadbook uh, so that we could find our way from point A to point B. Man, Paris Dakar was really different from everything else. So 
back in the ZX Spectrum days, I was a huge fan of the Moto GP scene, so man, I played a ton, the cycles that I also played on the PC, uh, on DOS, the cycles, Aspar GP Master, a Spanish game, and also another Spanish game, Angel Nieto Pole 500, these were my biggest addictions uh, within that genre of, uh, of racing with uh, motorcycles. So many times spent playing these three games. And obviously that outer run was a huge deal for me on, on the arcades, on the ZX Spectrum, on the Amiga. I absolutely love this franchise. Another two games on the ZX Spectrum that I played a ton, uh, games with cars, you know, was Test Drive 2, the Duel, played a ton this game, this was the closest that I could get to a real driving uh, <laughs> game, you know, a real feel of driving on a, a road, I, I was completely addicted to this game, I don't know why. Welcome back to a not so retro review and this time around it's all about Dakar 18 a game that I was waiting since forever but uh, was I disappointed with it? Let's take a look! Big Moon Entertainment is a small and young Portuguese developer with a bold mission to bring the Dakar experience to fans and enthusiasts that always wanted to tackle such a challenge and extreme adventure on the comfort of their homes. In the past, a very restricted group of video game developers had the guts to try and replicate the feeling and emotion of such an endurance race. We have to travel all the way back to 1988 to find a game that really captured that sense of freedom, of choice and of strategy. That game was Paris Dakar from the Spanish developer Made in Spain. In that one we had a simplified roadbook that would tell us how many kilometers we should drive north, then how many we should drive east and so forth. Believe me, it was a huge challenge and on an 8-bit home computer. 
30 years have passed and in the meanwhile the event switched from European and African landscapes to South America. It was no longer safe for contestants to cross certain African countries. Their lives were at risk. The last three events would have their initial start here in Portugal. And as a huge fan of the event, practically since birth, I simply had to follow the race as close as I could. Sadly, the 2008 edition and last one starting from Lisbon was cancelled due to threats of a terrorist attack on whoever crossed the Mauritanian border. Let me remind you that this is an event that needs to be planned almost a year in advance and practically half of this particular one would take place in Mauritania. With that said, ASO, the organization responsible for the Dakar, crossed the Atlantic and landed on Argentina the next year and it stayed on South American soil since then. As said before, Dakar-related games came and went, but those were traditional racers just like all others and competition is ferocious in that particular genre. Finally, in 2018, we have the chance to try a new Dakar game, but this time around, extremely focused on navigation and orientation using the most important item on such a race, the roadbook. This is what this game is about, a true sim in what orientation and navigation is concerned. These were based on the real roadbooks used on the 2018 Dakar event that took place back in January and the waypoints are exactly where they were supposed to be that even Alex Aro, Nani Roma's co-driver recognized. Nowadays the Dakar is open to five distinct categories – cars, trucks, bikes, quads and SXS and Big Moon tried really hard to implement those in the game. Bikes and quads have strange behaviors, but at least they don't have a navigator by their side yelling at them. These vehicles respond weirdly to the controls and I can't get no fun and enjoyment out of them. As for the four-wheelers, trucks and the 4x4 cars are the ones that really bring a smile to my face, even not having the physics models that all fans like me were hoping for. Maybe on Dakar 19. So putting the physics aside, what have we got left? The vastness of the desert, the huge dunes, miles and miles of open landscape to drive and to get lost, and our co-driver yelling and most importantly telling us where to go so that we can focus on driving and on reading these treacherous terrain filled with traps and hazards. If you want to simply go flat out across the dunes following a predetermined track or path, well, you've come to the wrong place. There's tons of options out there, but if you're willing to try something new, something unique, Dakar 18 is definitely for you. Dakar 18 is all about cross-country rally racing, with long stages of up to one hour non-stop. If you're an experienced driver and somehow slightly familiar with orientation and navigation, obviously that there are tutorials and a rookie mode to help you get familiar with this game. For the hardcore racer and fan of the real Dakar event, competitor and legend modes are the way to go. Dakar 18 offers a play area of over 18,000 square kilometers divided across the 14 official stages of the real Dakar Rally 2018 detailing not only the expected course for each stage but also a huge area for us to explore and to get lost covering Peru, Bolivia and Argentina. There's even a treasure hunt mode that will allow us to find, well, treasures. And while doing it, we'll come across incredible and mystical places such as the Nazca Lines in Peru. Picking a category may be the most difficult choice you'll ever make in this game, so choose wisely and start by a vehicle that you find more suitable for your own personal driving skills. All of them are licensed from the real manufacturers and teams and for instance, the big trucks are really fun to drive but a bit slow, whilst within the car category there are the rear wheel drive buggies from Mini and Peugeot that can really be challenging to drive, sliding all over the place. Again, choose wisely or you'll probably give it all up in the first couple of miles. Even so, the more resilient players out there that are really looking for a true challenge should pick a bike or quad in where, as told, there's no navigator by your side, 
so you'll have to drive, read the roadbook, make the necessary adjustments to the distance traveled to match the ones on the roadbook, etc, etc. By the way, and in the meanwhile, the two wheel bikes were completely reworked and after the last released patch, riding these is slightly improved. Again, driving in general is not as enjoyable as it should be, even with a steering wheel and pedals, but the real test lies on navigation and orientation. Taking your vehicle into the unknown, having the real sense of being lost somewhere in the desert and having to find your way back to the right path is a freaking amazing challenge. Surely that it would have been even more incredible if the driving mechanics and feeling were there. But we have to keep in mind that this is the very first racing game entirely developed from scratch, coming from Big Moon Entertainment. There are so many cool features included in Dakar 18, like being able to help other drivers that are stuck in the mud or on the top of a dune, use shovels to dig our way out or apply recovery boards if there's no one around to help us. Also, after freeing our fellow drivers, they can run you over, so just stay out of their line of sight. Also, the online multiplayer is really engaging and fun, but it's quite difficult to find someone to play with. There's also other multiplayer options like the traditional split-screen mode and even two-screen modes, so that each can have their own screen. This last mode is truly enjoyable and extremely fun that brings that good old spirit of couch play, something totally forgotten nowadays. After the day one patch, there was a ton of issues still to be corrected. These issues are now addressed, but there's others popping out as more players start playing the game, like cars disappearing in thin air or trucks appearing from nowhere on top of others. Uh, this is weird. In the meanwhile, 8 patches have already rolled out for the PC version, improving and fixing tons of issues that players are reporting on a daily basis. And what's also awesome about Big Moon is that they're actually listening to all our feedback. So after being playing Dakar 18 since day 1 and experienced all bugs and tried all patches, I can conclude that, as for car physics and handling, we're stuck with what we have right now. As for the experience and feeling of being part of the greatest off-road event on earth, it's all there and being able to finish every single stage is already a victory. As I said in one of my other Dakar 18 related videos, Dakar 18 is a game to be tried by everyone cause it's different from everything else. We can't just floor our way through, we'll need to drive with our head, take extreme care of our vehicle, listen to the co-driver, follow the roadbook and drive our way around obstacles. As simple as that! Dakar 18 isn't for everybody. Don't expect to find a racing game similar to Forza Horizon, Dirt, Baja, WRC or V-Rally. It's a totally new breed of rally raid racing with a different concept that we can't simply compare to other racers out there. Even so, I invite you to try it out for yourselves, cause Dakar 18 will certainly produce completely different and contrasting feelings to everyone that has the guts to tackle such a challenge. So guys, this was my complete and honest review of Dakar 18 after being playing around with it for a full month. As a huge fan of the real event, I was really looking forward for this game and we must applaud Big Moon for the effort and again guts to bring a game based on the Dakar. I'm positive that Dakar 19 will be a lot better and prepare yourselves for a huge dose of dunes because the real Dakar 2019 will take place exclusively in Peru. If you're a racing fanatic, feel free to browse the channel because there's a ton of videos related to that genre since the early days of gaming. While you're at it, don't forget to like, to comment, to subscribe and to smash that bell icon so that you're notified when my next video becomes available. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in my next episode. Easy, easy, easy! Let's try and finish this in one piece!
Hey guys, welcome back! So let me just start this video by asking you this. What has changed since the early days of rally racing inspired video games? Only three things comes to mind. Graphics, sounds and physics. That's it! Let's take a small journey back in time, shall we? Rally racing inspired video games always had the same objective, the same goal. Going from point A to point B and as fast as possible. Let's face it, gameplay hasn't changed since the early days. The player needs to keep the vehicle within the road limits and try to arrive first at the end of the stage. Back in 1988, Paris Dakar tried to replicate the real race with randomly generated stages and even forcing the player to use a simplified version of the roadbook, but as said, the vehicle should always stay within the road limits. After that, many other rally games came and went, always offering the same old mechanics. Driving from point A to point B as fast as possible, with a co-driver telling us where to go inside the predetermined stage or track. The hardware evolution and technical innovation would obviously allow video games to be more immersive, offering greater interactive and faithful experiences. But as for the racing genre, gameplay remained practically intact. So the new millennium brought a few video games that tried to pioneer and renovate the gameplay area. Insane from Invictus Games offered a bunch of maps with quite small and limited areas to freely explore, but I recall that it was really groundbreaking back in early 2000s. Later came Paris Dakar Rally and Dakar 2, both published by Acclaim, that had a few of these liaison and special stages, in where we had a bit of freedom, going through a certain number of waypoints before reaching the end, something that would last for about 3 or 4 minutes, and with an arrow pointing where to go for the next waypoint. But the core gameplay of both these titles was again centered around racing in predetermined rally style tracks. Later in 2008, Baja Edge of Control was released and offered the player 15 minute long stages. It's basically an endurance racing game across the desert, based on the Baja 1000 event that in game would last around 2 hours and 15 minutes at best. But again, the player should always keep the vehicle inside the main path. Probably the game that tried to really go further was Fuel from French developer Asobo Studio that offers a playground of over 14,000 square kilometers, even being awarded by the Guinness Book of Records as a video game with the largest playable area till 2009. The studio's original concept, though, was based on the Dakar, but all that changed when Codemasters came forward as its official publisher. Even so, Fuel allowed the full exploration of its map in free roaming mode without incurring loading times. Finally, 9 years later, all that is about to change. Dakar 18 offers over 18,000 square kilometers and a totally unique gameplay mechanics. There's no roads to follow, no boundaries, and the player can drive wherever he wants to. If you're familiar with the real Dakar event, you know that drivers must collect waypoints along the way, and those waypoints are scattered across this huge open world that was recreated with extreme precision based on NASA's own satellite imagery. Take GTA 5's open world map as an example. Dakar 18 is 180 times bigger than that. Can you picture it? It's huge! So, back to that groundbreaking gameplay. The main objective is to explore to find and collect the waypoints along the way and, only then, cross the checkered flag. The use of the roadbook for each stage is probably the most important thing in Dakar 18 and everything you'll ever need to survive. These roadbooks are based on the real Dakar 2018 event that took place back in January and will certainly be the perfect practice tool for drivers that will be facing the 2019 event. Just like in the real thing, we must analyze the roadbook between stages and determine where it's safe to drive fast 
and where we should be careful, cause besides the real chance of being stuck in the sand or in the mud, the vehicle can suffer damage, jeopardizing the player's journey. So we must be sure to follow correctly the instructions on the roadbook, cause if we don't, we'll certainly get lost and the chances of running out of fuel or without spare tires are really high. Dakar 18 will not necessarily be the best or the worst racing game ever made, but a game to be tried by everyone, cause it's different from everything else. So guys, are you also looking forward for Dakar 18? I surely am! Tell me everything down in the comment section below, and if you've enjoyed this video, check my other similar related content. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in my next episode. 500, continue straight ahead, uphill dune, ruins on the right side. Straight ahead to Hey guys, welcome back! Gran Turismo can sometimes be really boring, so, and if you miss all the fun from Sega Rally, here's a pretty good alternative. And in two flavors, yeah. Rally de Africa and Rally de Europe were both developed by Prism Arts and released exclusively in Japan. Just now, after a tip from a viewer of the channel, I had the chance to try both of these awesome racing games that have a slight taste of Gran Turismo mixed with Sega Rally. Thinking of it, it really blends nicely simulation with arcade style of driving, sliding around corners in such a masterful manner. Rally de Africa was released back in September of 1998 and we simply have to make our way across the African continent through places like Casablanca, Lake Vitoria, Kilimanjaro, Dakar and Congo. The various game modes are Championship, Spot Entry, Two Player and Memory Battle. In the Championship we'll start from the first available machine class, namely the K. And if at the end of the competitions we have accumulated more points than our opponents, we'll be given access to the next class and a new track will also be unlocked. The spot entry mode has the same basic idea as the championship, only this time we'll only tackle a track. In two player mode we'll simply race in a circuit against a friend, that's it! And finally in memory battle we'll have to face a circuit on which only our car is present and if we beat the time limit imposed by the CPU, we can save it on memory card to compare it with that obtained by a friend. As you have surely understood, the Rally de Africa cars are divided into various categories, K, A and S. The cars in the K class are the slowest, the A-Class is composed of rally cars and finally those of the S-Class are off-road vehicles. The basic idea of Rally de Africa is dodging cars and bands, but sadly circuits are too few and too short. A circuit will only be tackled for two laps and we just need to avoid all other CPU drivers that will do everything to not let us pass. Practically all these thoughts and rules applies to Rally de Europe released two years later in April of 2000, again exclusively in Japan. Only the scenery obviously changes from African terrain to twisty European roads with fluid scrolling graphics with no signs of slowdowns even when several cars appear on the screen at the same time. It plays identical with pretty much the same driving feeling of Gran Turismo mixed with Sega Rally and in this one we race through Thessalia, Toulouse, Wales, Liguria and Karlstad offering also a new car class. Sounds are decent and simply do their job and not being the best driving games in the world, I only wish that I had these alternatives back in the day cause as I said, Gran Turismo can be really frustrating at times and PlayStation 1 owners never got a Sega Rally game. As for Colin McRae Rally, it was the pinnacle for Sony's console in what rally games are concerned, but by then I had already finished it countless times. So guys, hope you've enjoyed this review of a couple of games that never left Japan. Have you already tried them? 
tell me everything down in the comments section below. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Hey guys, welcome back! Time for a not so retro review and this time around it's all about gravel and it's such an accessible game that even a seven-year-old can master. Let's take a look! Some say that gravel pays an homage to Sega Rally, but I honestly think that Colin McRae Dirt 2 was its main inspiration. Even this engine roar is practically identical. Gravel was announced a year ago in the beginning of 2017 and caught everyone off guard with an initial release date aiming to the end of August of that same year. Later was pushed forward for an early 2018 release, so here's my copy. Arrived one day after its official release and immediately ventured myself into the career mode. As you can see, I opted for the PC game because I believe that is the definitive version of Gravel, showing all its graphical power and playability. My PC specs are as follows. Gigabyte B350 Gaming 3 motherboard. Check. AMD Ryzen 5 1600 processor. Check. G-Skill 16GB of DDR4 RAM. Check. NVIDIA Strix GTX 960 with 4GB of RAM Check Xbox 360 controller Check Logitech Driving Force GT steering wheel and pedals Check So, let's do this! Being gravel and arcade racer, let's try it with a 360 controller. The first thing I noticed was the really low force feedback transmitted to the controller and I couldn't find a setting in the game's menu that could increase it. The second thing was the annoying driving aids that prevented me from winning races. I want to slide around corners and be able to brake at the last minute, so I simply had to turn all that stuff off and I will get more points by doing that. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about! When I saw footage of those stadium events with these mighty trophy trucks, I thought that I would hate it and completely avoid these races, but with all the aforementioned driving aids completely turned off, it's a freaking awesome ride! I love how the truck feels and plays in these slippery conditions. I have to always counter steer and be gentle with the throttle to keep these over the top huge horsepower machines steady and glued to the track to be able to simply move forward. And with an 800 horsepower beast, it's way more difficult than with a 580 horsepower truck. Oh yeah, and I just think that it's an awesome attention to detail by Milestone. Well done guys, this really brings a smile to my face, trying to control these beasts is really fun. By the way, you might remember this LA Stadium from Dirt 2, ring a bell? Also if you played Dirt 2 till there wasn't much more to do left, you'll recall that going through water was this overwhelming and mind-blowing experience mainly when driving inside the car. In gravel, it's this. Come on, guys, couldn't you do better? Dirt 2 was released almost 10 years ago. So I was kind of disappointed with the water effects in gravel, but that wasn't all. Where the hell is all the dust and particles being kicked from the rear end of all the other drivers in front of us? They're saying, where's all the gravel? And I would love to see stuff flying while crashing, just like in Rackfest. Is that too much to ask? I truly hope that Milestone can address these issues in the future. In the meanwhile, and after I used the 4 focus that I won after beating one of the main rivals, the game got stuck in its own logo. Yeah. Gladly, a couple of days later, Milestone released an update to correct this highly annoying bug. There's obviously other minor graphical glitches that doesn't affect gameplay whatsoever, 
But even so, I would love to also see those sorted out. Besides all that, Gravels plays extremely well with a 360 controller and can really be a friendly game to all those that just want to drive around safe and not having to deal with loss of grip and control, just like in the good old days of arcade racers. So it's a truly welcome title in a time when everyone was starting to get a bit tired of extreme driving simulators. Nowadays, and speaking for myself, I'm a bit exhausted of concrete and asphalt kind of racers. It bothers the hell out of me. And I quickly forget about all of them and always return to these off roadish and adventurish kind of feeling in idyllic and remote places. That's why Pacific Rift is my favorite from the Motorstorm franchise. And what about gravel with a proper wheel and pedals? Does it make any difference? Yes it does, if you turn off all driving aids just like me. Even so, playing with a 360 controller is quite enough, even with all aids turned off. Milestone really created something special with gravel, and if you love arcade racing games, you can't go wrong with this one. As you know, I love racing from point A to point B and as you can imagine, the cross-country stuff is an absolute thrill. For instance, driving in Namibia is so freaking awesome. And have you tried the speed cross track in this mining spot in the Australian outback? Whoa, what a ride! And besides these two disciplines, there's also the aforementioned stadium events, wild rush races and a sort of gate crasher similar to what we could also experience in Dirt 2 and 3. You're probably asking yourselves why I didn't grab the PS4 version. You know that besides being cheaper, the PC version can really achieve a higher graphical richness with also a more stable number of frames per second without noticeable losses that could ruin a race. You just need to have the specs for it. Also, and cause I wanted to try gravel with a steering wheel, the PC was my first choice for this game, mainly due to compatibility issues. I know that my Logitech Driving Force GT is fully compatible with the PS3, but I don't quite know if it works with the PS4. Have to try it someday with, for instance, WRC7. The rewind function also present in Milestone's previous Rally Racer also returned in where we can even control the car while still in slow motion allowing us to correct its trajectory and some rally cross tracks really reminds me of Rally Evo. Besides that and when driving through water, all the dust and mud will quickly be washed out. Look at it, all shiny and stuff. I was hoping that gravel would offer a realistic track deformation. I was sad to realize that it was completely left aside. Again, these minor things won't ruin all the fun that gravel has to offer, cause it was designed from the ground up to be simply that, fun. And you can't go wrong with it. I left the online experience for last, cause since gravel was released, I've been trying to play it online. Occasionally I was able to find a server with someone to play with and it's just as fun as playing offline, so it seems that practically no one is playing the multiplayer mode of gravel. To conclude, if you're tired of serious racing games that will penalize you for everything and for nothing, give gravel a spin and it will certainly bring a lot of smiles to your faces. So guys, hope you've enjoyed my review on Gravel, this little game that brought back the fun from the arcade racers of the past. And if you want to see more racing related content, 
feel free to browse the channel and you'll find a ton more videos with a ton other games from a genre that I absolutely love playing. I also cover a lot older stuff from the 80s and 90s, so don't be a stranger and prepare for a huge dose of nostalgia. Also don't forget to like, to share and to subscribe to It's a Pixel Thing. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Hey guys, welcome back! Some of you asked for another Dakar video with more Dakar related games. Finally, the wait is over! Let's take a look! Besides the amazing and groundbreaking Paris Dakar from the Spanish developer Made in Spain released in 1988 for the ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC, MSX, Amiga and DOS, Goodmasters was, as told on my Colin McRae Rally retrospective, thoroughly into racing games, so it was a matter of time for them to release in 1991 a Dakar-related game, Paris to Dakar exclusively for the ZX Spectrum. It had nothing to do with its more strategy-based Spanish counterparts and definitely way less enjoyable. The only feature worth mentioning is a chance of racing with a rally car, a buggy, truck or bike. But prior to these, and as mentioned on Pixel Things episode dedicated to my top 16 games for the Turbo Graphics and PC Engine, Victory Run was released in Japan in 1987 and a couple years later in the United States. It would offer us the chance to drive our vehicle from Paris to Dakar through various types of terrain, and we would be forced to use manual shifting. Something that scared casual players right in the first kilometer. Also, by the end of 87, a strange Dakar related game, developed by Isco, was released for the Famicom. Paris Dakar Rally Special! This odd and unusual sort of racing game, with a title that sounds like something we could eat at a McDonald's, would mix elements of so many different genres in gaming, like driving and racing, action, shoot em up, adventure, and even platforming. This is, I believe, the farthest we can go in what Dakar related games are concerned. By 1989, the French software house Cocktail Vision published African Riders 01 from fellow French developer Tomahawk that would start to explore the Paris Dakar license. It would place us directly in African stages going as fast as possible from point A to point B. The fun part is that we're not forced to stay in the market path, so and to avoid all other riders it's highly advisable to venture off the road in every sense of the sentence. But obviously, there's many hazards to consider and to avoid, like old barrels from previous races, camels and sand. This last one could really slow us down, but fortunately, we can simply switch from two to four wheel drive and off we go. Simply follow the instruments below, being also careful not to break them, and we'll reach the checkered flag in a good position and ready for the next stage. A fun game with an interesting concept. Back to more serious titles, and as told on my original Dakar Games episode, DOS, Amiga and Atari ST players would receive in 1990. Paris Dakar 1990 also developed by the French team Tomahawk and once again published by Cocktail Vision now featuring this first-person view of the desert inside the cockpit. It would definitely immerse the player and, unlike its predecessor, only two of its six stages offered the chance to go off the beaten path. All other four stages must be driven within the stone market course. It's not as fun and engaging as African Riders 01, but the first-person view from inside the cockpit is a nice touch. 
Fast forward a few years and we reach 1997, a year when this obscure PlayStation video game was made available exclusively in Japan, Dakar 97. Virgin Interactive published this one and only title developed by Alcom Games, in cooperation with Mitsubishi Motors, that only offers four vehicles to choose from. Six different courses awaits the player in locations such as mountain roads, deserts, savanna and beaches, but the gameplay can be really frustrating and far from enjoyable. Even so, the sense of freedom in certain stages is cool and the music perfectly sets the tone for a Dakar game. Not being a Dakar or desert themed racing game, Master Rally should also be mentioned. It's based on the 5000 km long real Master Rally race that takes place across seven countries from Paris to Moscow. It was developed by Steel Monkeys and published in late 2001 by Microids for Windows and the PlayStation 2. Right about the same time, that Acclaim also published Broadsword's officially licensed Paris Dakar Rally game, also for Windows and for the PlayStation 2. It's a quite fun and enjoyable arcade racer that keeps the player entertained for a while, but the sense of déjà vu from one country to another is quite annoying and ends up being placed aside after a couple of hours of gameplay. It was cool to get back to it though, I guess that the last time I played it was 10 years ago or something. If you watch my Dakar Games episode from early 2015, you'll recall that I talked about both Dakar titles from Acclaim and mentioned that Fuel was supposed to be a freaking awesome Dakar-like experience named Grand Raid Off-Road, but Codemasters grabbed the rights to publish it and Grand Raid Off-Road was no more. Gladly and also as told on that same episode, in mid-2008 Baja Edge of Control was released for the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 from the same guys that brought us in the past the amazing Motocross Madness PC exclusive franchise, besides other mind-blowing off-road racers from Rainbow Studios Unleashed series. 2008 was also the year when an official Baja 1000 licensed game was published by Activision and developed by Left Field Productions, the makers of the awesome MTX Moto Tracks and, prior to that, the N64 exclusive Excitebike 64. But this score International Baja 1000 is, as I've mentioned on other occasions, the worst game I've ever played. It's a complete insult to the racing game's genre, a licensed title that totally missed its point, that was simply to offer the chance to players to tackle and participate in such a respected and mythic event such as the Baja 1000. So, and as for desert-themed racing games, Baja Edge of Control is still my favorite and almost 10 years later after its original release, ended up being remastered for the current-gen systems, the PS4, the Xbox One and even the PC. Grabbed it day one and I'm absolutely loving it, trying to complete it on its highest difficulty setting. Sound is slightly worse and the small bugs from the original stayed intact, but the graphics are sharper than ever. A must have for all fans of off-road racing. Check my complete review of the 2008 original Baja Edge of Control if you missed it. And by November of 2017, this Portuguese studio Big Moon Entertainment announced at Lisbon Games Week that they were working on an official brand new franchise of the greatest off-road race in the planet. This first entry, known as Dakar 18, just received a reveal trailer. So guys, hope you've enjoyed this part 2 of Dakar related games and I'll leave you with this mind-blowing trailer of a game that I've been waiting for since I played Paris Dakar on my ZX Spectrum back in 1988. Please enjoy and let me know in the comment section below your thoughts about it. I'll certainly make a complete review when the game launches. Again, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, 
Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Hey guys, welcome back! By the end of 2000, one of the most satisfying off-road experiences passed completely under the radar for many fans of the genre. Screamer 4x4 may be an untamed beast, but sure is one hell of an amazing ride. Let's take a look. Have you played or do you recall Screamer, Screamer 2? and Screamer Rally by Milestone back from the 90s. Just forget about all of them, cause Screamer 4x4 is a totally different beast and from a different developer. With Insane on top of the arcade off-road preferences and 4x4 evolution somewhere in between, Screamer 4x4 assumes itself as a true rock-crawling 4x4 simulator that came to freshen the growing off-road side of racing games on the PC. Yes, it is exclusive to PC gamers and I totally and absolutely dig it for its pure fun and challenging off-road driving model implemented into it. Believe me, it's extremely satisfying to overcome all these obstacles and challenges one by one and cross the finish line in first place to be rewarded with even more powerful engines, tires with a higher level of traction, differentials and licensed vehicles like the Jeep Cherokee, the Wrangler, the Land Rover Defender, the Toyota Land Cruiser, etc. etc. Be aware that this game is ready to take us down on its first try, with twists and turns, rivers and ponds, cliffs and bumps and even trees and bushes. All these ingredients, very well mixed up, offer this package of pure hardest nails off-road insanity. Bought this game at launch by Christmas of 2000 on a trip to Spain and a couple of years back grabbed the GOG version for a straightforward installation and play and despite the harsh reviews all around the press that simply crushed this game, I'm going against all odds and recommend it to everyone that is looking for a true challenge. This has to be the slowest racing game ever made because we have to drive carefully through this uneven terrain to prevent hazards of all sorts. If there wasn't enough, there's also night stages, fog, rain and other extreme conditions that will mess up with the steering and send us sliding down the mountains to our doom. There's around 60 courses to tackle, with plenty of variation in the type of landscape and atmospheric conditions and the 4x4 physics are extremely well implemented, giving a great feedback of what's going on between the tires and the ground we're driving on and being a simulator, we must be prepared to play around with the reverse and low and high gears to face some huge slopes and trickier sections of the pathway marked with checkpoints that we must avoid hitting at all costs. If we touch any of those checkpoints, Penalty points will be given and even disqualification if we hit any spectator or marshal. At the end of each main event, a special Pathfinder environment will load up in where we have to find the safest route across a series of checkpoints, negotiating the rough terrain and at the same time conserving the health of our vehicle, which can be a really difficult task for all speed freaks like myself. Screamer 4x4 has obviously other gaming modes available that could be tackled over LAN and even online, challenging other human players, but back then it was really hard to find other people playing this game online. For that, we have to thank the reviews like this one, published in PC Zone magazine, that completely influenced players not to buy Screamer 4x4. This was written by someone that clearly doesn't appreciate this form of motorsport and don't have a freaking clue of how 4x4s handle off-road. So, we have a tutorial, free drive, championship, trophy and pathfinder championship modes available. 
for inexperienced drivers, I strongly suggest that you start by the beginning. The tutorial will give you all the basics for driving safely and the free drive is where you'll improve your off-road skills before entering the championships. And it's here where all the fun begins. Ease your speed a little through here. Learning how to maneuver the vehicle to cross the checkpoints that most of the times are awkwardly placed is so damn enjoyable and extremely satisfying. Seriously, my advice is to go slow, to take your time and to just avoid touching the checkpoints. That way you'll certainly cross the finish line intact and in a good ranking position. But if this sounds boring, better look somewhere else like the high octane and super fast Baja edge of control that I've recently reviewed. As for the multiplayer bit, there's 5 modes of competitive racing available. Circuit, Catch Up, First to Point, King of the Hill and Destruction, all of which are extremely fun to play with friends, but these online and LAN alternatives are simply a bonus. The single player mode is the way to go, cause it has this special feeling that defies you over and over and compels you to beat one more stage again and again. Still, if you have friends around, try the single player mode, but in a hot seat kind of session. So good! I don't care and I totally applaud that Clever's development and version used the word screamer on this game's title to clearly grab players' attention. I simply love the Screamer franchise from Milestone and it was probably what really attracted me in the first place. Otherwise, I would most likely never heard about it back when it was initially released and missed completely this jam. Back then I was an avid consumer of video game related magazines and I can only recall a couple of reviews. That one from PC Zone and another from PC Gamer. So if you want to be challenged, if you want to try something different and revisit the title that somehow started this realistic side of this subgenre, you should give Screamer 4x4 a try. Bear in mind that it can really be frustrating and only stubborn and patient fellows like myself will survive. Feel free to watch my other PC related videos and if you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like, to share, to comment and to subscribe to It's a Pixel Thing. The channel is filled with nostalgia since the early days of video gaming, so don't be a stranger. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Watch out. Watch out! Welcome back! 10 years ago the Colin McRae franchise evolved into dirt alongside the advent of the 7th generation of consoles, so it's a perfect time to recall that huge leap and also its origins. Let's take a look. Back in August of 1986, Cute Masters was founded by the Darling Brothers and their initial main focus was towards the action, sports and racing genres, this last one with their famous simulator series of games for the most popular 8 and 16-bit systems from mid-80s. One of their first games was BMX Simulator that was followed by a ton other simulator entries in the series like Grand Prix Simulator, Professional Ski Simulator, ATV Simulator, Jet Bike Simulator, Pro BMX Simulator, BMX Simulator 2, Grand Prix Simulator 2, Motocross Simulator and Rallycross Simulator. As you can see, since 1990 that Codemasters was interested in Rallycross, nowadays everyone wants to beat the king. 
The Simulator series kinda disappeared after that Rallycross title, but their racing genes remained. 750cc Grand Prix was their first and only venture into the MotoGP scene, and Paris to Dakar Rally was Cody's last real racing game, if we obviously exclude the Micro Machines franchise. By 1997, Codemasters amazed everyone with the release of Toka Touring Car Championship for the PlayStation, PC and even the Game Boy Color. It featured tracks and teams from the 1997 British Touring Car Championship season, in where we could drive against other 15 AI drivers and an advanced real-time damage modeling and realism that was acclaimed by all racing fans. So, to talk about dirt, we have to go back to that era, to 1998 to be more precise, and revisit the first title of the franchise, Colin McRae Rally, released first for the PlayStation, and soon followed by the PC version, that was the one that I played. Sega Rally set the tone, and was a huge inspiration for Codemasters, to create their own rally title, offering a more realistic approach to the genre. There was something that players and fans of the sport were hoping since the fabulous and challenging Network Q Rack Rally franchise from Europress. Besides Sega Rally, Wave Race 64 and Screamer Rally were other two titles that somewhat influenced the team while developing Colin McRae Rally. Seriously? Wave Race 64? Sega Rally was the first racing title to really make the distinction between the feeling of driving on different road surfaces like asphalt, mud and gravel and when combined with a set of wheel and pedals, the sheer fun of driving off-road. As a PlayStation owner, I always envied my friends that own Saturns cause it was the home system that received the arcade conversion of Sega Rally. It ended up being ported to the PC by 1997 and also by 1997 was when Sony's console received its first proper rally game, V-Rally from Infogrames. Sadly, I ended up finding it so unrealistic, with cars showing no weight whatsoever, that I quickly forgot about it and immediately sold my copy. In the meanwhile, Colin McRae Rally was being shaped using Toka's game engine, but Codemasters ended up realizing that it wouldn't work, so a new game engine needed to be created from scratch specifically for Colin McRae Rally and, with the precious help from Colin McRae himself, Codemasters built the foundations for this amazing franchise that I truly love and play all the time. Having the name of the 1995 WRC champion was already a huge accomplishment for Codemasters, but even so, they wanted to make the best rally game ever and not only rely upon the name of the renowned world champion. The dev team spent hours watching real rally events and how cars reacted to each surface and would try to replicate that in their game. So they've developed in-house their own track design application that was used on all five first games of the franchise. Colin McRae Rally was also the first racing title to feature a realistic damage model, improving the one that was introduced in Toka Touring Car Championship. As you know, the very first Gran Turismo was released a few months before Colin McRae Rally and featured indestructible cars and is still considered the best-selling title on the original PlayStation. So, Codemasters were kind of reluctant on offering the chance for players to destroy their cars, but gladly, all manufacturers agreed with the level of destruction that they were aiming for. Grabbed Colin McRae Rally Day 1 around July of 1998, on time for my own birthday, but ended up selling it as soon as the PC version was available by September of that same year. With graphics set to max, Colin McRae Rally simply blew my mind away, with particles, dust and mud being realistically splattered all across the rear end of our car. With a somewhat realistic career mode, it engaged the player right from the beginning that would really grab us and take us through a journey across a bunch of awesome and beautiful locations around the world. A 
couple of years later by 2000, again for PlayStation, later for PC and by 2002 for the Game Boy Advance. Colin McRae Rally 2.0 arrived bigger and better, also including Rallycross style of event, in where we race against three other opponents. Goodmasters was once again trying to show players the sheer fun and chaos of Rallycross, nowadays a highly popular form of motorsport. These circuit racing events were meant to be included right in the first title of the franchise. But that one had such an authentic feel to it, with the inclusion of the Rally School, that Rallycross style of events were left aside, finally making its way into 2.0. By October of 2002, the third installment in the series arrived for the next generation of consoles, the PS2 and the Xbox. Again, played first the PC port that arrived only by June of 2003, that offered high-resolution graphics. And I recall that the simple fact or small but extremely important detail of being possible to realistically cut the ribbons on the side of the road was mind-blowing and left me absolutely speechless, mainly because of its authenticity. Yeah, call me crazy! Bear in mind that until then, these ribbons were like concrete walls in all other rally games out there, and one title I can recall that kind of introduced it was the Off-Roader Insane, released practically two years before and that I've already reviewed. By September of 2003 arrived Colin McRae 04, again for the PlayStation 2 and the Xbox. The PC version would come only by April 2004 and, like the PS2 version, exclusive for Europe. It went against the demanding Richard Burton's Rally, released a couple of months later. The arcadish approach to the Colin McRae series, that was extremely playable using solely a keyboard or a gamepad, was a major advantage against the extremely difficult Richard Burns Rally, only playable using a set of wheel and pedals. Colin McRae 04 improved upon the third installment in the series, graphically and in the gameplay area. The pinnacle of the Colin McRae Rally series arrived in September of 2004 and for the first time, with a simultaneous release for the three main platforms, PC, Xbox and PS2. Colin McRae Rally 2005 is a gorgeous looking game, with plenty of new graphical tweaks and effects and at the same time set the tone for things to come and ended the, let's say, first part of the series with my favorite entry on the Colin McRae Rally saga. The new generation of HD systems was coming and brand new graphics, audio and physics engines were needed, so by June of 2007 came Colin McRae Dirt for PC and Xbox 360. It premiered an innovative game engine co-developed between Codemasters and Sony Computer Entertainment and was a tremendous success, selling over 500,000 copies in its first week. It offered the chance to embrace a whole lot of new off-road disciplines and not just the traditional rally racing, stadium and rallycross events. So we have also car races with buggies and trucks, rally raid races with Dakar style of vehicles that even includes these mighty desert trucks and hill climb in the mighty Pikes Peak track. The PlayStation 3 version was released only by the 11th of September in the United States and on the 14th in Europe. Sadly, the day after the 15th will be remembered as the day when Colin McRae left us, along with his young son and two friends of the family in an helicopter crash. Codemasters' huge marketing campaign for the launch of Dirt on the PlayStation 3 was withdrawn after an agreement between the developer and McRae's family. In Dirt 2, released a couple of years later, a video tribute to Colin's career was included and would be unlocked after the Colin McRae challenge was completed.
This is still my favorite dirt game from the whole franchise, cause it introduced so many different locations completely new to the series, and those raid events are extremely fun and challenging. And as you know, I simply love this form of motorsport, Dakar style. Three special modes were also featured in Dirt 2, Gate Crusher, Domination and Last Man Standing. All combined forms this amazing package of pure arcade racing that I can only recommend you all to try, even if racing games aren't your thing. The Ego engine was improved upon the one used in the very first Dirt and Race Driver grid, and the flashback function present in that last one was kept intact for this second venture into the Dirt series. I also consider Dirt 2 the most beautiful, graphically speaking, and on the PC is where it really shines, with ultra settings, and the water effects were, and still are, visually mind-blowing. A gorgeous game overall. It was noticeable that Codemasters was trying to reach a wider audience with the inclusion of names and voices of, for instance, Travis Pastrana, Ken Block, Tanner Faust and Dave Mira. This was the last game of the whole series to bear Colin's name on the cover. By May of 2011, Dirt 3 was released and at a later stage a Colin McRae Vision charity pack was available for download that included the iconic 4 Escort MK2 and all profits from the sale would be donated to Colin McRae Vision, a foundation created by the McRae family after the pilot's death. Dirt 3 wasn't a brilliant game, nor a worthy follow-up to the jaw-breaking Dirt 2 but it sure is a lot of fun. It brought weather conditions like rain and snow and a new Gymkhana mode, along with the possibility to upload replay clips directly to YouTube. Dirt 3 consultants Ken Block, Chris Meek and Miku Irvonen, among others, recall the legend and how we inspired them to be the best at the sport. Has to be my idol and mentor some years ago, Colin McRae. It was really his heart and his drive and how hard he, he drove, he just drove. He set down a legacy which we're, we're still continuing to follow. His, his ethos was if in doubt, flat out and that, that just showed through every single race that he competed in. Well, Kyle McRae is one of the best drivers in, in the history of forever. He just went for it every time and all the time. He was just spectacular, really great driver. A really big deal to me to be a part of this series that really started with Colin McRae. A year after, by May of 2012, Dirt Showdown arrived, reviving the sheer fun of other racing titles from the past, like Destruction Derby and Flat Out. But it was simply that. No rally or off-road options in this one. What would make fans of the series kinda disappointed with Codemasters for releasing a game with dirt splattered all over its cover and having practically nothing in common with its older brothers. And to compensate that, by April of 2015, Codemasters announced and made available through Steam an early access to their next entry into the Dirt franchise. Dirt Rally. It was shaped with the precious feedback from fans like myself. Grabbed the early access day one and watched it being shaped and turned into a realistic rally simulation, fondly labeled by gamers as the Dark Souls of Rally games. The full PC version of Dirt Rally was finally released in December of 2015, time when I also uploaded my review, followed by the console ports by April of 2016. It features a completely different physics model built from scratch and a wide list of cars to choose from. I could only wish that it add more locations and rallies, like one of my favorites, the Safari Rally in Kenya that was excluded from the WRC after the 2002 event won by, you guessed it, Colin McRae. Also during development, Codemasters signed a partnership with the FIA World Rallycross Championship that brought official rallycross locations to Dirt Rally, and Pikes Peak would make its return to the series introduced, as you remember, in the very first Colin McRae Dirt. Milestone also included Pikes Peak Hill Climb in their Sebastian Loeb Rally Evo, also from 2016. But in the meanwhile, the license for the event was grabbed by Polyphony Digital for their Gran Turismo franchise. 
If you recall, it appeared first in Gran Turismo 2, almost two decades ago. And recently, as a kind of celebration for these 10 amazing years of Dirt, its sixth installment was released. Dirt 4, a direct sequel to Dirt 3 and not to Dirt Rally. So hold on to your copy of Dirt Rally if you're looking for realistic rally physics. With Dirt 4, Codemasters went back to grab attention from the masses with a simpler and enjoyable ride that everyone could tackle. There's no real-life stages like the ones in Dirt Rally like Col de Turini or Sweet Lamb, but there's a feature called Your Stage in the heart of this brand new installment that procedurally generates tracks on the fly. So instead of those well-known locations and tracks that everyone wants to replicate and grab official licenses to be able to use them, Codemasters offered the player an almost infinite way of playing different tracks anytime we want. Yeah, I know that there's the official Rallycross locations and its license is splattered on the game's cover, but honestly, I prefer to play around with the Your Stage feature than anything else included in Dirt 4. Even the Land Rush stuff is secondary and, let's be honest, kind of boring. Rally racing from point A to point B is my main focus in this title and I'm having a blast with it. Also, we can clearly see the influence of former Evolution Studios employees every time we come across a wrecked car at the trackside, just like in WRC Rally Evolved from 2005. We have to give it up to Codemasters for creating this amazing track generation tool that was secretly on development for many years now, and it totally delivers a compelling and intuitive way of creating our own tracks with a touch of a button and share it with the world. The feeling of not knowing what's around the corner, delivered by Dirt 4, is the perfect tribute to Colin McRae, whose motto was, if in doubt, flat out. So guys, here's my sort of tribute to a franchise that I absolutely love since its origins back in 1998 and to a developer and publisher that is still among us since 1986 and back then responsible for amazing titles for my ZX Spectrum with their Simulator and Dizzy series. What else have Code Masters reserved for us? They'll certainly bring a new grid title for the current gen but as for rally and off-road racing, I think that things are shaping up pretty well. What do you think? Leave a comment and wishes for Dirt 5. In the meanwhile, feel free to browse my channel for more awesome retro and not so retro stuff since the early days of video gaming. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please like, comment again, share and subscribe to It's a Pixel Thing. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Keep calm. Hey guys, welcome back to a not so retro exhaustive review and the time has come for Baja Edge of Control. Making a review of one of my favorite video games ever is quite difficult. You already know the final verdict. Even so, I'll try my best not to be influenced by emotion. So, let's take a look. Baja Edge of Control was developed by 2XL Games and released in 2008 by THQ. 2XL Games was formed by a few key members of the original Rainbow Studios team, responsible for amazing racing titles for the PC, PlayStation 2 and the original Xbox like Motocross Madness 1 and 2, ATV Off-Road Fury 1 and 2, Splashdown, Matt Hoffman's Pro BMX 2, Star Wars Racer Revenge, MX Unleashed and MX vs ATV Unleashed besides others. Since 1998 that Rainbow Studios was, for me, synonymous of awesome and realistic racing physics, so 
I was extremely excited after I heard the news that a brand new off-road video game was on its way from the makers of all those titles mentioned earlier. The bad news was that it was only being released for consoles, the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. I recall trading emails with Rick Waltman, 2XL's president and CTO and responsible for the physics engine in all of Rainbow's console games mentioned earlier, asking if there was a remote chance of Baja being released also for the PC. As he stated, Baja was totally developed on PC, but that particular version would never see the light of day due to the mixed reviews that the console ports, yes, ports, were popping out all over the press and the consequent slow commercial performance. As Rick also stated, people are saying Moro Storm is better because they like the graphics more and that tends to be more important for a lot of people. Also, and sadly, the PS3 version of Baja suffers badly from slow frame rate issues that often occurs when there's a lot of action on screen. But I can notice a few slight graphical richness on Sony's console compared with the more fluid and smoother 360 version. So, and as you saw in my episode celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Xbox 360, Along came the chance of getting one of those new-gen consoles on a trading campaign in where I had to take an old and fully functioning system, plus two or three games, and I would bring home a brand new Xbox 360 arcade for just 49 euros. The time to play Baja had finally arrived! Back in the Rainbow Studios days that buggies, jeeps and trucks were being slowly introduced in their Unleashed franchise, so it was quite obvious that sooner or later a video game featuring those off-road monsters as primary weapons would be featured in their own game. But that would only be possible to accomplish outside Rainbow Studios. So it was time to step out and pursue their dream. We want to innovate gameplay while making sure the game rocks. Our new studio gives us a wonderful opportunity to bring our own distinct vision of what a next generation game can be. We plan to break new ground by integrating graphics, physics and animation in original creative ways. Excel Games was founded in 2005 and three years later, in September of 2008, came their first AAA title, Baja Edge of Control, for the brand new HD systems from Sony and Microsoft. It's thoroughly understandable that most casual players would just give up trying to climb the steep ladder that the career mode offers. You'll probably find yourself struggling to win races right from the beginning, cause the terrain is so rough that it's really hard to even keep the car steady in a straight line. And the lower classes suffer a lot harder in all those bumps that car mechanics will simply be shred to pieces in no time. But I can guarantee you that perseverance is the main key and it's totally worth to keep on trying till you unlock and have the necessary funds to buy one of those 800 horsepower vehicles that are so damn enjoyable to drive. These will fly over all those bumps at unbelievable speeds but will need constant precision adjustments to the left analog stick to keep the car on course without losing speed, cause the AI drivers can really be aggressive and push you off the track causing huge accidents. Fortunately or oddly, accidents or collisions with other vehicles will only cause cosmetic damage, with panels flying or falling off and even losing those essential spare tires. Mechanical damage will only occur due to the player's driving style. Yeah, Baja will punish you really hard for excessive maneuvers while driving, with tires blowing out, suspension turning completely to pieces after hard landings and engine failure losing precious power. 
but that's just what the real Baja races are all about. Painful and dirty. I truly love to play Baja like it should be played, with all collisions turned on and with all classes on track. It's such a huge joy to take over one more vehicle and the developers even said that if we use the horn right before overtaking, the other drivers will most likely allow you to pass, just like in Big Run that I played at the arcades back in 1989. Not sure if that is true or not, but I find myself instinctively using that trick more than once during a race. As the developers also stated, if we ram a AI vehicle out of the track, it will remember that move and the next time we meet, it will probably try to do the same stunt to us. Isn't that awesome? So the AI present in Baja is simply amazing. Whoops! Off he goes! Just like Portuguese people would say, there he goes, off with the pigs! If you've played those other motocross and ATV titles from Rainbow Studios, you know that suspension preload before a jump is a huge deal to be victorious and cross the finish line in first place. In Baja that same principle must also be used and abused. There isn't a preload meter like in those aforementioned titles, but our intuition automatically tells us to pull the left analog stick back and right before the end of the jump push it forward to grab major air. Also while in the air, we can adjust the incline and the direction of our vehicle to try to land as smooth as possible, maintaining all our momentum. It's a bonus for the player, cause deep down, Baja is an arcade racer. Without that little detail, Baja would be impossible to drive. But I wouldn't mind if that detail was left aside. It would transform Baja into a freaking amazing sim, just like the scary Richard Burns Rally. Another trick we should use is the clutch, also present in the MX and ATV franchises that will help us exit a corner with an extra boost of speed. That's the closest we'll get to a nitro boost, but be careful though, abusing the clutch will drastically increase engine and water temperature that will turn into huge overeating problems. So knowing exactly how, when and where to push our vehicle to the limit without breaking it is with no doubt a lot of fun. Career mode is really the way to go, starting with these really weak and slow Baja bugs trying to climb all the way up to the mighty trophy trucks. Many different disciplines will cross our path, like circuit racing, rally races, hill climbs, Baja events, etc. And in the middle, we'll also be invited to special invitational events. Winning races will attract sponsors. These sponsors will only pay you if you reach the end of each stage with the panels intact. I always saw this little detail as one of those unique little touches that makes a difference. But as I said, finishing a race in first place and with the car intact is just not feasible. There's a ton of vehicles to choose from, around 160 and lots of options to fine-tune them up in the garage with a wide selection of hundreds of authentic parts. These parts really make a difference on the track and one of the most important factors to consider when upgrading our vehicle is the weight distribution so that we won't roll over every time we hit a sharp turn. We'll be racing in 9 different carefully handcrafted environments and almost 100 racetracks that covers more than 1000 square miles of rough terrain just begging to be explored. So the big daddy of races the Baja 1000 served as the main inspiration for Edge of Control, a race that the best and well equipped drivers from the real world finish in just over 24 hours of non-stop racing. In-game those 24 hours were reduced to about 3, that I can tackle and finish the whole thing in just under 2.5 hours and we won't see the same turn twice. One cool thing was that we could play online this 3 hour long Baja 1000 event 
and let the game take over for you when the time comes to simply go to the bathroom or answer a phone call. A huge challenge for the developers was to create these huge areas so that the player wouldn't have that feeling of deja vu. And they've masterfully achieved it. These deserts and forests are such a joy to drive through and every single bump feels different and must be tackled differently. Even in circuit races, we can't simply apply the same method of approaching a turn, cause it's practically impossible to accomplish that apparently simple task. Every lap is a complete adventure, a leap into the unknown. And that's what I love in off-road racing, the unpredictability in every step of the path. In case anything goes wrong, in circuit racing there's pit stops in where we can temporarily fix all mechanical problems and get a brand new set of tires for just half a dozen of seconds. As for rally racing in Baja event, a helicopter is flying around 99.9% .9 of the times. Yeah, 99.9%, .9 cause there's this little and annoying bug that will most likely betray us sooner or later in those long Baja events. So it's better to drive safe and keep the car intact or we'll be slowly dragging our vehicle to the finish line and be overtaken practically by all other drivers on track. To prevent or postpone engine failure during these long stages, we have to ease off the gas when temperature rises drastically. Try not to over rev the engine while climbing, for that using manual shifting is ideal but be sure to use it correctly or it will also break down on you. Everything can go wrong during stages or circuit racing, so pay extra attention to the terrain, other drivers, tires, suspension, temperature and decide when to take defensive maneuvers for stopping for repairs and for getting full set of brand new tires with spares. Dirt Rally is the only title out there that can come close to Baja's damage system and the consequences that bad driving will entail, but the sense of deja vu in that one is really huge. This isn't just another racing game. We're always trying to find the best line through a rough section and take the safest route across a series of turns without losing speed, so finishing a stage without major damage and constantly being in the true sense of the edge of control feels as good as winning. The layout of each and every environment is realistic, transmitting a feeling of racing on a virtual representation of a real section of the Baja California rather than just on another desert themed circuit. Obviously that there's a few minor issues in the terrain like this strange thing on the ground only present in this little bit of the whole game, like if two tectonic plates had come together but that won't ruin the experience or penalize the player for no reason. Getting off track is so normal that we only have to be worried to avoid cutting too much of a corner. If we roll over or land way off track, simply press the two shoulder buttons at the same time and we'll be back in the race in no time. This is a game in where we're constantly judging whether to push hard through a rough section or simply hold the position if there's a lot of traffic to overtake. The audio was also taken into high consideration with engine noises taken directly from real vehicles that is just what I wanna hear while racing so in music is turned all the way down. That Spanish guitar tune in the main menu is quite enough to set the mood and transmit a bit of relaxation before tackling another 15 or 20 minute action packed race. A PC version of Baja Edge of Control would have certainly taken this game to a new level 
with mods and brand new environments created by the huge motocross and MX vs ATV Unleashed online community. It would be turned into a true off-road racing simulation, there's no doubt in my mind. Split screen up to 4 players, triple screen panorama view on the Xbox 360 version, amazing physics and suspension travel system that reacts to every bump, miles and miles to drive to horizon landscape in the sense of if we see it, we can drive all the way over there. Baja Edge of Control is a unique game that every motorsport fan shouldn't hesitate on getting a copy for their collection. And the Baja 1000 event present is with no doubt the most demanding and exclusive race you'll ever find on a console. Sure that the Motorstorm franchise and all other driving games released since and even before September of 2008 have nicer and better looking graphics. But as you know, for me, graphics aren't everything. The experience is, and no other driving game can still come close to the experience that Baja Edge of Control offers. Just look at that suspension eating all the bumps in such a realistic manner. I simply love this stuff. And if you're tired of racing, just go free roaming through the desert, exploring these vast locations packed with awesome other places to discover. As the developer stated, you'll never see the same rock twice. Feel free to browse my channel for more awesome video game related stuff that I upload every single week, from the ZX Spectrum up to the PlayStation 4. Click on these examples and if you've enjoyed this episode, please comment, like, share and subscribe to It's a Pixel Thing. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next episode. Hey guys, welcome back to a not so retro review and this time around it's all about the crew. As part of Ubisoft's celebration of their 30 year anniversary, they were offering the PC version, the best version. I've already been playing the PS4 Wild Run edition for a while now, so I thought that it would be cool to leave my opinion about both versions of this underrated racing title that was co-developed by the makers of the Shadow of the Beast and Destruction Derby franchises. Let's take a look. The Crew is basically a role-playing action driving game with large-scale multiplayer elements in which the multiplayer bit is not separate from the single-player campaign which is awesome by the way. It was developed by Ivory Tower with the assistance of Ubisoft Reflections that, as you know, and as said in the beginning of this video, have also in their resume the Shadow of the Beast and Destruction Derby franchises. It takes us in an astonishing beautiful road trip across a huge open world recreation of the United States filled with stuff to do and to find. The cities depicted in the crew are, in my opinion, so freaking beautifully detailed. In the PC version at least. And the Grand Canyon, oh my god, what an amazing place to just wander around by sunrise and sunset also. Simply gorgeous. By the way, my PS4 footage was captured directly using the console's tools and for this game I got only 720p at 30 frames. Is this right? Shouldn't be at least 1080p. Another bad side is that we have to be always online for the game to simply work, which can cause a few problems if the connection is down for some reason. Also the presence of microtransactions can really scare players 
but I simply avoid all that stuff and purely enjoy the core arcade racing genes that the crew has under the hood. Again, I found the Windows version a lot better, both visually and in the gameplay area. I felt the controls a lot more responsive than in the PS4 version. Can't say anything about the Xbox One game, but it might be a mix of both those versions. I also had a hard time figuring out the user interface, but when I got the hang of it, it's really simple and intuitive. The single player campaign is around 20 hours long and we play the role of Alex Taylor, whose voice is decently performed by Troy Baker, who works undercover for the government, infiltrating criminal groups and missions can be played alone, with friends and with online co-op matchmaking. So the story begins with Alex being convicted of a crime that he didn't commit, the murder of his own brother. Yeah, I know, the same old story. So five years later he is given the chance to prove his innocence and to bring to justice the real murderer of his brother. So we embark on a journey from Detroit through St. Louis, Chicago, New York, Miami, Las Vegas, Los Angeles and many other amazing places. Between them we can participate in a bunch of different minigames or skill challenges that are scattered across the world and they are activated by simply driving through them. So scores and times are saved online so that other players can beat them. A cool thing to keep us entertained while driving from point A to point B if we're feeling bored. Something already seen elsewhere. The Wild Run expansion pack announced during 2015's E3 was released later that year and added motorcycles, monster trucks, drift cars, dragsters and the Summit, a multiplayer event where car culture is celebrated across a whole bunch of different racing disciplines and vehicles, simply to impress the crowd and to have fun, basically. There's also a new expansion pack coming soon, the crew calling all units, scheduled to be released in the 29th of November, followed by the Ultimate Edition that includes the full game and both expansions. So in this new calling all units add-on, you've already guessed what's coming. Yeah, we're giving the chance of playing as a cop and chase and arrest illegal street racers. Again, something already seen and done in many other racing games, mostly from the Need for Speed franchise. Only the scale in which all the action takes place is slightly different. Needless to say that everyone criticized the online-only gameplay, the microtransactions and the user interface. It was enough to instantly kill the game, but if we simply give it a chance, the crew will certainly prove that all that is secondary and the single-player campaign has a lot to offer and between missions we can simply grab the wheel and drive coast to coast through rocky and snowy mountains, deserts, cities, beaches, enjoying that awesome feeling of complete freedom. By the way, going coast to coast in a straight line will take around 45 minutes of your time, but you'll certainly be overwhelmed by these gorgeous locations that you're compelled and dragged to fully explore the surroundings. The United States depicted in the game may eventually look like an empty place and the main focus of human players that are around is just to ram each other's cars off the track. It seems that is what players do when playing these free roaming and open world type of racing games. Sad but true. Even so, I'm having a blast with the PC version that Ubisoft kindly offered. If you follow me since I began this YouTube journey, you know how much I love free roaming kind of stuff and to simply explore the wilderness, so and like Portuguese people would say, this is my beach. And if you're into some free roaming kind of stuff, you'll certainly enjoy it also. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week.
guys, welcome back! Now, here's a title that I was looking for to grab back in 2004. Followed every step of the developing process and wasn't disappointed when it was finally released. Crashing and mashing cars has never been so much fun. Let's take a look at Flat Out. I've always been a fan of racing games from Bugbear since their debut with the awesome PC exclusive Rally Trophy back in 2001. The simple addition of the ragdoll physics was enough to keep the player focused in winning races, trying to avoid all the mashing and crashing happening around us. So there are 16 different cars and 36 tracks, mostly variations of one another and the environments are fully disruptible. Cars are similar to each other and tuning them up is really important in flat out if we want to stay ahead and win races. Also present is a turbo boost that will fill up each time we hit a rival car or any surrounding objects or structures. But be careful, cause besides filling up our turbo meter, trackside objects will also mess up with the steering, making us lose power, grip and even the overall control over our vehicle. Tell me, in which game can we toss our own driver out of the car and then get our own vehicle to run over him? Yeah, flat out is the one you're looking for. Try to also ram other players' cars out of the track and make them smash into things just to see them being also thrown through their own windshields. So much fun! That's what video games are meant to be! Fun! Sometimes I even get annoyed. When I crash hard then my driver simply remains seated, as if nothing happened. Ah, that's better! Music is cool, nothing outstanding, but for this video I turned it off because I didn't want to be flanked by copyright stuff, so any loud and fast music fits perfectly in this style of games. The sound effects though are awesome, from the screams of the drivers being tossed out of their own cars to the tires screech, from the crashing into stuff to simply scratching the paint job, a fist to our ears. The bonus rounds are just there for fun and obviously to gain extra cash and to watch the ragdoll effect in all its glory. It's also kind of relaxing just to break the furious racing action for a couple of minutes. Also in these bonus rounds there's a few events just like the ones we would find in Destruction Derby style of races, in where we try to be the last survivor in this sort of arena and others where we race in figure 8 tracks that can be absolutely crazy when players try to cross in front of each other and all hell breaks loose. What's really enjoyable is the opponent's AI. Races can be really furious and competitive. They will try to push you down cliffs or into concrete barriers. Even so, the game suffers from rubber banding and our opponents will slow down till we recover from a crash or from getting off track. The opposite also occurs. When we're leading the race, the other drivers will hunt us down like maniacs, causing a huge pressure and consequently forcing us to make stupid mistakes. In a second we're in first place and in the next we're last. This is racing folks and I love it. Even so, don't give up just yet. The other opponents are as prone as we are to hit stuff like rails and trees leaving a lot of debris for others to crash and fly of course, so we're never out of the race till it's really over. This was what Ken Kutaragi wanted for the very first Destruction Derby. The Xbox game even came with an online multiplayer option, a feature that was missing from the PS2 version and uncomprehensibly from the PC game as well. What were they thinking? didn't own an Xbox back then, so I can't describe how the online races were like in that system. Nonetheless, on the PC, multiplayer with friends over LAN was awesome, I can ensure that. And fans even invented ways to make online racing on the PC happen. That's why I love PC gaming! 
I still can't understand why 12 years ago specialized magazines and websites were so harsh with Flat Out, mainly stating that it was supposed to be sold as a budget title. Bought it at launch and I would certainly do it again. Not being a simulation, this game had the most gratifying and realistic physics engine ever seen in a racing game, with stuff flying and bouncing all over the place and still, reviews were really dull. Also grabbed at launch its sequel Flat Out 2, the let's call it remastered edition of Flat Out 2 for the Xbox 360 subtitled Ultimate Carnage and last year grab the early access of the next car game or Wreckfest, and it's looking pretty good. The full game is scheduled to be available somewhere in 2017. If there's a game in where we must and should use the seatbelt, that game is flat out, so buckle up and prepare for chaos! So guys, hope you've enjoyed this review of this awesome title released 12 years ago that even nowadays I get really impressed by its amazing and beautifully detailed graphics. For PC I advise you to grab it on Steam or GOG.com, cause if you install from the original discs it simply won't run on modern systems. Even when I installed Flat Out 2, the driver for the Star Force anti-piracy protection system just crippled my OS preventing it to boot up. Gladly I ended up figuring out how to solve it and just took the boxed game back to my shelf. Been playing the GOG versions of both games instead. As for consoles, the Xbox version of Flat Out looks better than the one for the PS2 and both can be grabbed for reasonable prices. Unfortunately, network play on the PC version seems to be disabled or something, when I try to create a LAN session, it gives me a fatal error bringing me back to my desktop. Let's hope that it will be fixed soon. Feel free to check my other related reviews, Rally Trophy, the very first title from Bugbear and the amazing Off-Roader Insane. Also, don't forget to like, share, comment and subscribe to It's a Pixel Thing. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week. Hey guys, welcome back. 16 years ago I stumbled by accident upon Insane and I simply couldn't resist to its amazing cover. And the sentence no limits, no rules, no roads instantly grabbed me. By then I was a huge fan of multiplayer over network, so playing insane with friends was a really fun thing to do. Let's take a look. By the end of the 90s, online gaming was getting one more enthusiast. After Revolt and Motocross Madness 2, it was the time for insane. And what a superb online experience it was. So in late 2000, this Hungarian company known as Invictus Games developed this amazing title that was immediately picked up by Codemasters. It was so innovative that it ended up building the foundations of free-roaming off-road racing games. It has a huge single-player mode with plenty of vehicles, tracks and racing disciplines to choose and conquer but it's a multiplayer bit that really drives me really insane. I don't think that there's a way of playing it online nowadays, but there's always the LAN alternative route to choose. And I just forgot to mention that this 16 years old video game has been on my hard drive since then. I bought it at launch and it works with all the operating systems that came after like the XP, Vista, Windows 7, 8 and 10. And cause it's on a backup hard drive, it runs just by clicking on the executable file. It doesn't have to be installed on the system, incredible. A similar thing happens with MX vs ATV Unleashed that I've reviewed last year. The Monster Truck Madness series and 4x4 Evolution became really popular back in the beginning of the new millennium, with its new mechanics and physics, but even being off-road games, 
Those were still confined into a fairly restrictive environment or track and not as a really off-the-road type of thing. Insane simply crushed that boundary and besides that, it has a huge sense of freedom and felt somewhat realistic. The controls can be frustrating at first, I can confirm that, but after we've learned how to compensate for the many bumps and jumps and simply to avoid crashes, we're ready to take the victory in all these different styles of racing. Choosing our vehicle is an essential part of the race, cause some of them will easily flip over. And an awesome sensation is that we can almost feel the terrain we're driving over, mainly due to the physics model applied to each vehicle. Something really unique back then that just grabbed me instantly. And each vehicle offers a multitude of camera angles from outside or from the inside of the car. Insane doesn't have any real-world licensed vehicles, but it offers a wide variety of 4x4s to choose from, from basic Baja bugs and dune buggies, all the way up to SUVs, trucks and those mighty big rigs. The game also offers an incredible damage model for the time. Each crash and collision dynamically deforms the car according to the force used and point of impact and it will affect its handling and velocity and it can even be crushed to about half the size it started. As for the various gaming modes available, they range from standard off-road races in which we have to race a required number of laps on an off-road circuit. Jamboree, in where we have to find an active gate and be the first through it, keeping an eye on the map at the bottom of the screen so that our vehicle doesn't encounter any obstructed area. Gate one. The classic return the flag mode, in where we have to keep the flag the longest time possible and try to return it to a specific area. Gate hunt, in where we must try to claim the highest number of gates without a specific order and by doing that, gates become inactive as they're claimed. Pathfinder will make us go through all active gates in any order and as fast as we can. Capture the flag will make us drive like maniacs through the active gates, avoiding rolling over and other players from stealing it from us. If this occurs, then it's time for us to chase them. The more time we keep the flag, the more points are rewarded. So freaking fun over land! In Destruction Zone, we must stay in the King Zone long enough to grab as many points as possible. But be advised, all other players will also want to be kings, so mashing and crashing will certainly be the main objective in this mode. Preparing. And free roam, just to do whatever we want to do and go wherever we want to go. Gameplay is accompanied by a dedicated soundtrack that despite being pretty basic, perfectly complements this fast-paced action. You may want to turn engine noises down a bit, cause it may become a bit unbearable after a while. Nothing that will affect the gameplay whatsoever. A nice feature is that during gameplay we can repair the car on the fly or on the move if you prefer, just like it would happen in Carmageddon. Only in Carmageddon, repair could be done progressively. In Insane, we have the backspace key ready to be pressed at the right moment. Being this simple touch of a key, the most strategic move we'll ever do in this game. And we'll also receive a 3 second penalty for doing that. Even so, it's better to avoid huge crashes against other players or tumbling down mountains. We'll be losing precious time doing those stunts and even more for repairing the car. Insane was the title that launched the Codemasters multiplayer network for free online matchmaking where players could challenge each other and obtain points for a global ranking, so it was a huge deal for them. But unfortunately, it was really hard to find other players online to race against. 
Don't expect insane to be a simulation, even having a steep learning curve. After that learning curve is overtaken, it's simply a highly enjoyable and fun action-packed racing and crashing game. It was till then the only 4x4 racing game to offer a truly sense of freedom found in real-life off-road racing, and I really love that feeling. It ended up winning several awards, including Best Off-Road Game Ever by PC Gamer magazine. It was, with no doubt, the best off-road game till at least 2001. Like stolen. In 2012, there was a sort of sequel, Insane 2, that I've played for a while simply to conclude that it's not as good as the original, not even close. Insane was a few years back given away for free by Codemasters. We could download it from their website and I also have here my copy of it. Nowadays we can find it for around $10 at GOG.com, but you can also get a physical copy on eBay for less. I highly recommend it if you're hunger for some off-road mayhem. Remember, no limits, no rules, no roads. To conclude, here's a few cheat codes that might come handy. So guys, hope you've enjoyed this review of one of my favorite racing games ever. It was only available for PC and back then. It was a really demanding game, graphically speaking, and in the gameplay area also. But if you're a diehard off-road fan, you certainly would overcome that obstacle really quickly. Tell me in the comments section below if you enjoy this type of games and if you've played this particular one back then. Also, take a look at a couple of my other older racing related videos like MX vs ATV Unleashed and Dirt Rally. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week. Sony decided to close another awesome European studio that developed exclusive PlayStation titles, Evolution Studios. So, let's take a look at its origins and top moments. Ian Edrington, former financial director of Imagine Software and co-founder of Psygnosis, formed Evolution Studios along with Martin Kenwright back in 99, after Ian had been dismissed by Sony from his own company. On the other hand, Martin started his career in 1986 as a freelance game designer and 2D, 3D artist. In that same year, he worked as a graphical artist on Strike Force Harrier for the Atari ST. He was soon hired by Rowan Software, a company best known as a publisher of flight simulators for the PC. So, Martin's first job at Rowan was, again, as a graphical artist on Falcon, a title that received in 89 the Golden Joystick Award for the best 16-bit simulation game and also contemplated with the 8th position on the top 100 best video games from Amiga Power magazine published in May of 91. Then, in 1989, founded DID and recruited several members from Rowan that went on developing specialized aircraft simulators that were mostly published by Ocean Software, like for instance F-29 Retaliator, Epic, TFX, Inferno, EF-2000, F-22 Air Dominance Fighter and F-22 Total Air War. Then the studio was acquired by Ocean in 1998, who became Infogrames in 99. So, also in 99, and as said before, Ken Wright moved out along with six other members to form Evolution Studios with former Psygnosis co-founder Ian Edrington. They soon developed a racing demo on PC of multiple rally cars on a circuit and Sony immediately hired them 
to start working on a licensed WRC title for the upcoming PlayStation 2. In 2001, a satellite office was created to develop exclusive games also for Sony, but this time around for their upcoming PlayStation Portable, Big Big Studios, which was originally put together by four former Codemasters employees with the Colin McRae and Toka franchises in their resumes. World Rally Championship was the first rally driving game to be officially licensed by the FIA. It features the 2001 season, complete with real events, teams and drivers, except for Colin McRae that, as you know, had its own game by then. So, in WRC, Colin appears as Ford Driver. The game was placed on store shelves on November of 2001, and this was the only WRC game to also be available in the United States. All the other following sequels were exclusive to Europe and Japan. A year later, in November of 2002, WRC 2 Extreme was released and it featured a brand new physics engine that was possible with the help of real rally engineers. The tracks also had a boost in what reality is concerned, so satellite imagery and real 3D representation of terrains and surfaces were used applying a DEM technique which allows to represent the Earth's surface with all objects included. Also, the engine noises were taken directly from real-life rally cars and the developers even consulted a TV broadcaster for advice on how to create trustworthy and authentic replays. This time around, Colin McRae was replaced in-game by Francois Duval and they didn't figure out on time how to cast the car shadows while crossing bridges. Another year passed and WRC3 was released in November 21st of 2003 to be more precise. In this year's season, Colin McRae signed for Citroën and in-game he was not replaced, so Team Citroën Total had only two drivers, Sebastian Loeb and Carlos Sainz. What a dream team! 60 days prior to it, Colin McRae Rally 4 from Codemasters was also made available for the PlayStation 2 and Xbox and on Sony's console. It was seriously challenged by Evolution Studios' third WRC installment that featured, this time around, car shadows while crossing bridges. November of 2004 saw the fourth officially licensed WRC video game based on the 2004 WRC season, with a huge increase on the number of polygons used in each car model and featuring all rallies, teams and drivers. 2004 was the year in which, for the first time in over 10 years, Colin McRae failed to sign for a WRC team. Cars from Group N4 and Super 1600 were also included and the game features a Pro Driver Challenge There is basically a career mode where we start from scratch on a Super 1600 car and try to climb our way up to the more powerful WRC class. Finally, by October of 2005, the European exclusive WRC Rally Evolved was made available, the final PlayStation 2 game from Evolution Studios, and features a random event engine which can create certain dangers along the course, like animals crossing the road, crashed cars from other drivers, and a lot other unexpected situations. This one also includes the Group B monsters that we can use in certain special events. As for the tracks, these were reduced to just 3 per stage, but don't let that number fool you. These are beautifully detailed and realistically modeled, and you'll also get a bunch of rally cross stages in which you drive against other 3 AI drivers. Sai. Pela esquerda, cuidado. Contra curva. 
2005 also saw the birth of Pursuit Force for the brand new PSP, developed by Evolution Satellite Office Big Big Studios, an amazing action game that was praised all over the press and considered one of the best games ever created for that handheld. By that time, Evolution Studios was already preparing their launch title for the PlayStation 3. Announced in that same year at E3 with an amazing pre-rendered trailer, Motorstorm built a huge hype among off-road fans. Track deformation was something that really grabbed players' attention, and Monument Valley is simply gorgeous. Despite that, single-player mode tends to be quite boring after a few races, and it lacks offline multiplayer. Even so, the game sold over 3 million copies around the world and was considered Racing Game of the Year by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences in their 2008 awards, beating games like Dirt, Forza 2, Need for Speed Pro Street and Project Gotham Racing 4. In September of 2007, SCE announced the acquisition of both companies, Evolution and Big Big Studios. It was at this point that founders Ian and Marin left the company with Mick Hawking taking over the operations as studio director not only at Evolution and Big Big, but also SCE Studio Liverpool, formerly known as Cygnosis. Sequels to Motorstorm followed, Pacific Rift in 2008 and Apocalypse in 2011 that explored and expanded that same formula with huge jumps, crashes and amazing locations with beautiful graphics. The franchise also arrived in 2009 to the PSP and the PlayStation 2 by the hands of Big Big Studios that released a spin-off, Motorstorm Arctic Edge. However, Big Big Studios was shut down by Sony in January of 2012 being Little Deviants, their final and only game released on the Vita. Still in 2012, Evolution Studios was already working for a brand new IP for the launch of the PlayStation 4 and, to keep fans entertained, they released for the PS3 and Vita, Motorstorm RC, only available through the PlayStation Network with a Micro Machines kind of vibe, where we take the wheel of these little remote-controlled vehicles through those awesome and well-known Motorstorm landscapes. <laughs> Meanwhile, in late 2013, the PlayStation 4 was placed on store shelves, but the brand new IP from Evolution Studios, Drive Club, was nowhere to be seen. It suffered various delays and was only released a year later, in October of 2014, and worst of all, and according to the press, it felt incomplete and filled with problems related to the online mode. Slowly, Sony started to dismember Evolution Studios, starting by letting off more than 50 employees in March of 2015, and a year later, the main door at Evolution Studios was completely and forever closed. I just wanna say thank you to Evolution Studios for bringing so many awesome and entertaining racing games through the years. The WRC franchise for the PlayStation 2 is something that I get back to really often and all 5 games are among my favorites for that system. Farewell Evolution Studios! You'll forever be remembered! So guys, hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Pixel Thing! Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week! Hey guys, welcome to a not so retro review of a new title from a racing genre that I really enjoy playing and I can confirm that a new rally simulation has finally arrived! Let's take a look! Since 2004 that Richard Wurden's rally had the top position regarding real rally driving simulations. 
It recreated with astonishing detail a rally experience like no other, with an almost perfect physics engine that really pushed players forward and makes them come back year after year. Since 2004 that we've had a lot other rally racing inspired video games, but the arcade feeling that all those have made me play even more the title from SCI and Warthog. The game didn't have an online mode present, but the modding community developed tools to make it happen. Since then, I've been furiously participating in virtual world rally events that normally takes place simultaneously with the real thing, and it's freaking awesome to see our name in the middle of those hundreds or even thousands others. This year, Codemasters surprised everyone when they've announced, back in April, Dirt Rally as an early access on Steam and that they would shape the game with the feedback from players. From the minute I read those words, I bought the game knowing that they would certainly pay a proper tribute to the guy that named their rally franchise that had its debut back in 1998. Version 1.0 of Dirt Rally was officially released last week and, after months of tweaking, adjustments and car packs, tracks and new racing disciplines, I can shout out really loud and say that a new rally simulation is here. But that's not just another rally simulation, it's the best rally simulation ever made and will also be available in April 2016 for the Xbox One and PS4. Also in April the PC will get a physical copy of the game that I will grab to proudly place on my shelves next to my other favorite rally titles, something that I can't just do with my Steam copy. Keep left open crest, immediate turn head the right don't cut 100. If you're expecting a rewind or flashback function present, you can take your little horse out of the rain, cause if you crash, you have to deal with it. If you puncture one of the tires, you have to make a full stop and change it, losing a bit of precious time in the process. All that comes with the turf. All that is part of the real thing, so think twice before you apply full throttle cause the consequences of driving like a maniac are highly penalized in this game and can really make you dive into frustration and punch yourself for ruining a complete rally. Rally racing is presented in the form of championships in which we can participate in such mythic stages like Sweet Lamb in Wales or Cold Turini in Monte Carlo, but also take part of Greek, Finnish, Swedish and Germanic events, starting with a simple Mini Cooper and climb our way to the powerful VW Polo of Sebastian Ogier from the current World Rally Championship. In the middle, there's also other awesome classics like the Lancio Stratos and those Group B monsters that are really hard to handle and always makes me end up in the ditch tasting some of that gorgeous mud in the process. The online mode is extremely well made with new daily, weekly and monthly events for us to participate and earn some additional credits that are the in-game currency to buy new cars and hire new engineers that can bring extra help in accelerating the process of repairing damaged cars between stages. That way we can canalize time to other important part fixes and stay ahead of the competition. Besides the online mode, there's even a highly entertaining player versus player mode where we can create an online session to play against friends in those action-packed and high-octane rallycross events. These events are a joy to play with extreme and officially licensed powerful cars where we race for instance against Peter Solberg and where the car is always sideways.
another event present in Dirt Rally, is Pike's Peak Hill Climb that, frankly, should have stayed in the very first Dirt game from 2007. Codemasters could have focused their talent to something else like the fondly remembered Safari Rally, rather than bringing this back. Graphically gorgeous with night stages, rain, fog, ice and snow, dust clouds and amazing sound effects, Dirt Rally is a true joy to drive and blast our way through these tight gravel and icy roads and fly through those huge jumps in Finland. At the end of each stage, just grab a beer, relax and enjoy the multi-camera replays. Configuring the graphical quality of Dirt Rally is quite simple. I use NVIDIA's GeForce Experience tool and apply the recommended settings for my system. Dirt Rally can also be played quite decently with an Xbox 360 controller, but it's better to have a set of wheel and pedals to fully enjoy this title. The force feedback was thoroughly developed and tweaked and has an extremely well-balanced weight distribution system that differs from one vehicle to another. It simply can't be described, it must be felt, and while driving, we can predict exactly when the rear end of the car is about to betray us, but even so, sometimes it's just a bit too late to avoid it, and when we crash, that thin line between a true sim and reality kicks in. So, instead of ending up at the hospital, we just need to take a good warm bath to get rid of all the sweat. If you're after a good rally simulation, do yourselves a favor and grab Dirt Rally. It's the best driving game from Code Masters until today and basically the most realistic driving experience ever made. Looking forward for their next racing title that I hope includes something related to Colin McRae's career in early 2004 and 2005. Fingers crossed! So guys, hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Pixel Thing, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week. Hey guys, welcome back! Established in March of 2000, Bugbear Entertainment started its successful career in video games development with this one, Rally Trophy, that raised the bar in the racing genre. Let's take a look at the very first historic rally simulation. Published by Joe Wood Productions in November 2001, this Windows exclusive title was considered by many one of the most realistic and challenging racing games for its time. Being based on historic rally cars, the physics models combined with no traction control or ABS or any kind of driving aids turns Rally Trophy into a pretty good rally racing simulation a totally new thing that only PC gamers had the chance to try. There was also a planned Xbox version that never came out on the system, never understood why. I 
I totally believe that it scared many players, hoping to find a Colin McRae style of racing. That's why this title is so enjoyable, the difficulty of the controls, the skills needed to master this game, all this attracted me like a magnet. Three, two, one, go! There are 42 beautiful and highly detailed stages across 5 countries and we'll encounter several types of road surfaces in Russia, Finland, Switzerland, Sweden and Kenya. So, be prepared to drive a headless historic car in tarmac, gravel and mud. I can guarantee, it's super fun and your co-driver is always goofing around punching you with all kind of hilarious comments. Uh, let's change seats, what do you say? Next time you'll have to get it from the ditch. Got it! Slam on the gas pedal harder this time. Go, 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 go! So. Rally Trophy isn't just another boring World Rally Championship game. I remember that, back in the day, the game was really demanding, graphically speaking. Fortunately, it remained playable on all Windows versions that came after Millennium and I could later play it with all graphical options on its maximum. And I can tell you that this is one hell of a gorgeous game to look at. An example of this is till its release date, the presence of the most complex and dynamic sun flares and effects ever seen in any racing game. Speaking of effects, those dust clouds and flying particles are a sight to behold. Just beautiful. We're given the option to drive a classic, amazing and hugely deformable rally car from yesterday. All vehicles are very well modeled and detailed with those awesome dashboards with fully functioning dials and such and it's an extreme joy to try them all and probably slam them into a tree cause your co-driver screamed at your ears that an animal was crossing the road. Watch out, animal crossing ahead. The cars available are the Mini Cooper, the Saab 96, the Alfa Romeo Giulia, the Fiat 600 the Barth the Opel Cadet, the Lancia Fulvia, the Ford Cortina and Escort, the Volvo Amazon, the Alpine A110 and lastly the amazing Lancia Stratos. Each car handling is very well balanced between being realistic and challenging. Also the fun factor is a major player in this game, making it extremely rewarding to drive. And sliding is very well implemented, mainly in those cars with rear-wheel drive. I must advise you that Rally Trophy has a steep learning curve, so if you're looking for a driving game that you can master in a few hours, you'd better look somewhere else. Variety is this game's middle name, with the already mentioned 42 stages with its own and special types of terrain. Now, throw some night stages with snow, mud and rain with included lightning bolts and you get a wide range of different extreme driving conditions to dominate. Try to maintain your car intact, otherwise if you crash and break the headlights you won't see, like Portuguese people say, the tip of a horn on those night stages. And that will be a serious challenge. To keep the bar really elevated, the developers have taken the engine noises directly from the actual rally cars they are based on, so the sound design aspect of Rally Trophy is also extremely well produced. As for the gaming modes, we can choose between single race, championship and multiplayer mode, but there's also an arcade option where we get to play a rallycross type of race with other opponents simultaneously on track that, back then, had a frame rate issue, cause there were a lot going on at the same time. Fortunately, this was the least important feature in Rally Trophy, so don't bother trying. If you just want more tracks, cars, skins, sounds and other stuff, just head over to nogripracing.com and you'll be amazed by the quantity and, most of all, quality of the work put together by Rally Trophy's online community. To conclude this review, 
here's a tip to unlock all modes, cars and tracks. In the game menu, simply use this combination as your name and the magic will happen. Rally Trophy is a demanding game, no doubt about it, but in the end, you'll be hugely satisfied for completing one more stage. Also, listening to your co-driver yelling at your ears is, as Portuguese people would say, to crack the coconut with laughter. Left four. Hey guys, welcome back! Following the worldwide success of Motocross Madness 1 and 2 exclusively on the PC and a few years later, in 2004, MX unleashed for the original Xbox and PS2, Rainbow Studios brought us in 2005 MX vs ATV Unleashed. Firstly, on the PS2 and Xbox, it eventually came out one year later in 2006 for the PC, but this time around with an awesome track editor. This will be my main focus in this video, cause all the other racing stuff is already covered all over the internet. The creators of this great title saw the overwhelming reception of both Motocross Madness games and the huge fan base created around them and felt the urgent need to replicate that success on the PC all over again. To make it even more irresistible to the fans, Rainbow Studios decided to include on the same disc and only on the PC version, a friendly track editor. I won't be showing here how to create tracks or something like that. It's just a quick look at some of the great stuff that fans can do with that awesome tool. The game features an extensive single-player career that you can complete using motocross bikes and ATVs. There are also other types of unlockable vehicles available to take out for a spin, like for instance golf carts, monster trucks, trophy trucks, off-road buggies, sand rails, biplanes and even helicopters. These last two types are extremely difficult to control, so I advise you to stick with the off-road stuff. It's so much fun. As for the controls, you can use the keyboard and remap it to whatever best suits your preferences. But the best controller around that you should use is, with no doubt, the Xbox 360 controller for Windows. As usually in this franchise, you can pull off some tricks whilst in the air to get extra points. Use those on the store to grab some new rides and gear, besides other great stuff. I simply hate stadium events, but love these outdoor nationals. It's here where all the fun begins. Those natural elevations and bumps are so damned enjoyable to ride. Remember to use the clutch at the start of the races and in those tight airpin turns. That way you can maintain your momentum with short bursts of speed. Another important move you can make to stay ahead of the pack is the suspension preload for the jumps. Learn how and when you should use it and you'll certainly start winning races.
The soundtrack can be switched off, but there's some nice licensed music from, for example, Nickelback and Papa Roach that really fits into the action. As for the sound effects, those were taken from real life vehicles and they sound really good. But none of this is that relevant. What really matters are those hundreds or even thousands of user-made tracks. The main source for these files was, until recently, mcmfactory.com that, unfortunately, closed its doors. Now, the only and relevant website that has all this good stuff for the MX vs ATV series, tracks, riding gear and bike skins is mxmaniacs.com MX vs ATV Unleashed is also one hell of a good and enjoyable game to play with your friends over network and with all these user-made tracks you'll be fighting for first place for quite a while. Graphics could be better, with mud and dust covering the bike. But the fun factor present in this game is huge and makes us forget those tiny little things. And this wraps it up for this not-so-retro review of one of the greatest motocross games ever. Hey guys, welcome back! The new year is at our doorstep, such as the world's greatest off-road event. There were a few games that were able to recreate the Dakar. Let's take a look at the best. Every year, when the world's greatest off-road race is about to begin, nostalgia hits me in an unimaginable way. Back in the glorious Sinclair ZX Spectrum days, one of the most important games in my collection was Paris Dakar, developed and released by a Spanish company, Zigurat, in 1988. When I finally got my hands on my brand new Spectrum Plus 2A, Few were the games that worked, that caused me some frustration. Never crossed my mind to return it for repair or replacement, such was the desire to play games. Maybe it needed just a slight adjustment on the head of the incorporated tape recorder. Slowly and gradually, I was able to play the many games that I already had in my collection, but the infamous Paris Dakar game persisted in presenting that tape-loading error demonic message. One fine afternoon, I placed the tape once more in the machine and hold the enter key just to see what could happen. I couldn't believe my eyes, the game worked. In short, Paris Dakar in the ZX Spectrum is, until today, one of the most absorbing racing games I've ever experienced. It unfolds in three stages, Europe, the deserts of Sahara and Tenere bound for Dakar, being each step an incredible challenge. The roadbook had the correct directions to take, 5 km to the north, 2 km to the east, 15 km to the south, etc. We must reset the partial kilometer counter after every change of direction to get it right. Much attention also to the level of water, state of the gearbox and the fuel tank. Along the way there are areas of supply and repair for us to stop, but even with all these precautions, reaching the checkered flag intact and well classified was almost impossible, but achievable. Every time the game is loaded, the circuits are randomly generated. This means that we could never know to which way was the first curve. In that time, this simple feature was enough to keep me hooked to my spectrum, making its longevity almost endless. And even after a withdrawal, 
the mere label Game Over was not enough for the programmers from Ziggurat. Thus, when we press the quit key, a helicopter appears on the screen, picks up the pilot and disappears in the horizon. Simply brilliant. The game was also ported to the Amiga and DOS personal computers, but never grabbed as much attention as it did on the 8-bit machines, MSX, Amstrad CPC and, of course, the ZX Spectrum. A year later, in 1989, the arcade saloons received a 3D rally racing arcade game entitled Big Run. Jaleco's attempt to take down Sega's famous OutRun. There was also an Amiga and Atari ST port and, as well, a slightly newer version for the Super Famicom in 1991, but I believe that this last one was only released in Japan. In this game, we're granted access to a Porsche 959 and participate on this six-stage Dakar race. The other opponent's cars that we can also find in Africa's natural terrain depicted in this game resembles the Peugeot 205 T16 and the well-known Mitsubishi Pajero. There's a little nice feature incorporated in the cabinet, a horn that we must sound when we're planning to overtake other cars. That way they will allow you to pass. Otherwise, Gandalf appears and you shall not pass. Just joking. In 1990, there was a title for the Commodore Amiga and Atari ST named Paris Dakar 1990. That the only nice thing to watch was this babe showing her nice attributes. Moving on, the next Dakar game that really deserves being brought up in this video was only released 11 years after the last one that I've mentioned here. From the developer Broadsword Interactive and publisher Acclaim came Paris Dakar Rally in late 2001, where we've got the chance to participate in this mythic off-road event with a dirt bike ATV, dune buggy or SUV. Press reviews were unanimous. What a piece of crap this game is. And that's kind of true. Controls are painful, sound is awful, with also some irritating music, but there's something of a challenge that makes me come back to it year after year right before the real race starts. I believe the reason for that is its difficulty, that is what the real Dakar race is all about. The extreme and complicated riding engine implemented in this game turns it into an awesome challenge even if the game is painfully horrible. Am I insane? Believe me, it's like a drug. Every year I try to get to the top 10 after all those stages and there's a lot of them. But I simply cannot achieve that. And I just love those free roaming desert stages where we must find the checkpoints and also pick up those repair icons in the form of wrenches. Give it a try, only if you're a fan of the real thing. Two years later, in 2003, Acclaim decided to develop indoors and release another Dakar game. This sequel, named Dakar 2, and also subtitled as the world's ultimate rally in certain places of the globe, was a huge step up from its older brother. It has pretty nice graphics and music, but sound effects could be better. Another not so good feature is the fact that in one stage our co-driver is a girl and on another she changes her voice and sounds like a man. Isn't this kind of weird? Again, 
The desert free roaming stuff is what makes this game so enjoyable. Those are beautifully designed and gameplay on these special stages are so freaking awesome and we need to be extremely careful to avoid rocks, grass that hides nasty sandbanks, etc. Unfortunately, this good stuff ends really fast, cause stages are quite short in length and the clock is ticking. There's the mighty trucks, SUVs and dirt bikes to pick and embrace the desert, but I found the SUVs and pickups the more suitable and an easy way to finish victorious in this 12 stage race that you can complete in about 15 minutes. This game was intended to appeal to the arcade racer and simply accomplishes it very well. Aside from some walls in a couple of stages that works as some kind of a magnet that insanely attracts our vehicle, this game is quite enjoyable to play, but don't expect it to have a Colin McRae or Dirt type of gameplay. It's really far from there. Once again, play it if you're a real fan of the world's greatest off-road event. Stage complete. In 2005, French developer Asobo Studio was working on something big, Grand Rate Off-Road. But as part of the publishing deal with Codemasters, they ended up transforming the code to what we know today as Fuel. If you haven't watched my thoughts about it, just click on the rectangle. But if you're eager for some desert racing, you'll be much more satisfied with 2XL's Baja Edge of Control, only on Xbox 360 and PS3. It was developed by the same team that brought Motocross Madness 1 and 2 and MX and MX vs ATV Unleashed games. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Pixel Thing, where we took a glimpse at the most relevant Dakar-related games that somewhat since 1988 pleased the fans of this awesome off-road event. Will we see more Dakar games in the future, now that the race is no longer a European and African exclusive event? Will the next dirt game have some desert racing stages or championships? I would love to see these questions answered. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week. Hey guys, welcome back! Today we'll be looking at a not so retro game that drank its inspiration from its grand grandfather, Super Scramble Simulator, released by Gremlin Graphics in 1989. Trials Fusion is a visually outstanding piece of work and it's amazingly fun to blast our way through those huge trail sections filled with defiant challenges. We begin in the training school by learning some basic moves to face certain kind of obstacles. When you're ready, just apply full throttle and try to reach the finish line as fast as you can and with a minimum of penalties. And that's just about it. Old school fun is what this game is all about. The game features an awesome and exhaustive track editor and obviously a truly competitive multiplayer mode. You have at your disposal some tools for you to share your imagination with the online community. Personally, 
And as a retro gamer, I don't really appreciate this modern fearsome online competition. I prefer the career mode, mainly because my internet connection is rubbish. This track is an homage to the fabulous Limbo. Look at this awesome artwork, just amazing. In certain places, you just need to take it slow in order to advance, maintaining just the right pace. From time to time, there's also tracks in which you must show all your skills doing FMX tricks to please the jury and get some essential extra points to advance in the game. You will also come across some flat out style bonus levels where you're asked to toss the rider and flap your arms like an eagle. In others, you just need to go as far as you can without crashing. Super fun stuff! Also in certain places, and as someone once said, you need fingernails to play the guitar. Recently the game developers released extra tracks in the form of packs that you can purchase for around 5 euros. Those packs are Riders of the Rust Lands, Empire of the Sky and Welcome to the Abyss. Personally, I don't think that these extra packs bring extra fun to this already hilarious and superb title. But if you want to explore new worlds and tracks, just buy those and prepare yourself to be amazed by these outstanding graphics, sounds and gameplay. <laughs> Trials Fusion will be, with no doubt, a future classic. Hope you enjoyed this not so retro pixel thing review. I will certainly bring more in the near future. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all next week. Hey guys, welcome back! Micro Machines is one of those pretty little games that are so extremely addictive that it hurts. You just want to keep on playing it just to beat your funny opponents one more time. Let's take a look at the very first title of the Micro Machines franchise. In 1991, Codemasters thought that it would be a great idea to publish a game based on those cute little cars from the Micro Machines Toys franchise. And they hit the spot right in the middle. 
After the huge success on the NES, Sega Mega Drive and the Amiga, the DOS version was inevitable. It came three years later in 1994 and was only available in Europe featuring improved graphics and some awesome groovy music and sound effects. This particular version was developed by Big Red Software, the same guys that two years later made the Crazy DOS exclusive title Big Red Racing that I've already reviewed. If you missed it, just click on the rectangle shown on your screen. From the kitchen table to the children's playground, from the pool table to the bathroom, etc. etc. Micro Machines will have you discover many different tracks, each one more difficult than the other, that you'll eventually master using normal or even peculiar tiny vehicles to do so. There's race cars, helicopters, tanks, dune buggies and even boats to use, each one in their special strange and at the same time familiar environment in which you must navigate your way around obstacles such as sand castles, coffee mugs and pot plants whilst navigating jumps set up using books and the like whilst sticking to a makeshift track painted onto the floor in chalk. If, in your childhood, you used to play with toy cars around the house, you'll be awfully attracted to this game. Even today, it happens to me. Different options are available. If you play against the computer, you'll have to choose three opponents that are very different from each other, with their personal strengths and weaknesses. Nice touch! You can also play against a friend on the same computer. You and your buddy have four lives each and you will try to go as fast as you can so that your mate will be behind you and consequently ends up crossing the boundaries of the screen, losing for that matter one of his precious four lives. This makes the game more tense and exciting. Bear in mind, to win a race you need to know the course. There's no room for wimps in this game as you attempt to barge your opponents into trackside obstacles or off the track altogether and several of the courses were designed with this in mind. Controlling the different types of vehicle is extremely fun. Its handling is responsive and varies from one vehicle to the next, adding yet further longevity. It is also possible to play Micro Machines hooking up two computers using a modem through a telephone connection or even using a null modem cable. The in-game atmosphere is also extremely enjoyable with nice music and a ton of sound effects on jumps, crossing the finish line, skidding, crashing, you name it. This game only needs one megabyte of hard disk space. If you don't have that one megabyte available, just play it directly from a 3.5 inch floppy disk by clicking on the executable file. It may be a small game in size, but huge on quality of gameplay and production. Micro Machines is an addictive top-down racing game that captivates your attention for hours, so be prepared. It is a wonderfully simple game with a brilliant concept that can, even today, be enjoyed by all age groups. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all next week. guys, welcome back! You know fuel, right? Today we're gonna talk about what fuel should have been if Codemasters didn't put their hands on. Let's take a look. Fuel, as you might know, features a gigantic open world environment set in a post-apocalyptic earth ravaged by extreme weather. Fuel has become more valuable than gold. Though your focus will be on finishing the races to get more of that precious liquid. Published by Codemasters in 2009 and its massive 5500 square miles of land 
was certified by the Guinness Book of Records as the largest playable area in a console game. There are 75 vehicles to unlock, 70 races and 190 challenges. You'll not only be facing your opponents, but as well huge tornadoes and massive sandstorms. All these features were kind of unique on a video game, but this wasn't the original idea. As you might know, France is home of the world's greatest off-road event, the Dakar. In consequence, France is also a country that built fantastic drivers. French people are passionate for off-road events, and as kind of homage to this fact, a Sobo studio announced in 2005 Grand Raid Off-Road. This was the original title of this massive open-world off-road racing game, and as a huge off-road racing fan, I was blown away by the first trailer and pictures that came out on the internet. Back in September of 2005, I interviewed for my blog Sebastian Loch, CEO of Asobo, in an attempt to know more details about Grand Raid Off-Road. The game would feature typical 4x4 off-road vehicles, motorbikes and trucks, just like in the real Dakar race and the number of tracks to be unlocked would be, as Sebastian mentioned, insane. It would include online features such as trading car parts, creating race teams, sharing car improvements, parts research, etc. As for the length of the tracks, I was told that races would range from 3 minutes up to several hours with no pausing. But all this depended on the publishing deal that they were looking for. So there came Codemasters knocking on Asobo's door, probably afraid of the competition. In order to get a publishing deal, Asobo Studio complied to Codemasters' demands and performed all the graphical and gameplay changes asked. The game no longer featured vehicles based in real models like the Volkswagen Touareg and no longer presented a threat to future off-road rally games that Codemasters were planning to release for the next generation consoles, like the beginning of a new brand series of Colin McRae games, Dirt in 2007. And Dirt 2 in 2009. Fuel was born and placed right in the middle between off-road games and open-world racing. June of 2009 was the release date, 90 days before the highly anticipated worldwide launch of Dirt 2. A few elements though remained intact. The free roaming mode that allows us to drive anywhere in the game world without incurring loading times except if you crash or reset your vehicle, and the exploration mode where you'll discover new challenges as you go. Now tell me, do you prefer fuel as it is? Or would it be much more fun if the original idea prevailed? Just let me know what you think. You're free to comment below. <laughs> Big Red Racing. What great memories this game brings. Besides its great playability, it's freaking hilarious. So, let's get on board, shall we? Initially planned for a bunch of different systems, the only version that has seen the light of day was the PC. Developed by Big Red Software and published by Dulmark, Big Red Racing was released in the beginning of 1996 and, when I play it, I still laugh so hard that I end up losing all the races. There are 6 cups and 24 courses to master. 
that covers various points of the globe and also the Moon, the planet Mars and Venus. To drive through them, you must choose one of two vehicle options available before each race. Speaking of vehicles, there are 16 and they range from a normal car, a mini or beetle, helicopters, monster truck, dumper truck and even overcraft. In some tracks it is also possible to ignore the path and discover other areas with jumps and various obstacles. Just imagine the craziness present in this game. Also in the selection screen you can customize your player and vehicle color and decals. It was released only on CD-ROM and it takes advantage of the extra CD storage space to give you some groovy themes by Ang Nail and Gerard Gurley. It offers also a split-screen multiplayer mode and the possibility to play through your own network with up to 6 players. So, there's a lot going on in this crazy title. And the game is incredibly fun in multiplayer mode. You and your buddies just can't stop laughing because of all the craziness and dumb commentaries. What are you waiting for? Christmas? Wussy wussy wussy! It can be sometimes a bit disgusting to some people because of all the farting, <coughs> belching, <coughs> and smartass remarks that assaults the player almost all the time. And I thought women drivers were supposed to be bad. <laughs> if it starts to irritate you, just turn it off at the options menu. But commentators in your face lines during the race are that little extra stuff that makes all the difference and turns this game into a classic. It might not be a great looking game and have these sometimes awkward controls, but it sure is great fun. Unfortunately, and despite all these good or bad or disgusting arguments, Big Red Racing kinda passed unnoticed back in 1996. Don't know why. I think that this game was the last Big Red software title before they merged in 1995 with Eidos. It was perhaps because of this fact that all the other planned versions were cancelled. It surely would have been great to play this game on the PlayStation, Saturn, 3DO, Nintendo 64 and Atari Jaguar. Hope you enjoyed this look back at a title that should have been more controversial than it really was. This course is wet and wild, like me. What? If you've enjoyed this video, consider supporting the channel monetarily through Patreon at patreon.com slash it's a pixel thing or using the thanks button below. To keep up with what's going on with the channel, check all my social media stuff by clicking on the link in the description. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you all in my next video. Cheers!